Chapter 13 One arms host in that time was perhaps the finest army the Malazan Empire had yet to produce, even given the decimation of the bridge burners at the Siege of Pale. Drawn from disparate regiments that included companies from seven cities, Falar and Malaz Island, these 10,000 soldiers were, by roll, 4,912 women, the remaining men. 1,267 under the recorded age of 25 years, 721 over the age of 35 years, the remaining in between. Remarkable indeed. More so when one considers this. Among its soldiers could be found veterans of the Wiccan Wars. See Coltane's Rebellion, the Iron Uprising, on both sides, and Black Dog Forest and Mott Wood. How does one measure such an army? By their deeds. And that which awaited them in the Panion Domin would make of one arm's host a legend carved in stone. East of Saltoan, a history of the Panion Wars. Gorid Pala. Midges swarmed the tall grass prairie, the grainy black clouds tumbling over the faded, wavering green. Oxen bellowed and moaned in their yokes, their eyes covered with clusters of the frenzied insects. The Mibi watched her rivy kin move among the beasts, their hands laden with grease mixed with the crushed seeds of lemongrass, which they smeared around the eyes, ears, nose, and mouth. The unguent had served the Bedouin well for as long as the huge bison had been under the care of the rivy. A slightly thinner version was used by the rivy themselves. Most of brood soldiers had taken to the pungent yet effective defence as well, whilst the Tista Andi had proved evidently unpalatable to the biting insects. What had drawn the midges this time was the rank upon rank of unprotected Malasan soldiers. Yet another march across this hood-forsaken continent for that weary army of foreigners, the Maibi thought. These strangers who had been... For so many years, unwelcome, detested, feared. Our new allies, their surcoats dyed grey, their colourless standards proclaiming an unknown loyalty. They follow one man and ask nothing of justification or cause. She drew the rough weave of her hood over her head as the slanting sun broke through the clouds gathered to the southwest. Her back was to the march. She sat in the bed of a rivy wagon, eyes on the trailing baggage train and the companies of Malazan soldiers flanking it. Does Brood command such loyalty? He was the warlord who delivered the first defeat to the Malazan army. Our lands were being invaded. Our cause was clear, and we fought for the commander who could match the enemy. And even now... We face a new threat to our homeland, and Brood has chosen to lead us. Still, should he command us into the abyss? Would we follow? And now, knowing what I know, would I? Her thoughts travelled from the warlord to Anamanda Rake and the Tisti Andi. All strangers to Genabacus, yet they fought in its defence, in the name of its people's liberty. Rake's rule over his Tista Andy was absolute. Aye, they would stride unblinking into the abyss. The fools. And now, marching at their sides, the Malasans, Dujak one arm, Whiskey Jack, and ten thousand unwavering souls. What made such men and women so intractable in their sense of honour? She had come to fear their courage. Within the husk of her body, there was a broken spirit. Dishonoured by its own cowardice, bereft of dignity, a mother no longer. Lost even to the rivy. I am no more than food to the child. I have seen her, from a distance now and no closer. She is taller, she has filled out her hips, her breasts, her face. This tattersail was no gazelle. She devours me, this new woman, with her sleepy eyes, her full, broad mouth, her swaying, sultry walk. 
A horseman rode to the wagon's rear, his armor clanking, his dusty cloak flapping as he slowed his charger. The visor on his burnished helm was raised, revealing a gray-shot beard trimmed close beneath hard eyes. Will you send me away as well, maybe? he growled, his horse slowing to a walk to keep pace. Maybe. That woman is dead, she replied. You may leave here, Whiskey Jack. She watched him pull the tanned leather gloves from his wide, scarred hands, studied those hands as they finally came to a rest on the saddle horn. There is a mason's brutality about them, she thought, yet they are endearing nonetheless. Any woman still alive would desire their touch. An end to the foolishness, maybe. We've need of your counsel. Corlat tells me you are racked with dreams. You cry out against a threat that approaches us, something vast and deadly. Woman, your terror is palpable. Even now I see that my words have rekindled it in your eyes. Describe your visions, maybe. Struggling against a painfully hammering heart, she barked a rough, broken laugh. <laughs> you are all fools. Would you seek to challenge my enemy? My deadly, unopposable foe? Will you draw that sword of yours and stand in my stead? Whiskey Jack scowled. If that would help. There is no need. What comes for me in my dreams comes for us all. Ah, oh, perhaps we soften its terrible visage, the darkness of a cowl, a vague human shape. Even a skull's grin, which only momentarily shocks, yet remains, nonetheless deeply familiar, almost comforting. And we build temples to blunt the passage into its eternal domain. We fashion gates, raise barrows. Your enemy is death? Whiskey Jack glanced away, then met her eyes again. This is nonsense, maybe. You and I are both too old to fear death. Face to face with Hood, she snapped. That is how you see it, you fool. He is the mask behind which hides something beyond your ability to comprehend. I have seen it. I know what awaits me. Then you no longer yearn for it. I was mistaken back then. I believed in my tribe's spirit world. I have sensed the ghosts of my ancestors, but they are but memories made manifest. A sense of self desperately holding itself together by strength of its own will and naught else. Fail in that will and all is lost forever. Is oblivion so terrible, maybe? She leaned forward, gripping the wagon sides with fingers that clawed, nails that dug into the weathered wood. What lies beyond is not oblivion, you ignorant man. No, imagine a place crowded with fragmented memories, memories of pain, of despair, all those emotions that carve deepest upon our souls. She fell back, weakened, and slowly sighed, her eyes closing. Love drifts like ashes, Whiskey Jack. Even identity is gone. Instead, all that is left of you is doomed to an eternity of pain and terror, a succession of fragments from everyone, everything that has ever lived. In my dreams... I stand upon the brink. There is no strength in me. My will has already shown itself weak, wanting. When I die, I see what awaits me. I see what hungers for me, for my memories, for my pain. She opened her eyes, met his gaze. It is the true abyss, Whiskey Jack. Beyond all the legends and stories, it is the true abyss. And it lives unto itself, consumed by rapacious hunger. Dreams can be naught but an imagination's fashioning of its own fears, maybe. 
the Malazan said. You are projecting a just punishment for what you perceive as your life's failure. Her eyes narrowed on him. Get out of my sight, she growled, turning away, drawing a hood tighter about her head, cutting off the outside world, all that lay beyond the warped, stained planks of the wagon's bed. Be gone, Whiskey Jack, she thought, with your sword-thrust words, the cold, impervious armour of your ignorance. You cannot answer all that I have seen with a simple, brutal statement. I am not a stone for your rough hands. The knots within me defy your chisel. Your sword-thrust words shall not cut to my heart. I dare not accept your wisdom. I dare... <coughs> Whiskey Jack, you bastard. The commander rode at a gentle canter through the dust until he reached the vanguard of the Malazan army. Here he found Dujak, flanked by Korlat on one side and the Daru Krupa on the other, the latter tottering uneasily on a mule, hands waving about at the swarming midges. A plague on these pernicious gnats! <laughs> Krupa despairs! The wind will pick up soon enough, Dujak growled. We're approaching hills. Korlat drew closer alongside Whiskey Jack. How does she fare, Commander? He grimaced. Mm, no better. Her spirit is as twisted and shrunken as her body. She has fashioned a vision of death that has her fleeing it in terror. Tad, Silver Fox, feels abandoned by her mother. This leads to bitterness. She no longer welcomes our company. Her too? This is turning into a contest of wills, I think. Isolation is the last thing she needs, Corlat. In that, she is like her mother, as you have just intimated. He let out a long sigh, shifted in his saddle. His thoughts began to drift. He was weary, his legs aching and stiff. Sleep had been eluding him. They had heard virtually nothing of the fate of Parron and the bridge burners. The Warrens had become impassable. Nor were they certain if the siege of Kapustan was underway, or of the city's fate. Whiskey Jack had begun to regret sending the Black Maranth away. Dujek and Brood's armies were marching into the unknown. Even the great raven crone and her kin had not been seen for over a week. It's these damned Warrens and the sickness now filling them, he thought. They're late, Dujek muttered. And no more than that, Cropper assures one and all. Recall the last delivery. Almost dusk it was. Three horses left on the lead wagon, the others killed and cut from the traces. Four shareholders gone, their souls and earnings scattered through the infernal winds. And the merchant herself, near death she was. The warning was clear, my friends. The warrants have been compromised. And as we march ever closer to the domain, the foulment grows ever more. Yeah, <laughs> foul! Yet you insist they'll make it through again. Krapa does, High Fist. The Trikala Trade Guild honors its contracts. They are not to be underestimated. Tis the day of their delivery of supplies. Said supplies shall therefore be delivered. And, assuming Krapa's request has been honored... Among those supplies will be crates of the finest insect repellent ever created by the formidable alchemists of Darujistan. Whiskey Jack leaned towards Corlat. Where in the line does she walk? He asked quietly. At the very rear, Commander. And is anyone watching her? The Tista Andy woman glanced over and frowned. Is there need? How in Hood's name should I know? he snapped. A moment later, he scowled. Your pardon, Corlett. I shall seek her out myself. He swung his mount around, nudged it into a canter. Tempers grow short, Gruppa murmured as the commander rode away. But not as short as Gruppa, for whom all nasty words whiz impactless over his head and are thus lost in the ether. 
And those darts aimed lower? Mm. <laughs> they but bounce from Cropper's ample equanimity. Fat, you mean, Dujek said, wiping dust from his brow, then leaning over to spit onto the ground. Ahem. Grubba, equably cushioned, blithely smiles at the high fist's jibe. It is the forthright bluntness of soldiers that one must bathe in whilst on the march leagues from civilization. Antidote to the snipes of gutter rats, a refreshing balm to droll sardonic nobles. Why prick with a needle when one can use a hammer, eh? Grubba breathes deep but not so deep as to cough from the dust-laden stench of nature. Such simple converse. The intellect must need shift with alacrity, from the intricate and delicate steps of the court dance to the tribal thumping of boots in grunting cadence. Hood, take us, Kulat muttered to the high fist. You got under his skin after all. Dujek's answering grin, was an expression of perfect satisfaction. Whiskey Jack angled his horse well to one side of the columns, then drew rein to await the rear guard. There were rivi everywhere in sight, moving singly or in small groups, their long spears balanced on their shoulders. Brown-skinned beneath the sun, they strode with light steps, seemingly immune to the heat and the leagues passing under their feet. The Bedouin herd was being driven parallel to the armies, a third of a league to the north. The intervening gap revealed a steady stream of rivi, returning from the herd or setting off towards it. The occasional wagon joined the to and fro, unladen on its way north, burdened with carcasses on the way back. The rearguard came within sight, flanked by outriders, the Malazan company's insufficient strength to blunt a surprise attack long enough for the main force to swing round and come to their relief. The commander lifted the water bladder from his saddle and filled his mouth, eyes narrowed as he studied the disposition of his soldiers. Satisfied, he urged his mount into a walk, squinting into the trailing clouds of dust at the rearguard's tail end. She walked in that cloud, as if seeking obscurity, her stride so like tattersails that Whiskey Jack felt a shiver dance up his spine. Twenty paces behind her marched a pair of Malazan soldiers, crossbows slung over their shoulders, helms on, and visors lowered. The commander waited until the trio had passed, then guided his horse into their wake. Within moments he was alongside the two marines. The soldiers glanced up. Neither saluted, following standard procedure for battlefields. The woman closest to Whiskey Jack offered a curt nod. Commander, here to fill your quota of eating dust, are you? And how did you two earn the privilege? We volunteered, sir, the other woman said. That's Tattersail up there. Yeah, we know she calls herself Silver Fox now, but we ain't fooled. She's our cadre major, right? So you've elected to guard her back? Aye. Fair exchange, sir. Always. And are the two of you enough? The first woman grinned beneath her half-visor. We're her damn killers, me and my sister, sir. Two quarrels every seventy heartbeats. Both of us. And when times run out for that, why then, we switch to longswords, one for each hand. And when they're all busted, it's pig stickers. And, the other growled, when we're out of iron, we use our teeth, sir. How many brothers did you two grow up with? Seven. Only they all ran away as soon as they was able. So did Da, but Mother was better off without him, and that wasn't just bluster when she said so, neither. Whiskey Jack edged closer, rolling up his left sleeve. He leaned down and showed the two Marines his forearm. See those scars? No, these ones here. A nice even bite, the nearest woman observed. Pretty small, though. She was five, the little banshee. I was sixteen, the first fight I ever lost. Did the lass grow up to be a soldier, Commander? He straightened, lowering his sleeve. Would no. When she was twelve, she set off to marry a king. Or so she claimed. That was the last any of us ever saw or heard of her. I bet she did just that, sir, the first woman said. If she was anything like you. Now I'm choking on more than just dust, soldier. Carry on. 
Whiskey Jack trotted ahead until he reached Silver Fox. They'll die for you now, she said as soon as he came alongside. I know, she continued. You don't do it on purpose. There's nothing calculated when you're being human, old friend. That's what makes you so deadly. No wonder you're walking here on your own, he replied. Her smile was sardonic. We're very much alike, you know. All we need do is cup our hands and ten thousand souls rush in to fill them. And every now and then, one of us recognizes that fact, and the sudden overwhelming pressure hardens us a little more deep down inside. And what was soft gets a little smaller, a little weaker. Not weaker, Silver Fox. Rather more concentrated, more selective. That you feel the burden at all is proof that it remains alive and well. There is a difference, now that I think on it, she said. For you, ten thousand souls. For me, a hundred thousand. He shrugged. She was about to continue, but a sharp crack filled the air behind them. They spun to see a savage parting in their wake, a thousand paces away, from which poured a crimson river. The two marines backpedaled as the torrent tumbled towards them. The high grasses blackened, wavered, then sank down on all sides. Distant shouts rose from the rivi, who had seen the conflagration. The Trigala wagon that emerged from the fissure burned with black fire. The horses themselves were engulfed, their screams shrill and horrible as they plunged madly onto the flooded plain. The beasts were devoured in moments, leaving the wagon to roll forward of its own momentum in the spreading red stream. One front wheel collapsed. The huge contrivance pitched, pivoted, burnt bodies falling from its flanks, then careened onto its side in an explosion of ebon flames. The second wagon that emerged was licked by the same sorcerer's fire, though not yet out of control. A nimbus of protective magic surrounded the eight horses in the train, fraying even as they thundered into the clear, splashing through the river of blood that continued to spread out from the portal. The driver, standing like a mad apparition with his cloak streaming black fire, bellowed a warning to the two marines before leaning hard to one side and sawing the traces. The horses swerved, pulling the huge wagon onto two wheels a moment before it came crunching back down. A guardsman who had been clinging to its side was thrown by the impact, landing with a turgid splash in the spreading river. A red-sheathed arm rose above the tide, then sank back down and out of sight. The horses and wagon missed the two marines by a dozen paces, slowing as they cleared the river, its fires dying. A third wagon appeared, followed by another and another. The vehicle that then emerged was the size of a house, rolling on scores of iron-spoked wheels, caged by shimmering sorcery. Over thirty dray horses pulled it, but, Whiskey Jack guessed, even that many of the powerful beasts would be insufficient, if not for the visible magic carrying much of the enormous wagon's weight. Behind it, the portal closed abruptly in a spray of blood. The commander glanced down to see his horse's legs ankle-deep in the now-slowing flow. He glanced over at Silver Fox. She stood motionless, looking down at the liquid as it lapped against her bared shins. This blood, she said slowly, almost disbelieving, is his. Oh. She looked up, her expression one of dismay. An elder god's, a... Uh, a friend's. This is what is filling the Warrens. He has been wounded, somehow. Wounded, perhaps fatally. Gods, the Warrens. With a curse, Whiskey Jack collected his reins and kicked his horse into a splashing canter towards the giant wagon. Massive gouges had been ripped from its ornate sides. Blackened smears showed where guards had once clung. Smoke drifted above the entire train. Figures had begun emerging, staggering as if blind, moaning as if their souls had been torn from their bodies. He saw guards fall to their knees in the sludgy blood, weeping or simply bowing in shuddering silence. The side door nearest Whiskey Jack opened as he rode up. A woman climbed weakly into view, was helped down the steps.
She pushed her companions away once her boots sank into the crimson, grass-matted mud and found purchase. The commander dismounted. The merchant bowed her head, her red-rimmed eyes holding steady as she drew herself straight. Please forgive the delay, sir, she said in a voice that rasped with exhaustion. I take it you will find an alternate route back to Darujistan, Whiskey Jack said, eyeing the wagon behind her. We shall decide once we assess the damage. She faced the dust cloud to the east. Has your army encamped for the night? No doubt the order's been given. Good. We're in no condition to chase you. I've noticed. Three guards, shareholders, approached from one of the lead wagons, struggling beneath the weight of a huge bestial arm, torn at the shoulder and still dripping blood. Three taloned fingers and two opposable thumbs twitched and waved a hand's breadth away from the face of one of the guards. All three men were grinning. We figured it was still there, Haradas. Lost the other three, though. Still, ain't it a beauty? The merchant Haradas briefly closed her eyes and sighed. The attack came early on, she explained to Whiskey Jack. A score of demons, probably as lost and frightened as we were. And why should they attack you? Wasn't an attack, sir, one of the guards said. They just wanted a ride out of that nightmare. We would have obliged to, only they was too heavy. And they didn't sign a waiver, neither, another guard pointed out. We even offered a stake. Enough, gentlemen, Arada said. Take that thing away. But the three men had come too close to the lead wheel of the huge wagon. As soon as the demonic hand made contact with the rim, it closed with a snap around it. The three guards leapt back, leaving the arm hanging from the wheel. Oh, that's just terrific, Harada snapped. And whenever will we get that off? When the fingers wear through, I guess, a guard replied, frowning at the arm. Gonna be a lumpy ride for a while, dear. Sorry about that. A troop of riders approached from the army's train. Your escort's arrived, Whiskey Jack noted. We will ask for a detailed report of the journey, mistress. I suggest you stand down until this evening and leave the details of distribution to your second. She nodded. Good idea. The commander searched for Silver Fox. She had resumed her march, the two marines trailing. The blood of the god had stained the marines' boots and the rivies' legs. Across the plain, for two hundred or more paces, the earth looked like a red, matted, tattered blanket plucked and torn into dissolving disarray. As ever, Kalos' thoughts were dark. Ashes and dust. The fools prattle on and on in the command tent. A vast waste of time. Death flows through the warrens. What matter? Order ever succumbs to chaos, broken unto itself by the very strictures it imposes. The world would do better without mages. I, for one, will not rue the demise of sorcery. The lone candle, streaked with the crushed fragments of a rare sea worm, gusted thick, heavy smoke, filling the tent. Shadows crawled beneath the drifting plumes. Flickering yellow light glinted off ancient, oft-mended armor. Seated on the ornate ironwood throne, Kalor breathed deep of the invigorating fumes. Alchemy is not magic. The arcana of the natural world holds far more wonders than any wizard would conjure in a thousand lifetimes. These century candles, for one, are well named. Upon my life, yet another layer seeps into my flesh and bone. I can feel it with each breath. A good thing, too. Who would want to live forever in a body too frail to move? Another hundred years... Gained in the passage of a single night, in the depth of this one reach of columned wax. And I have scores more. No matter the stretch of decades and centuries, no matter the interminable boredom of inactivity that was so much a part of living, there were moments. Moments when I must act explosively, with certainty, and all that seemed nothing before was in truth preparation. 
There are creatures that hunt without moving. When they become perfectly still, perfectly motionless, they are at their most dangerous. I am as such a creature. I have always been so, yet all who know me are gone. Ashes and dust. The children who now surround me with their gibbering worries are blind to the hunter in their midst. Blind. Pale hands gripping the arms of the throne, he sat unmoving, stalking the landscape of his own memories, dragging them forth like corpses pulled from the ground, drawing their visages close for a moment before casting them away and moving on. Eight mighty wizards, hands linked, voices rising in unison, desperate for power, seeking it from a distant, unknown realm. Unsuspecting, curious, the strange god in that strange place edged closer. Then the trap was sprung. Down he came, torn to pieces yet remaining alive, brought down, shattering a continent, obliterating warrens, himself broken, damaged, crippled. Eight mighty wizards, who sought to oppose me and so loosed a nightmare that rises once more, millennia later. Fools. Now they are dust and ashes. Three gods, assailing my realm. Too many insults delivered by my hand. My existence had gone beyond irritation, and so they banded together to crush me once and for all. In their ignorance, they assumed I would play by their rules, either fight or yield my realm. My, weren't they surprised, striding into my empire only to find nothing left alive, nothing but charred bones and lifeless ash. They could not comprehend, nor did they ever, that I would yield nothing. Rather than surrender all I had fashioned, I destroyed it. That is the privilege of the Creator, to give, then to take away. I shall never forget the world's death cry, for it was the voice of my triumph. And one of you remains, pursuing me once more. Oh, I know it is you, Kral. But instead of me, you have found another enemy. And he is killing you. Slowly. Deliciously. You have returned to this realm only to die, as I said you would. And did you know? Your sister has succumbed to my ancient curse as well. So little left of her, will she ever recover? Not if I can help it. A faint smile spread across his withered, pallid face. His eyes narrowed as the portal began to take shape before him. Miasmic power swirled from it. A figure emerged, tall, gaunt, a face shattered. Massive cuts gaping red, the shards of broken bone glimmering in the candlelight. The portal closed behind the jagat, who stood relaxed, eyes flickering pools of darkness. I convey greetings from the crippled god, the jagat said, to you, Kalor. He paused to survey the tense interior. And your vast empire. You tempt me, Kalor rasped, to add to your facial distress, Gethol. My empire may be gone, but I shall not yield this throne. You, of all people, should recognize that I am not yet done in my ambitions, and I am a patient man. Gethol grunted a laugh. <laughs> ah... Dear Kalor, you are to me the exception to the rule that patience is a virtue. I can destroy you, Jaggart, no matter who you call master these days. I can complete what your capable punisher began. Do you doubt me? Most certainly not, Gethel replied easily. I've seen you wield that two-handed sword of yours. Then withdraw your verbal knives and tell me what you do here. Apologies for disrupting your concentration. I shall now explain. I am herald to the crippled god. Aye, a new house has come to the deck of dragons. 
the House of Chains. The first renditions have been fashioned, and soon every reader of the deck will be seeking their likenesses. Kalor snorted. <laughs> and you expect this gambit to work? That house shall be assailed, obliterated. Oh, the battle is well underway, old man. You cannot be blind to that, nor to the fact that we are winning. Callow's eyes thinned to slits. The poisoning of the Warrens? The crippled god is a fool. What point in destroying the power he requires to assert his claim? Without the Warrens, the deck of dragons is nothing. The appellation poison is erroneous, Callow. Rather... Consider the infection one of enforcing a certain alteration to the Warrens. Aye, those who resist it view it as a deadly manifestation, a poison indeed, but only because its primary effect is to make the Warrens impassable to them. Servants of the crippled god, however, will find themselves able to travel freely in the paths. I am servant to no one, Callow growled. The position of High King is vacant within the Cripple God's House of Chains. Callow shrugged. Nonetheless requiring that I stain my knees before the Chained One. No such gestures are demanded of the High King. The House of Chains exists beyond the Cripple God's influence. Is that not obvious? He is chained, after all, trapped in a lifeless fragment of a long-dead warren, bound to the flesh of the sleeping goddess. Aye, that has proved his singular means of efficacy, but it is limited. Understand, Kalor, that the crippled god now casts the House of Chains into the world, indeed abandons it to its fate. Survival depends on those who come to the titles it contains. Some of those the Chained One can influence, though never directly, whilst others, such as that of King of High House Chains, must be freely assumed. If so, Callow rumbled after a long moment, why are you not the King? Gethol bowed his head. You honour me, sir, he said dryly. I am, however, content to be herald, under the delusion that the messenger is ever spared, no matter what the message. You were never as smart as your brother, were you? Somewhere, Gothos must be laughing. Gothos never laughs, but given that I know where he languishes, I do. Often. Now. Should I remain here much longer awaiting your answer, my presence may well be detected. There are Tisti Andy nearby. Very near. Not to mention Caladan Brood. Lucky for you, Anamanda Reek has left. Returned to Moonspawn, wherever it is. Its location must be discovered, revealed to the crippled god. The grey-haired warrior raised an eyebrow. A task for the king? Does betrayal sting your sense of honour, Kalor? If you call it a sudden reversal of strategy, the sting fades. What I require in exchange is an opportunity, arranged howsoever the crippled god pleases. What is the nature of this opportunity, High King? Kalor smiled, then his expression hardened. The woman, Silver Fox... A moment of vulnerability. That is all I ask. Gethol slowly bowed. I am your herald, sire, and shall convey your desires to the crippled god. Tell me, Kalor said, before you go, does this throne suit the House of Chains, Gethol? The Jaghart studied the battered iron-coloured wood, noted the cracks in its frame. It most certainly does, sire. Be gone, then. The herald bowed once more, the portal opening behind him. A moment later he stepped back and was gone. Smoke from the candle swirled in the wake of the vanishing portal. 
Kalor drew a deep breath, adding years and years of renewed vigor. He sat motionless. A hunter on the edge of ambush, he thought. Suitably explosive. Suitably deadly. Whiskey Jack stepped out of the command tent, stood gazing up at the sweep of stars overhead. It had been a long time since he had felt so weary. He heard movement behind him, then a soft, long-fingered hand settled on his shoulder, the touch sending waves through him. It would be nice, Corlat murmured, to hear good news for a change. He grunted. I see the worry in your eyes, Whiskey Jack. It's a long list, isn't it? Your bridge burners, Silver Fox, her mother, and now this assault on the Warrens. We are marching blind. So much rests on unknowns. Does Capustan still hold, or has the city fallen? And what of Trots and Paran, Quickmen? I am aware of that list, Corlat, he rumbled. Sorry, I share them, that is all. He glanced at her. Forgive me, but why? This is not your war. Gods below, it's not even your world. Why are you yielding to its needs? He sighed loudly and shook his head, returning his gaze to the night sky. That's a question we asked often, early in the campaigns. I remember in Black Dog Forest, stumbling over a half dozen of your kin. A Maranth Cusser had taken them out. A squad of regulars was busy looting the bodies. They were cursing, not finding anything of worth. A few knotted strips of coloured cloth, a stream-polished pebble, plain weapons, the kind you could pick up in any market in any city. He was silent for a moment, then he continued. And I remember wondering, what was the story of their lives, their dreams, their aspirations? Would their kin miss them? The Maibi once mentioned that the Rivi took on the task of burying the Tista Andy Fallen. Well, we did the same, there in that wood. We sent the regulars packing with boots to the backside. We buried your dead, Corlat, consigned their souls in the Malazan way. Her eyes were depthless as she studied him. Why? she asked quietly. Whiskey Jack frowned. Why did we bury them? Hood's breath! We honour our enemies, no matter who they might be. But the Tista Andy, most of all. They accepted prisoners, treated those that were wounded. They even accepted withdrawal. Not once were we pursued after hightailing it from an unwinnable scrap. And did not the bridge burners return the favour, time and again, Commander? And indeed, before long, so did the rest of Jujak One-Arm's soldiers. Most campaigns get nastier the longer they drag on, Whiskey Jack mused. But not that one. It's got more civilized, unspoken protocols. Much of that was undone when you took Pale. He nodded. More than you know. Her hand was still on his shoulder. Come with me back to my tent, Whiskey Jack. His brows rose, then he smiled and said in a dry tone, not a night to be alone. Don't be a fool, she snapped. I did not ask for company. I asked for you. Not a faceless need that must be answered, and anyone will do. Not that. Am I understood? Not entirely. I wish us to become lovers, Whiskey Jack. Beginning tonight, I wish to awaken in your arms. I would know if you have feelings for me. He was silent for a long moment, then he said, I'd be a fool not to, Corlat, but I had also considered it even more foolish to attempt any advance. I assumed you were mated to another Tista Andy, a union no doubt centuries long. And what would be the point of such a union? He frowned, startled. Well, um, companionship? Children? Children arrive. Rarely as much a product of boredom as anything else. Tista and Yi do not find companionship among their own kind. That died out long ago, Whiskey Jack. 
Yet even rarer is the occasion of a Tista Andy emerging from the darkness into the mortal world, seeking a reprieve from... from... He set a finger to her lips. No more. I am honoured to accept you, Kolat. More than you will ever realise, and I will seek to be worthy of your gift. She shook her head, eyes dropping. It is a scant gift. Seek my heart, and you may be disappointed in what you find. The Malazan stepped back and reached for his belt pouch. He untied it, upended the small leather sack into one cupped hand. A few coins fell out, then a small, bedraggled, multicolored knot of cloth strips, followed by a lone, dark, smooth pebble. I'd thought, he said slowly, eyes on the object in his hand, that one day I might have the opportunity to return what was clearly of value to those fallen Tista Andy. All that was found in that search. I realized even then that I could do naught but honor them. Corlad closed her hand over his, trapping the objects within their joined clasp. She led him down the first row of tents. The Maibi dreamed. She found herself clinging to the edge of a precipice, white-knuckled hands gripping gnarled roots, the susurration of trickling dirt dusting her face as she strained to hold on. Below waited the abyss, racked with the storm of dismembered memories, streamers of pain, fear, rage, jealousy, and dark desires. That storm wanted her, was reaching up for her, and she was helpless to defend herself. Her arms were weakening. A shrieking wind wrapped around her legs, yanked, snatched her away, and she was falling, adding her own scream to the cacophony. The winds tossed her this way and that, twisting, tumbling. Something hard and vicious struck her hip, glanced away. Air buffeted her hard. Then the hard intrusion was back, talons closing around her waist, scaled, cold as death. A sharp tug snapped her head back, and she was no longer falling, but rising, carried higher and higher. The storm's roar faded below her, then dwindled away to one side. The Maibi twisted her head, looked up. An undead dragon loomed above her, impossibly huge. Desiccated, dried flaps of skin trailing from its limbs, its almost translucent wings thundering. The creature was bearing her away. She turned to study what lay below. A featureless plain stretched out beneath her, dun brown. Long cracks in the earth were visible, filled with dully glowing ice. She saw a darker patch, ragged at its edges, flow over a hillside. A herd. I have walked that land before. Here in my dreams. There were footprints. The dragon banked suddenly, crooked its wings, and began a swift spiral earthward. She found herself wailing, was shocked to realize that it was not terror she was feeling but exhilaration. Spirits above, this is what it is to fly. Ah, now I know envy in truth. The land rushed up to meet her. Moments before what would have been a fatal impact, the dragon's wings snapped wide, caught the air, then the leg directly above, curling upward to join its twin. The creature glided silently, an arm's length above the loamy ground. Forward momentum abated. The leg lowered, the talons releasing her. She landed with barely a thump, rolled onto her back, then sat up to watch the enormous dragon rising once more, wings thundering. The Maibi looked down and saw a youthful body. Her own. She cried out at the cruelty of this dream. Cried out again, curling tight on the cool, damp earth. Oh, why did you save me? Why, only to awaken, spirits below, to awaken. She was passing through. A soft voice, a stranger's voice in the language of the rivi, spoke in her mind. 
The Mybe's head snapped up. She looked around. Who speaks? Where are you? We're here. When you are ready to see us, you shall. Your daughter has a will to match yours, it seems. To have so commanded the greatest of the bonecasters. True, she comes in answer to the child's summons. The gathering. Making the detour a minor one. Nonetheless, we are impressed. My daughter? She still stings from harsh words. We can feel that. Indeed, it is how we have come to dwell here. That small, round man hides obsidian edges beneath his surfeit of flesh. Who would have thought? She has given to you all she has, Silver Fox. The time has come for you to gift in answer, lass. Krupper is not alone in refusing to abandon her to her fate. Ah, he opened her eyes then, swept away her obsessing with herself, and she only a child at the time. But she heeded his words, though in truth he spoke only within her dreams at that time. He did. Yes, indeed. So, the voice continued, will you see us now? She stared down at her smooth hands, her young arms, and screamed, Stop torturing me with this dream. Stop. Oh, stop. Her eyes opened to the musty darkness of her tent. Aches and twinges prodded her thinned bones, her shrunken muscles. Weeping, the Mybe pulled her ancient body into a tight ball. God, she whispered, how I hate you. How I hate you. Book Three, Kapustan The last mortal sword of Fainer's Rev was Fanald of Cornvor, who was killed in the chaining. The last boar-cloaked destriant was Ibshank of Corelri, who vanished during the last flight of Manusk on the Stratum Icefields. Another waited to claim that title, but was cast out from the temple before it came to him, and that man's name has been stricken from all records. It is known, however, that he was from Unter, that he had begun his days as a cut-purse living on its foul streets, and that his casting out from the temple was marked by the singular punishment of Fainer's Rev. Temple Lives, Birin Thund. Chapter 14 If you can, dear friends, do not live through a siege. Ubilast, the Legless The inn commanding the southeast corner of Old Daru Street held no more than half a dozen patrons, most of them visitors to the city, who, like Gruntle, were now trapped. The Panyan armies surrounding Kapustan's walls had done nothing for five days and counting. There had been clouds of dust from beyond the ridgeline to the north. The caravan captain had heard signalling something. But that had been days ago, and nothing had come of it. What Septarch Kulpath was waiting for, no one knew, though there was plenty of speculation. More barges carrying Teneskauri had been seen crossing the river, until it seemed that half the Empire's population had joined the peasant army. With numbers like that, someone had said a bell earlier, there'll be barely a mouthful of Kapban citizen each. Gruntle had been virtually alone in appreciating the jest. He sat at a table near the entrance, his back to the rough plastered double-beamed doorframe, the door itself on his right, the low-ceilinged main room before him. A mouse was working its way along the earthen floor beneath the tables, scampering from shadow to shadow, slipping between the shoes or boots of whatever patron its path intersected. Gruntle watched its progress with low-lidded eyes. There was still plenty of food to be found in the kitchen, or so its nose was telling it. That bounty, Gruntle well knew, would not last if the siege drew out. 
His gaze flicked up to the smoke-stained main truss spanning the room, where the inn's cat slept, limbs dangling from the crossbeam. The feline hunted only in its dreams, for the moment at least. The mouse reached the foot bar of the counter, waddled parallel to it towards the kitchen entrance. Gruntle took another mouthful of watered wine, more water than wine after almost a week's stranglehold on the city by the panions. The six other patrons were each sitting alone at a table or leaning up against the counter. Words were exchanged among them every now and then, a few desultory comments, usually answered by little more than a grunt. Over the course of a day and night, the inn was peopled by two types, or so Gruntle had observed. The ones before him now virtually lived in the common room, nursing their wine and ale. Strangers to Capustan and seemingly friendless, they'd achieved a kind of community nonetheless, characterized by a vast ability to do nothing together for long periods of time. Come the night, the other type would begin to assemble. Loud, boisterous, drawing the street whores inside with their coins, which they tumbled onto the tabletops with no thought of tomorrow. Theirs was a desperate energy, a bluff hail to Hood. We're yours, you scything bastard, they seemed to say, but not till the dawn. They'd churn like a foaming sea around the immovable, indifferent rocks that were the silent, friendless patrons. The sea in the rocks, Gruntle thought. The sea celebrates in the face of Hood as soon as he looms close. The rocks have stared the bastard in the eye for so long they're past budging, much less celebrating. The sea laughs uproariously at its own jokes. The rocks grind out a terse line that can silence an entire room, a cap and mouthful. Next time, I'll keep my tongue to myself. The cat rose on the crossbeam, stretching, its banded black stripes rippling across its dun fur cocked its head downward, ears pricking. The mouse was at the edge of the kitchen entrance, frozen. Gruntle hissed under his breath. The cat looked his way. The mouse darted into the kitchen and out of sight. With a loud creak, the indoor swung inward. Buke stepped inside, crossed Gruntle's view, then sank down into the chair beside him. You're predictable enough, the old man muttered gesturing for two of the same when he caught the barkeep's eye. Aye, Gruntle replied. I'm a rock. A rock, huh? More like a fat iguana clinging to one. And when the big wave comes, whatever. You found me, Buke. Now what? Just wanted to thank you for all the help, Gruntle. Was that subtle irony, old man? A little honing? Actually, I was almost serious. That muddy water you made me drink. Karuli's concoction. It's done wonders. His narrow face revealed a slightly secretive smile. Wonders? Glad to hear you're all better. Any more earth-shattering news? If not... Buke leaned back as the barkeep delivered the two tankards, then said after the man shambled away, I've met with the elders of the camps. At first they wanted to go straight to the prince. But then they came to their senses. With a little prodding. So now you've got all the help you need in keeping that insane eunuch from playing doorman to Hood's Gate. Good. Can't have panic in the streets, what with a quarter million panions laying siege to the city. Buke's eyes thinned on Gruntle. Thought you'd appreciate the calm. Now that's much better. I still need your help. Can't see how, Buke. Unless you want me to kick down the door and separate Corbel Broach's head from his shoulders. In which case you'll need to keep Beauchelaine distracted. Set him on fire or something. I only need a moment. Of course, timing's everything. Once the walls have been breached, say, and there's a tennis gallery mobbing the streets. That way we can all go hand in hand to Hood, singing a merry tune. Buke smiled behind his tankard. That'll do, he said, then drank. Gruntle drained his own cup, reached for the new one. You know where to find me, he said after a moment, until the wave comes. The cat leapt down from the crossbeam, pounced forward, trapping a cockroach between its paws. It began playing. All right, the caravan captain growled after a moment. What else do you want to say? Buke shrugged offhandedly. 
I hear Stoney has volunteered. Latest rumours have it the Panins are finally ready for the first assault. Any time now. The first? Likely they'll only need the one. As for being ready, they've been ready for days, Buke. If Stoney wants to throw away her life defending the indefensible, that's her business. What's the alternative? The Panions won't take prisoners, Gruntle. We'll all have to fight, sooner or later. That's what you think, Gruntle thought. Unless, Buke continued after a moment as he raised his tankard, you plan on switching sides. Finding faith is a matter of expedience. What other way is there? The old man's eyes sharpened. You'd fill your belly with human flesh, Gruntle, just to survive. You'd do that, would you? Meat is meat, Gruntle replied, his eyes on the cat. A soft crunch announced that it had finished playing. Well, Buke said, rising, I didn't think you were capable of shocking me. I guess I thought I knew you. You thought. So this is the man Harlow gave his life for. Gruntle slowly raised his head. Whatever Buke saw in his eyes made him step back. Which camp are you working with right now? The caravan captain calmly asked. Alden, the old man whispered. I'll look in on you then. In the meantime, Buke, get out of my sight. The shadows had retreated across most of the compound, leaving Heaton and her brother Kafal in full sunlight. The two bargasts were squatting on a worn, faded rug, heads bowed. Sweat, blackened with ash, dripped from them both. Between them was a broad, shallow brazier, perched on three hand-high iron legs and filled with smouldering coals. Soldiers and court messengers flowed around them on all sides. Shield Anvil at Covian studied the siblings from where he stood near the headquarters entrance. He had not known the Bargast as a people enamoured of meditation, yet Eton and Kafal had done little else, it seemed, since their return from the thrall. Fasting, uncommunicative, inconveniently encamped in the centre of the barracks compound, they had made of themselves an unapproachable island. Theirs is not a mortal calm, Itkovian thought. They travel among the spirits. Brukalian demands that I find a way through. By any means. Does Heaton possess yet one more secret? An avenue of escape for her, her brother, and for the bones of the founding spirits. An unknown weakness in our defence. A flaw in the Panion investiture. Itkovian sighed. He had tried before without success. He would now try once again. As he prepared to step forward, he sensed a presence at his side and turned, to find Prince Jalakan. The young man's face was etched deep with exhaustion. His long-fingered, elegant hands trembled, despite being knitted together just above his robe's belt. His gaze was fixed on the swirling activity in the compound, as he said, I must know, Shield Anvil, what Brucarlian intends. He holds what you soldiers call a shaved knuckle in the hole. That much is clear. And so I have come, once again, seeking audience with the man in my employ. He made no effort to hide the sardonic bitterness of that statement. To no avail. The mortal sword has no time for me. No time for the Prince of Capustan. Sir, Itkovian said, you may ask your questions of me and I shall do all I can to answer you. The young Kapan swung to the shield anvil. Brukalian has given you leave to speak? He has. Very well. The Kron Talan I mass and their undead wolves. They have destroyed the Septarch's Kachain demons. They have. Yet the Panion Domin has more, hundreds more. Yes. Then why do the Talan I mass not march into the Empire? An assault into the Seer's territory may well achieve the withdrawal of Culpath's besieging forces. The Seer would have no choice but to pull them back across the river. Were the Talani mass a mortal army, the choice would indeed be obvious, and consequently beneficial to our own needs, Itkovian replied. Alas, Kron and his undead kin are bound by unearthly demands, of which we know virtually nothing. We have been told of a gathering, a silent summoning for purposes unknown. 
This, for the moment, takes precedence over all else. Kron and the Talan I destroyed the Septarch's Kachin Chimali because their presence was deemed a direct threat to the gathering. Why? That explanation is insufficient, Shield Anvil. I do not disagree with your assessment, sir. There does appear to be another reason for Kron's reluctance to march southward. A mystery concerning the seer himself. It seems the word Panion is Jaghut. The Jaghut were the mortal enemies of the Talani Mass, as you may know. It is my personal belief that Kron awaits the arrival of allies, other Talani Mass, come to this impending gathering. You are suggesting that Kron is intimidated by the Panion seer? I, in his belief that the seer is Jaghut. The prince was silent for a long moment, then he shook his head. Even should the Talan Imas decide to march upon the Panion Domin, the decision will come too late for us. That seems likely. Very well. Now, another question. Why is this gathering occurring here? Idkovian hesitated, then slowly nodded to himself. Prince Jalakan, the one who has summoned the Talan Imas is approaching Kapustan, in the company of an army. An army? An army marching to wage war against the Panion Domin. Indeed, with the additional aim of relieving the siege here at Kapustan. What? Sir, they are five weeks away. We cannot hold. This truth is known, Prince. And does this summoner command that army? No. Command is shared between two men, Caladan Brood and Duchek Wanarm. Duchek? High Fist Wanarm? The Malazan? Lords below it, Kofin, how long have you known this? The shield anvil cleared his throat. <clears throat> Preliminary contact was established some time ago, Prince, through sorceress avenues. These have since grown impossible. Yes, yes, I know that well enough. Continue, damn you. The presence of the summoner among their company was news only recently told us, by a bonecaster of the Kron Talan Imas. The army, Itkovian. Tell me more of this army. Dujek and his legions have been outlawed by Empress Lassine. They are now acting independently. His complement numbers perhaps ten thousand. Caladan Brood has under his command a number of small mercenary companies, three Bargas clans, the Rivi Nation, and the Tista Andi, a total number of combatants of 30,000. Prince Jalakan's eyes were wide. Itkovian watched the information breach the man's inner defences, watched as the host of hopes flowered, then withered in swift succession. On the surface, the shield anvil said quietly, all that I have told you seems of vital import. Yet, as I see you now comprehend, it is in truth all meaningless. Five weeks, Prince. Leave them to their vengeance, if you will, for that is all they might manage. And even then, given their limited numbers. Are these Brucalian's conclusions, or yours? Both, I regret to say. You fools! the young man grated. You hood-damned fools! Sire, we cannot withstand the Panions for five weeks. I know that, damn you. The question now is, why do we even try? Itkovian frowned. Sir, such was the contract, the defense of the city. Idiot, what do I care about your damned contract? You've already concluded you will fail in any case. My concern is for the lives of my people. This army comes from the west? It must. Marching beside the river? We cannot break out, Prince. We would be annihilated. We concentrate everything to the west? A sudden sortie that flows into an exodus? Shield anvil? We will be slaughtered, Itkovian cut in. Sire, we have considered this. It will not work. The Septarch's wings of horsemen will surround us, grind us to a halt. Then the Becklights and the Teniskari will arrive. We will have yielded a defensible position for an indefensible one. It would all be over within the span of a single bell. 
Prince Jalakan stared at the shield anvil with undisguised contempt and, indeed, hatred. Inform Brucalian of the following, he rasped. In the future, it is not the task of the Greyswords to do the prince's thinking for him. It is not their task to decide what he needs to know and what he doesn't. The prince is to be informed of all matters, regardless of how you judge their relevance. Is this understood, Shield Anvil? I shall convey your words precisely, sire. I must presume, the prince continued, that the Mask Council knows even less than I did a bell ago? That would be an accurate assumption. Sire, their interests... Save me from any more of your learned opinions, Itkovian. Good day. Itkovian watched the prince stalk away, towards the compound's exit, his gait too stiff to be regal. Yet noble in its own way, he thought. You have my regret, dear prince, though I would not presume to voice it. I am the will of the mortal sword. My own desires are irrelevant. He pushed away the surge of bitter anger that rose beneath these thoughts, returned his gaze to the two Bagar still seated on the rug. The trance had broken. Heaton and Kafar were now leaning close to the brazier, where white smoke rose in twisting coils into the sunlit air. Startled, it was a moment before Itkovian stepped forward. As he approached, he saw that an object had been placed on the brazier's coals. Red tinged on its edges, flat and milky white in the center. A fresh scapula, too light to be from a bedroom, yet thinner and longer than a human's. A deer's shoulder blade, perhaps, or an antelope's. The Bargast had begun a divination, employing the object that gave meaning to the tribal name of their shamans. More than just warriors, then, Itkovian thought. I should have guessed. Kafal's chant in the thrall. He is a shoulder man. And Heaton is his female counterpart. He stopped just beyond the edge of the rug, slightly to Kafal's left. The shoulder blade had begun to show cracks. Fat bubbled up along the thick edges of the bone, sizzled and flared like a ring of fire. The simplest divination was the interpretation of the cracks as a map, a means of finding wild herds for the tribe's hunters. In this instance, Itkovian well knew, the sorcery underway was far more complex, the cracks more than simply a map of the physical world. The shield anvil stayed silent, tried to catch the mumbled conversation between Heaton and her brother. They were speaking Bargast, a language of which Itkovian had but passing knowledge. Even stranger, it seemed the conversation was three-way, the siblings cocking their heads or nodding at replies only they could hear. The scapula was a maze of cracks now, the bones showing blue, beige, and calcined white. Before too long it would begin to crumble, as the creature's spirit surrendered to the overwhelming power flowing through its dwindling life force. The eerie conversation ended. As Kafal fell back into a trance, Heaton sat back, looked up, and met Itkovian's eyes. Ah, Wolf, I am pleased by the sight of you. There have been changes to the world, surprising changes. And are these changes pleasing to you, Heaton? She smiled. Would it give you pleasure if they were? Do I step over this precipice? Itkovian thought. That possibility exists. The woman laughed, slowly climbed to her feet. She winced as she stretched her limbs. Spirits take me, my bones ache. My muscles cry out for caring hands. There are limbering exercises. Don't I know it, Wolf? Will you join me in such endeavors? What news do you have, Heaton? She grinned, hands on her hips. By the abyss, she drawled, you are clumsy. Yield to me and learn all my secrets. Is that the task set before you? It is a game you should be wary of playing, especially with me. Perhaps you are right, he said, drawing himself up and turning away. Old man, Heaton laughed, you flee like a rabbit, and I called you Wolf. I should change that name. That is your choice, he replied over a shoulder as he set off. Her laugh rang out behind him once more. 
Ah, now this is a game worth playing. Go on then, dear rabbit, my elusive quarry. Ha! Itkovian re-entered the headquarters, walked down the hallway skirting the outer wall until he came to the tower entrance. His armor shifted and clanked as he made his way up the steep stone stairs. He tried to drive out images of Heaton, her laughing face and bright dancing eyes, the runnels of sweat tracking her brow through the layer of ash, the way she stood, back arched, chest thrown out in deliberate, provocative invitation. He resented the rebirth of long-buried desires now plaguing him. His vows were crumbling, his every prayer to Fainer meeting with naught but silence, as if his god was indifferent to the sacrifices Itkovian had made in his name. And perhaps that is the final, most devastating truth, he thought. The gods care nothing for ascetic impositions on mortal behavior, care nothing for rules of conduct, for the twisted morals of temple priests and monks. Perhaps indeed they laugh at the chains we wrap around ourselves, our endless, insatiable need to find flaws within the demands of life. Or perhaps they do not laugh, but rage at us. Perhaps our denial of life's celebration is our greatest insult to those whom we worship and serve. He reached the arms room at the top of the circular stairs, nodded distractedly at the two soldiers stationed there, then made his way up the ladder to the roof platform. The destriant was already there. Carnadus studied at Covian as the shield anvil joined him. Yours, sir, is a troubled mean. I, I do not deny it. I have had discourse with Prince Jalakan, which closed with his displeasure. Subsequently, I spoke with Heaton. Destrant, my faith is assailed. You question your vows? I do, sir. I admit to doubting their veracity. Has it been your belief, Shield Anvil, that your rules of conduct existed to appease Fainer? Itkovian frowned as he leaned on the Merlin and stared out at the smoke-wreathed enemy camps. Well, yes. Then you have lived under a misapprehension, sir. Explain, please. Very well. You found a need to chain yourself, a need to enforce upon your own soul the strictures as defined by your vows. In other words, Itkovian, your vows were born of a dialogue with yourself, not with Fainer. The chains are your own, as is the possession of the keys with which to unlock them when they are no longer required. No longer required? Aye, when all that is encompassed by living ceases to threaten your faith. You suggest, then, that my crisis is not with my faith, but with my vows, that I have blurred the distinction. I do, Shield Anvil. Destriant, Itkovian said, eyes still on the Panion encampments. Your words invite a carnal flood. The high priest burst out laughing. <laughs> And with it a dramatic collapse of your dour disposition, one hopes. Itkovian's mouth twitched. Now you speak of miracles, sir. I would hope. Hold! The shield anvil raised a gauntleted hand. There is movement among the Becklites. Carnadus joined him, suddenly sober. And there, Itkovian pointed. Odeman, Scalandi to their flanks. Seer Domin moving to positions of command. They will assail the redoubts first, the Destrin predicted. The mask councils vaunted Gidrath in their strongholds. That may earn us more time. Find me my messenger, Corsa. Alert the officers, and a word to the prince. I, Shield Anvil. Will you stay here? Itkovian nodded. A worthy vantage point. Go then, sir. Backlight troops were massing in a ring around the Gidrath stronghold, out on the killing ground. Spear points glittered in the sunlight. Now alone, Itkovian's eyes narrowed as he studied the preparations. Ah, well, it has begun. The streets of Kapustan were silent, virtually empty beneath a cloudless sky, as Gruntle made his way down Kalmanark Alley. He came to the curved wall of the self-contained camp known as Ulden, 
kicked through the rubbish cluttering a stairwell leading down below street level and hammered a fist on the solid door cut into the wall's foundations. After a moment, it creaked open. Gruntle stepped through into a narrow corridor, its floor a sharply angled ramp leading back up to ground level, twenty paces ahead, where bright sunlight showed, revealing a central, circular courtyard. Buke shut the massive door behind him, struggled beneath the weight of the bar as he lowered it back into the slots. The gaunt, grey-haired man then faced Gruntle. That was quick. Well? What do you think? The caravan captain growled. There's been movement. The panions are marshalling. Messengers riding this way and that. Which wall were you on? North. Just this side of Letcar House. As if it makes any difference. And you? I forgot to ask earlier. Did the bastard go hunting the streets last night? No, I told you the camps are helping. I think he's still trying to figure out why he came up empty the night before last. It's got him rattled. Enough for Beauchelin to notice. Hmm. Not good news. He'll start probing, Buke. Aye. I said there'd be risks, didn't I? Aye. Trying to keep an insane murderer from finding victims, Gruntle thought. Without his noticing. With a siege about to begin. Abyss take you, Buke. What are you trying to drag me into? Gruntle glanced up the ramp. Help, you said. How are your new friends taking this? The old man shrugged. Gorbel Brooch prefers healthy organs when collecting for his experiments. It's their children at risk. Less so if they'd been left ignorant. They know that. Did you say children? Aye. We've got at least four of the little watchers on the house at all times. Homeless urchins. There's plenty enough of the real kind for them to blend in. They're keeping their eyes on the sky, too. He stopped abruptly, and a strangely furtive look came into his eyes. The man, Gruntle realized, had a secret. On the sky? What for? Ah, uh, in case Corbel Brooch tries the rooftops. In a city of widely spaced domes? Gruntle thought. The point I was trying to make, Buke continued, is that there's eyes on the house. Luckily, Beauchelaine's still holed up in the cellar, which she's turned into some kind of laboratory. He never leaves, and Corbel sleeps during the day. Gruntle, what I said earlier... Gruntle cut him off with a sharply raised hand. Listen, he said. The two men stood unmoving. Distant thunder beneath their feet, a slowly rising roar from beyond the city's walls. Buke, suddenly pale, cursed and asked, Where's Stoney? And don't try telling me you don't know. Port Road Gate, five squads of Greyswords, a company of Gidrath, a dozen or so Lestari guard. It's loudest there. Scowling, he grunted. She figured it'd start with that gate. Stupid woman. Buke stepped close and gripped his arm. Then why? he hissed. In Hood's name, are you still standing here? The assault's begun, and Stoney's got herself right in the middle of it. Gruntle pulled free. Sing me the abyss, old man. The woman's all grown up, you know. I told her. I told you. This isn't my war. Won't stop the tennis gallery from lopping off your head for the pot. Sneering, Gruntle pushed Buke clear of the door. He gripped the weighted bar in his right hand, and in a single surge lifted it clear of the slots and let it drop with a clang that echoed up the corridor. He pulled the door open, ducking to step through onto the stairwell. The sound of the assault was a thunderous roar once he reached street level and emerged to stand in the alley. Amidst the muted clangor of weapons were screams, bellows, and that indefinable stuttering shiver that came from thousands of armored bodies in motion. Outside the walls, along the battlements, on either side of the gate, which he knew would be groaning beneath repeated impacts from battering rams. At long last, the siege had unsheathed its sharp iron. The waiting was over. And they won't hold those walls, nor the gates. This will be over by dusk, Gruntle thought. He thought about getting drunk, was comforted by the familiar track of that thought. Movement from above caught his attention. 
He looked up to see, arcing in from the west, half a hundred balls of fire ripping paths through the sky. Flames exploded within sight and beyond as the missiles struck buildings and streets with hammering concussions. He turned to see a second wave coming in from the north, one of them growing larger than the others. Still larger, a raging sun flying directly towards him. With a curse, Gruntle flung himself back down the stairwell. The tarry mass struck the street, bounced in a storm of fire, and struck the curved wall of the camp, not ten paces to one side of the stairwell. The stone core punched through the wall, drawing its flames after it. Rubble showered the burning street. Bruised, half-deafened, Gruntle scrambled free of the stairwell. Screams sounded from within the Alden camp. Smoke was billowing from the hole. Damned things are fire traps, Gruntle thought. He turned as the door at the bottom of the stairwell banged open. Buke appeared, dragging an unconscious woman into the clear. How bad? Gruntle shouted. Buke glanced up. Are you still here? We're fine. Fire's almost out. Get out of here. Go run and hide or something. Good idea, he growled. Smoke cloaked the sky, rising in black columns from the entire east side of Kapustan, spreading a pall as the wind carried it westward. Flames were visible in the Daru quarter, among the temples and tenements. Judging that the area safest from the burning missiles would be close to the walls, Gruntle set off east down the street. It's only coincidence that Stonny's ahead, at Port Road Gate. She made her choices. It ain't our fight, damn it. If I'd wanted to be a soldier, I'd have joined some hood-damned army. Abyss take them all. Another wave from the distant catapults clawed paths through the smoke. He picked up his pace, but the balls of fire were already past him, descending into the city's heart and landing with a staccato drum roll. They keep that up, and I'm liable to get mad. Figures ran through the smoke ahead. The sound of clashing weapons was louder, susurrating like waves flaying a pebble beach. Fine. I'll just find the gate and pull the lass out. Won't take long. Who knows? I'll beat her unconscious if she objects. We're going to find a way out of here, and that's that. He approached the back of the row of market stalls facing inside Port Street. The alleys between the ramshackle stalls were narrow and knee-deep in refuse. The street beyond was invisible behind a wall of smoke. Kicking his way through the rubbish, Gruntle arrived at the street. The gate was to his left, barely visible. The massive doors were shattered, the passageway and threshold heaped with bodies. The block towers flanking the aperture, their blackened sides bearing white scars made by glancing arrows, quarrels and ballista bolts, were both issuing smoke from their arrow slits. Screams and the clash of swords echoed from within them. Along the wall platforms to either side, soldiers in the garb of the grey swords were pushing their way into the top floors of the block towers. Thumping boots approached from Gruntle's right. A half-dozen grey sword squads emerged from the smoke, the front two ranks with swords and shields, the rear two with cocked crossbows. They crossed in front of the caravan captain and took position behind the pile of bodies at the gateway. A wayward wind swept the smoke from the street's length to Gruntle's right, revealing more bodies. Capenthal, Lestari, and Panion Bataclites, continuing down the street to a barricaded intersection sixty paces distant, where there was yet another mound of slain soldiers. Gruntle jogged towards the troop of greyswords. Seeing no obvious officer, he elected the crossbow woman nearest him. What's the situation here, soldier? She glanced at him her face a flat, expressionless mask covered in soot, and was surprised to realise she was Capan. We're clearing out the towers up top. The sortie should be back soon. We'll let them through, then hold the gateway. He stared at her. Sortie? Gods, they've lost their minds. Hold, you said. He glanced at the arched passage. For how long? She shrugged. Sappers are on their way with work crews. There'll be a new gate in a bell or two. How many breaches? What's been lost? I wouldn't know, citizen. Cease your chatter over there, a male voice called out, and get that civilian out of here. 
Movement ahead, sir! Another soldier shouted. Crossbows were readied over the shoulders of the crouching swordsman. Someone called from outside the passageway. Lestari troop! Hold your fire! We're coming in! There was no relaxing evident among the grey swords. A moment later, the first elements of the sortie trundled into view. Cut and battered and bearing wounded, the heavily armoured foot soldiers began shouting for the grey swords to clear a path. The waiting squads split to form a corridor. Every Lestari among the first thirty who passed through was encumbered by a wounded comrade. From beyond the gateway, the sound of fighting drew Gruntle's attention. It was getting closer. There was a rear guard protecting those bearing the wounded, and the pressure on them was building. Counterattack! Someone bellowed. Scalandi skirmishers! A horn moaned from high atop the wall to the right of the south side block tower. The roar was growing from the killing field beyond the gateway. The cobbles beneath Gruntle's boots trembled. Scalandi, Gruntle thought. They engage in legions of no less than five thousand. Ranks of grey swords were assembling further down inside Port Street. Swordsmen, crossbowmen, and Capenthal archers forming a fallback line. An even larger company was gathering beyond them, along with ballisti, trebuchet, and hurlers, the latter with their buckets of scalding gravel steaming like cauldrons. The rearguard stumbled into the passage. Javelins sliced among them, glancing off armor and shield, only one finding its mark, sending a soldier wheeling with the barbed shaft through his neck. The first of the Panion Scalandi appeared, lithe, leather-shirted and leather-helmed, wielding spears and scavenged swords, a few with wicker shields, pushing against the yielding line of Lestari heavy infantry, dying one after another. Yet still more came on, voicing a keening war cry. Break! Break! The bellowed command had an instant effect, as the Lestari rearguard suddenly disengaged, spun round, and bolted down the corridor, leaving their fallen behind, to be claimed by the Scalandi, dragged back, vanishing from sight. Then the skirmishers boiled down the passageway. The first line of grey swords reformed in the wake of the Lestari. Crossbows snapped. Scores of Scalandi fell, their writhing bodies fouling the efforts of those behind them. Gruntle watched as the grey swords calmly reloaded. A few from the front line of skirmishers reached the mercenary swordsmen and were summarily cut down. A second wave, clawing past their fallen kin, surged towards the line. They withered beneath another flight of quarrels. The passageway was filling with bodies. The next mob of Scalandi to appear were unarmed. Whilst the grey swords loaded their crossbows once more, the skirmishers began dragging their dead and dying kin back through the passageway. The door to the left side block tower slammed open, startling Gruntle. He spun, hands reaching for his gadrobi cutlasses, to see a half dozen Kappenthal stumbling into view, coughing. Blood smeared. Among them, Stony Manakis. Her rapier was snapped a hand's length down from the tip. The rest of the sword, down to and including the bell hilt and its projecting quillens, was thick with human gore, as was her gloved hand and vambraced forearm. Something slick and ropey hung skewered on the thin blade of the main gauche in her other hand, dripping brown sludge. Her expensive leather armor was in tatters, one crossing slash, having penetrated deep enough to cut through the padded shirt underneath. Leather and shirt had fallen away to reveal her right breast, the soft white skin bearing bruises left behind by someone's hand. She did not see him at first. Her gaze was fixed on the gateway, where the last of the corpses had been cleared, and yet another wave of Scalandi was pouring through. The front ranks fell to the quarrels as before, but the surviving attackers rushed on, a frenzied, shrieking mob. The four-deep line of grey swords split once more, wheeled and ran, each half sprinting for the nearest alley to either side of Port Street, where Capenthal archers stood, waiting for a cleared line of sight on the Scalandi pursuers. Stony barked a command to her few comrades, and the small troop backed away, parallel to the wall. She then saw Gruntle, their eyes locked. Get over here, you ox! she hissed. Gruntle jogged up to them. Hood's balls, woman. What, what do you think? 
They boiled over us, through the gate, up the towers, over the damned walls. Her head snapped back, as if she had just taken an invisible blow. A flat calm settled over her eyes. It was room by room, one on one. A seer domain found me. Another jolt ran through her. But the bastard left me alive. So I hunted him down. Come on, let's move. She snapped her mangosh back at Gruntle as they hurried on, spraying his chest and face with bile and watery shit. I carved him inside out, and damn if he didn't beg, she spat. Didn't work for me. Why should it have for him? What a fool. A pathetic whimpering. Hurrying in her wake, it was a moment before Gruntle understood what she was saying. Oh, Stonny, Gruntle thought. Her step slowed suddenly her face turning white. She twisted round, met his eyes with a look of horror. This was supposed to be a fight, a war. That bastard! She leaned against the wall. Gods! The others continued on, too dazed to notice, or perhaps too numb to care. Gruntle moved to her side. Carved him from the inside out, did you? He asked softly, not daring to reach out and touch her. Stoney nodded, her eyes squeezed shut, her breath coming in harsh, pained gasps. Did you save any of him for me, lass? She shook her head. That's too bad. Then again, one seer domain's as good as another. Stoney stepped forward, pressing her face into his shoulder. He wrapped his arms around her. Let's get out of this fight, lass, he murmured. I got a clean room with a basin in it and a stove and a jug of water. A room, close enough to the north wall for it to be safe. It's at the end of a hallway, only one way in. I'll stand outside the door, Stoney, for as long as you need. No one gets past. That's a promise. He felt her nod. He reached down to lift her up. I can walk. But do you want to, lass? That's the question. After a long moment, she shook her head. Gruntle lifted her easily. Nap, if you've a mind to, he said. You're safe enough. He set off, skirting the wall, the woman curling up in his arms, her face pressed hard against his tunic, the rough cloth growing wetter there. Behind them, the Scalandi were dying by the hundreds, the grey swords and Capenthal delivering dread slaughter. He wanted to be there with them, in the front line, taking life after life. One seer de min was not enough. A thousand would not be enough. Not now, he thought. He felt himself grow cold, as if the blood within him was now something else, flowing a bitter course along his veins, reaching out to fill his muscles with a strange, unyielding strength. He had never before felt such a thing, but he was beyond thinking about it. There were no words for this. Nor, he would soon discover, were there words to describe what he would become, what he would do? The slaughter of the Kachain Chamala by the Krontalani mass and the undead eye had thrown the Septarch and his forces into disarray, as Brucalian had predicted. The confusion and the immobility it engendered had added days to shield Anvil Itkovian's preparations for the siege to come. But now, the time for preparing had ended and Itkovian was left with the command of the city's defences. There would be no Talan I mass, no Talan I to come to their rescue, and no relieving army to arrive with the last grain of the hourglass, he thought. Kapustan was on its own. And so it shall be, fear, anguish, and despair. From his position atop the highest tower on the barracks wall, after Destrin Carnadus had left and the stream of messengers began its frenzied flow, he had watched the first concerted movement of enemy troops to the east and southeast, the rumbling appearance of siege weapons. Becklites and the more heavily armoured Bataclites marshalling opposite Port Gate, with a mass of Scalandi behind and to either side of them. Knots of Siodomian shock troops, scurrying bands of Desandi, sappers, positioning still more siege weapons. And waiting in enormous, sprawling encampments along the river and the coast, 
the seething mass of the Teniskauri. He had watched the assault on the outside fortification of the Gidrath's East Watch Redoubt, already isolated and surrounded by the enemy, had seen the narrow door battered down, the Becklights pushing into the passageway, three steps, two steps, one, then a standstill, and moments later, a step back, then another, bodies being pulled clear. Still more bodies. The Gidrath, the elite guards of the Mask Council, had revealed their discipline and determination. They expelled the intruders, raised yet another barricade in place of the door. The Becklights outside had milled for a time, then they renewed their assault. The battle continued through the afternoon, yet each time that Hidkovian pulled his attention away from other events, he saw that the Gidrath still held, taking enemy lives by the score. Twisting that thorn in the Septarch's midst, he thought. Finally, near dusk, siege weapons were wheeled about. Huge boulders were hurled against the fortress's walls. The pounding concussions continued as the last of the daylight fell away. Beyond this minor drama, the assault against the city's walls had begun on all sides. The north attack proved a feint, poorly executed and so quickly recognized as insignificant. Messengers relayed to the shield anvil that a similar cursory engagement was underway at the west wall. The true assaults were delivered upon the south and east walls, concentrated at the gates. Itkovian, positioned directly between them, was able to directly oversee the defence on both sides. He was visible to the enemy, and more than one missile had been fired in his direction, only a few coming close. This was the first day. Range and accuracy would improve in the days to come. Before long, he might have to yield his vantage point. In the meantime, he would let his presence mock the attackers. As the Becklights and the Batakalites rushed the walls, the ladder bearing to Sandy among them, Itkovian gave the command for counterfire from the walls and block towers. The ensuing slaughter was horrific. The attackers had not bothered with turtles or other forms of cover, and so died in appalling droves. Yet such were their numbers that the gates were reached, battering rams deployed, and breaches affected. The Panions, however, after pushing through the passageways, found themselves in open concourses that became killing fields as greyswords and Cappenthal archers launched a withering crossfire from behind barricades blocking side streets, intersections, and alley mouths. The shield anvil strategy of layered defense was proving murderously efficient. Subsequent counterattacks had been so effective as to permit sorties beyond the gates, a vicious pursuit of fleeing panions. And this day at least... None of the companies it sent out had gone too far. Discipline had held among the Capenthal, the Lestari, and the Coralesian companies. The first day was over, and it belonged to Capustan's defenders. Itkovian stood on trembling legs, the coastal breeze building to dry the sweat from his face, sending cool tendrils through the half visor's grill to brush his smoke-reddened eyes. As darkness closed around him, he listened to the rocks pounding the East Watch Redoubt and turned for the first time in hours to view the city. Entire blocks were aflame, the fires reaching into the night sky, lighting the underbelly of a turgid canopy of solid smoke. I knew what I would see, he thought. Why then does it shock me? Drive the blood from my veins? Suddenly weak, he leaned against the merlon behind him, one hand pressed against the rough stone. A voice spoke from the shadows of the tower's doorway. You need rest, sir. Itkovian closed his eyes. Destriant, you speak the truth. But there will be no rest, Carnadas resumed. The other half of the attacking force is assembling. We can expect assaults through the night. I know, sir. Prukalian, I, it must be done. Come forward, then. Such efforts are increasingly difficult, Carnadus murmured as he strode up to stand before the shield anvil. He laid a hand against Itkovian's chest. The illness of the Warrens threatens me, he continued. Soon it will be all I can do to fend against it. 
the weariness drained from the shield anvil, vigor returning to his limbs. He sighed. I thank you, sir. The mortal sword has just been called to the thrall to give account of the first day's battle. And no, we were not fortunate enough to hear of the thrall's destruction beneath a few hundred balls of fire. It stands intact. However, given those that it now houses, we would no longer wish such a fiery end. Itkovian pulled his gaze from the streets, studied the Destrian's red-lit face. Your meaning, sir? The Bargast, Heaton and Kafal have taken up residence in the main hall. Ah, I see. Before he left, Brukalian asked me to inquire of your efforts to discover the means by which the bones of the founding spirits will be spared the coming conflagration. I have failed, sir. Nor does it seem likely that I will have an opportunity to renew my efforts in that direction. That is understandable, sir. I will convey to the mortal sword your words, if not your obvious relief. Thank you. The Destrian strode to look out upon the east killing field. Gods below, do the Gidrath still hold the redoubt? Uncertain, Itkovian murmured as he joined the man. At the very least, the bombardment has not ceased. There may be little but rubble there now. It's too dark to make out, but I believe I heard a wall collapse half a bell ago. The legions are marshalling once more, Shield Anvil. I need more messengers, sir. My last troop... Aye, exhausted, Carnadus said. I shall take my leave and do as you ask, sir. Itkovian listened to the man make his way down the ladder, but held his gaze on the enemy positions to the east and south. Hooded lanterns flashed here and there among what appeared to be troops arrayed in squares, the figures jostling and shifting behind wicker shields. Smaller companies of Scalandi skirmishers emerged, moving cautiously forward. Bootsteps behind the shield anvil announced the arrival of the messengers. Without turning, Itkovian said, Inform the captains of the archers and trebuchets that the Panians are about to renew their assault. Soldiers to the walls and battlements, Gate companies assembled, full complement, including sappers. A score of fiery balls rose skyward from behind the massed ranks of the panions. The missiles arced, their sizzling roar audible as they passed high over Itkovian's head. Explosions lit the city, shook the bronze-sheathed floorboards beneath his feet. The shield anvil faced his cadre of messengers. Go! Carnadus rode his horse at a canter across Turel Concourse. The huge arch, fifty paces to his left, had just taken a hit on one corner of the pedestal, spraying broken masonry and burning pitch onto the cobbles and onto the rooftops of the scatter of tenements beside it. Flames billowed, and the destrient saw figures pouring from the building. Somewhere to the north, at the very edge of the temple district, another tenement block was engulfed in fire. He reached the far side of the concourse, not slackening his mount's pace as he rode up Shadow Street, the Temple of Shadow on his left, the Temple of the Queen of Dreams on his right, then angled his horse again to the left as they reached Daru Spear, the district's main avenue. Ahead loomed the dark stones of the thrall, the ancient keep towering over the lower structures of the Daru tenements. Three squads of Gidrath commanded the gate, fully armoured and with weapons drawn. Recognizing the destriant, they waved him through. He dismounted in the courtyard, leaving his horse to a stabler, then made his way to the great hall, where he knew he would find Brucalian. As he strode down the main aisle towards the double doors, he saw that another man was ahead. Robed, hooded, he was without the usual escort provided strangers to the thrall, yet he approached the entrance with a graceful assurance. Carnadas wondered how he had managed to get past the Gidrath. Then his eyes widened as the stranger gestured with one hand, and the huge door swung open before him. Voices raised in argument drifted out from the great hall, quickly falling silent as the stranger entered. Carnadas increased his pace and arrived in time to catch the end of a wrath priest's expostulation. This instant! The destrian slipped through the entrance in the stranger's wake. 
he saw the mortal sword standing near the center millstone, now turning to regard the newcomer. The Bargast, Heaton and Kafal, were sitting on their rug a few paces to Brucalian's right. The priests and priestesses of the Mass Council were one and all leaning forward in their seats, their masks conveying caricatures of extreme displeasure, with the exception of Rath Hood, who was standing, the wooden skull visage of his mask arched with outrage. The stranger, hands clasped within the folds of his dun-coloured robe sleeves, seemed unperturbed by the hostile welcome. From where the destrian stood, he could not see the man's face, but he saw the hood shift as the stranger scanned the masked assembly. "'Will you ignore my command?' Rathwood asked, visibly bridling his tone. The priest glared about. Where are Gidrath? Why in the gods' names haven't they heard our summons? Alas, the stranger murmured in Daru, they have, for the moment, heeded the call of their dreams. Thus we avoid any unnecessary interruptions. The man turned to Brucalian, allowing Carnadas, who now stood at the mortal sword's side, to see his face for the first time. Round, strangely unlined, unmemorable barring the expression of calm equanimity. Ah, the merchant retrieved by Itkovian, Carnadas thought. His name? Karuli. The man's pale eyes fixed on Brucalian. My apologies to the commander of the Grey Swords, but I fear I must make address to the Mask Council. If you would be so kind as to temporarily yield the floor. The mortal sword tilted his head. By all means, sir. We do not agree to this, Wrath Shadow Throne hissed. The stranger's eyes hardened as he swung his attention on the priest. You, unfortunately, have no choice. I look upon you all and find the representation woefully inadequate. Carnadus choked back a laugh and recovered in time to meet Brucalian's raised eyebrow with an expression of innocent inquiry. By the abyss, Rathburn said, who are you to make such judgment? I need make no claim as to my true name, priestess, only to the title I now demand. Title? Rathgaral. I have come to take my place among the Mask Council and to tell her you this. There is one among you who will betray us all. She sat on the flatboard bed, long hair in disarray, hanging down her face. Gruntle reached out and slowly combed the tresses back. Stony's sigh was ragged. This is stupid. Things happen. There's no rules to battle. I was an idiot trying to take on a seadumin with naught but a rapier. He batted it aside with a laugh. She looked up. Don't stay with me, Gruntle. I can see what's there in your eyes. Go. She glanced around the room. I just need to get... to get cleaned up. I don't want you here. Not outside the door, either. If you took that position, Gruntle, you'd never leave it. Go. You're the best fighter I have ever seen. Kill some panions. Who'd take me? Kill them all. Are you sure? Her laugh was harsh. Don't even try. He grunted, began checking his armor's straps and fittings, adjusted the padding beneath, dropped the visor on his helm, loosened the heavy cutlasses in their scabbards. Stoney watched him in silence. Finally, he was ready. All right. Take your time, lass. There'll be plenty left whenever you're done here. Aye, there will. Gruntle faced the door. Do some damage. He nodded. I will. The Becklites and Scalandi reached the east wall in their thousands. In the face of withering arrow fire, ladders were raised. Figures swarmed upward, poured over the battlements. The east gate was taken yet again, the enemy surging down the passageway to spill out onto the square of New East Market. To the south, the city's main gate fell to a concerted barrage of catapult fire. A legion of Bataclites swept into Jalakan concourse. A well-aimed ball of burning pitch struck the Kappenthor West Barracks. The building rose in a conflagration that lit the entire city a lurid red. 
shock troops of Uderman and Sia Domin breached Northgate and entered the nearest Daru streets after destroying Nildar camp and slaying everyone within it. The enemy was within the city on every side. The battle, it Covian concluded, was not going well. With each report that a messenger delivered, the shield anvil issued commands in a soft, calm voice. Fourth wing to the ninth barricade, between east inside and Nerok towers. Resupply the Kappenthal in the two towers. Seventh wing to west inside tower and wall. I need a report on the status of Jabbar Tower. There were 500 Kappenthal in the west barracks. Likely they've been routed. Fifth and third mains into the streets around Tular Concourse to rally the Kappenthal. First, seven and sixth mains double time to North Temple District. Block and strike until North Gate is retaken. Fourth, second and eighth mains to New East Market. Once the East Gate is recovered, I want wings one, three and five to sortie. Their rally point is the East Watch Redoubt. I want the siege engines assailing it neutralized, then any Gidrath survivors retrieved. Have the Trimaster report to me. In between commands and the coming and going of messengers, Itkovian watched the engagement at New East Market, what he could see of it in the glare of fires through seething clouds of smoke. The Scalandi were pushing hard to break the barricades, preventing them from reaching the Prince's palace. Boulders had been hammering the palace's outer walls incessantly, all to no effect. The thin, glistening stone walls did not so much as tremble. Burning pitch roared itself to extinction, yet achieved nothing more than black stains marring the unknown stone's surface. The palace would have to be taken the hard way, step by step. Every room, every level, and the panions were eager to begin the task. The Greystored Trimaster, commanding the first, third, and fifth wings, arrived on the parapet. He was one of the Shield Anvil's oldest officers, lean and tall, grey-bearded, to hide countless scars. My assignment has been conveyed to me, Shield Anvil. So why have I sent for you? Edkovian thought. I see the question in your eyes, sir. You do not require any stirring words to cleave you to what could be a suicidal mission. It will be unexpected, Edkovian said. The man's eyes narrowed. Then he nodded. Aisha, it will. With all the breaches, the enemy's front lines have lost their cohesion. Chaos claims all this night. We shall destroy the siege engines as ordered. We shall retrieve the survivors in the redoubt. Aye, old friend, Itkovian thought. I am the one who needs stirring words. Keep your eyes open, sir. I would know the positioning of the Panion forces to the rear, specifically the Teniskari. Understood, sir. A messenger arrived, stumbling as he cleared the ladder. Shield Anvil, she gasped. Your report, sir, Edkovian said. From the Trimaster of the 1st, 7th and 6th Main, sir. Northgate, he thought. He looked to the north. Most of the Daru tenements there were burning. Proceed. The Trimaster reports that he has encountered the shock troops of Erdemann and Sia Domin. They're all dead, sir. Dead? The young woman nodded, paused to wipe ash-smeared sweat from her brow. Her helm, Itkovian noted, was too large. A citizen rallied the remnants of the Kappenthal Guard, as well as other civilians and some caravan guards. Sir, so they engaged the Erdemann and Sierdemann in a succession of street battles and drove them back. The Trimaster now controls Northgate, to which his company of sappers are effecting repairs. And this impromptu militia and its commander? Only a few wounded were there to greet the Trimaster, sir. The, uh, militia has set off westward, in pursuit of an Erdemann company that sought to storm Lektar House. Messenger, send the first wing to their aid. Upon delivering my command, take some rest, sir. Yes, Shield Anvil. That is not the helmet you were issued with, is it, sir? Abashed, she shook her head. I uh, lost it, Shield Anvil. Have the quartermaster find you one that fits. Yes, sir. Go. The two veterans watched the young woman depart. Careless, the trimaster murmured, losing her helm. Indeed. 
Clever, finding another one. The shield anvil smiled. I shall take my leave now, sir. Fainer, go with you, Trimaster. Cardenas drew a long, quiet breath, the hairs of his neck rising at the sudden, heavy silence in the great hall. Betrayal? His eyes were drawn to one priest in particular. Rathgarol's words were fuel to suspicions the Destriant already had, and the bias led him to mistrust his own conclusions. He held his tongue, but his gaze remained fixed on Rathfainer. The boar mask was without expression, yet the man stood as if he had just taken a blow. The age of Krull, Rath Shadowthorn hissed, is long past. He has returned, the robed man replied a fact that should give every one of you a certain measure of relief. It is Kral's blood, after all, that has been poisoned. The battle now begun shall spare no one, including the gods whom you serve. If you doubt my words, take your inner journeys. Hear the truth from your gods. Aye, the words might well be reluctant, indeed resentful, but they will be spoken, nonetheless. Your suggestion, Wrath Queen of Dreams said, cannot be achieved in haste. I am amenable to reconvening, Wrath Kral said with a slight bow. Be warned, however, we have little time. You spoke of betrayal. Aye, Wrath Queen of Dreams, I did. You wound us with divisiveness. The robed man cocked his head. Those who know your own conscience to be clear, brothers and sisters, will thereby be united. The one who cannot make that claim will likely be dealt with by his God. His? Rathgrel shrugged. Brokarlian cleared his throat in the subsequent silence. With the leave of the Mask Council, I shall now depart. My shield anvil has need of me. Of course, Rathhood said. Indeed, from the sounds beyond the thrall, it would appear that the walls are breached and the enemy is within. And Hood stalks Capustan streets, Carnadas thought. Ambivalence sufficient to cool your tone. The mortal sword smiled. It was our expectation from the very beginning, Rathhood, that the walls and gates would be taken. Periodically. He swung to Carnadas. Join me, please. I require the latest information. The Destriant nodded. Eaton suddenly rose, eyes flashing as she glared at Rathkral. Sleeping man, is your god's offer true? Will he in truth aid us? He will. Which of you volunteers? The bargast woman, eyes wide, jerked her head towards her brother. The robed man smiled. Wrath Shadowthrone seemed to spit out his words. What now? What now? What now? Carnalis turned to study Kafal, was shocked to see the man still seated cross-legged, with his head bowed in slumber. To all here, Rathkral said in a low voice, awaken him not, if you value your lives. An even dozen Kappenthal remained of the sixty-odd followers Gruntle had led westward from Northgate, and only one Lestari guardsman, a short-legged, long-armed sergeant who had stepped into the role of second-in-command without a word. Lestari House was one of the few well-fortified private residences in Kapustan, the home of Kalandal, a merchant family with links to the council in Darujistan, as well as the now-fallen noble house of the same name in Lestari itself. The solid stone structure abutted the north wall, and its flat roof had become a strong point and rallying position for the wall's defenders. At street level, the grand entrance consisted of a thick bronze door set in a stone frame, the hinges recessed. A broad pediment overhung the entrance, held up by twin marble columns, its ceiling crowded with the carved heads of demons, their mouths open and now dripping with the last of the boiling water that had gushed down on the screaming Scalandi who had been hammering on the door. Gruntle and his troop, still reeling from a savage clash with fifteen Erdemen that had seen most of the militia chopped to pieces, before Gruntle had personally cut down the last two panions, had come upon the Scalandi mob from behind. 
the engagement was swift and brutal. Only the Lestari sergeant revealed any mercy when he slit the throats of those Scalandi who had been badly scalded by the boiling water. The cessation of their shrieks brought sudden silence to the scene. Gruntle crouched beside a body and used its tunic to clean the blades of his cutlasses. The muscles of his arms and shoulders were leaden, trembling. The night's breeze had strengthened, smelling of salt, sweeping the smoke inland. Enough fire still raged on all sides to drive back the darkness. Look at that, will you? The caravan captain glanced over at the Lestari sergeant, then followed the man's gaze. The thrall loomed to the southeast, only a few streets away. The entire keep was faintly glowing. What do you figure? the grizzled soldier muttered. Sorcery of some kind, Gruntle thought. I'd guess that's ritual magic, the sergeant went on. Probably protective. Who knows? We could do with some of that ourselves. We cut to pieces, sir. I ain't got much left, and as for the rest... Eyeing the dozen battered, bleeding Kappenthal, crouched or kneeling, or leaning against the house's walls, he shook his head. They're done for. Sounds of fighting neared from the southwest. The scraping of armor from the roof of Lestari House drew Gruntle's attention. A half-dozen Kappenthal regulars were looking down on them. Nicely done, whoever you all are, one shouted. What can you see up there? The sergeant called up. We've retaken the north gate. Grey swords, damn near a thousand of them. The panions are reeling. Grey swords? The Lestari muttered under his breath. He glared across at Gruntle. We was the ones who retook that gate. But we're not holding it, are we? Gruntle growled, straightening. He faced his meagre troop. Look alive, you spineless cappens. We ain't finished. Dull, disbelieving eyes fixed on him. Sounds like the West Gate's down. Sounds like our defenders are backpedalling, meaning they've lost their officers, or their officers they ain't worth shit. Sergeant, you're now lieutenant. The rest of you, you're sergeants. We got some scared soldiers to rally. Let's move, double time. Don't want you all stiffening up. Glaring at them, Gruntle rolled his shoulders, clashed his cutlasses. Follow me. He jogged down the street towards Westgate. After a moment, the others fell in step. Two bells before dawn. To the north and to the west, the roar of battle was diminishing. Itkovian's counterattacks had reclaimed the gates and walls there. The fight was out of the attackers on those sides, for the rest of this night at least. Brukalian had returned from the thrall, Carnadas in tow, a bell earlier. The mortal sword had assembled the six hundred recruits the shield anvil had been holding in reserve, along with two mains and two wings, and set off towards the Jalakan concourse, where it was rumoured over a thousand Beklites had pushed their way in, threatening to overwhelm the inner defences. The situation around the West Gate was even more dire. Three of Itkovin's messengers had not returned after being sent that way. The West Barracks was a massive fist of raging fire, revealing in lurid flashes the rubble that was the West Gate itself. This breach should it prove able to reach through to the west side of Jalakan Concourse, could see the fall of half the city. The shield anvil paced with frustration. He was out of reserve forces. For a while there, it looked as if the Kappenthal and Greysword detachments assigned to the Westgate had simply ceased to exist, the wound gushing into a flood. Then, inexplicably, resolve had stiffened. The flood had encountered a human wall, and though it rose, it had yet to pour over. The fate of Kapustan lay with those defenders now, and Itkovian could only watch, as all hung in the balance. Carnadas was below, in the barracks compound. Exhausting his Danul Warren, struggling against whatever sorcerous infection plagued it, yet still managing to affect healing of wounded greyswords. Something had happened in the thrall, was happening even now, the entire keep was glowing, a colourless penumbra. Itkovian wanted to ask the Destriant about it, but the opportunity had yet to arise. Boots on the ladder. The shield anvil swung about. The messenger who emerged was horribly burned along one side of his face, 
the red blistered skin covering his jaw and upward, forming a ridge beneath the rim on his helm. His eye on that side was puckered, wrinkled, and dark as a raisin. He climbed clear of the ladder, and had Covian saw Carnadus behind him. The Destrian spoke first, halfway out of the hatch. He insisted he give his report to you first, sir. I can do nothing for the eye, but the pain. In a moment, Itkovian snapped. Messenger, make your report. Apologies, the young man gasped, for taking so long. The shield anvil's eyes widened. You humbled me, sir. It has been a bell and more since I sent you to the West Gate. The Panions had reached through to Talar camp, shield anvil. Senar camp had fallen, its inhabitants slaughtered. Everyone. Children. Sir, I am sorry, but the horror remains with me. Go on. Jaber Tower was surrounded, its defenders besieged. Such was the situation upon my arrival, sir. Our soldiers were scattered, fighting in clumps, many of them surrounded. We were being cut down everywhere I looked. He paused, drew a ragged breath, then continued. Such was the situation upon my arrival. As I prepared to return to you with said news, I was absconded. You were what? Apologies, sir. I can think of no other word. A foreigner appeared, with but half a score of Kapan followers, a militia of sorts, sir, and a Lestari sergeant. The man took charge of everyone, myself included. Shield Anvil, I argued. Clearly this man was persuasive. Resume your tale, sir. The foreigner had his own soldiers break down the door into Tular camp. He demanded that its inhabitants come out and fight for their children. And he convinced them? Sir, he held in his arms what was left of a child from Senar camp. The enemy, sir, the Panions. Someone had begun to eat that child. Carnadus moved up behind the young man, hands settling on his shoulders. He convinced them, Itkovian said. The messenger nodded. The foreigner, he then... He then took what was left of the child's tunic and has made of it a standard. I saw it myself. Sir, I ceased arguing then. I'm sorry. I understand you, sir. There was no shortage of weapons. The Tular Kapenthal armed themselves. Four, five hundred came out, men and women. The foreigner had sent out his own followers, and they began returning. With them, surviving bands of Kapenthal soldiery, a few Gidrath, Corolesian, and Greysword, sir. The Trimaster had been killed, you see. The foreigner rallied them, Ekovian cut in. Then what? We marched to the relief of J. Bartow, sir. Shield Anvil. Behind that horrible banner, we delivered slaughter. The condition of the tower? Ruin, sir, alas. There were but twenty survivors among the Kalpenthal defending it. They are now with the foreigner. I, uh, I returned to my responsibilities then, sir, and was given leave to report to you. Generous of this stranger. What was the disposition of this militia at that time? They were about to sortie through the rubble of West Gate, sir. What? A Becklite company was coming up to reinforce the attackers inside the city. But those attackers were all dead. The foreigner planned on surprising them with that fact. Twin tusks. Who is this man? I know not his name, sir. He wields two cutlasses. Fights like a... Like a boar, sir, with those two cutlasses. Itkovian stared at the young man for a long moment, seeing the pain diminishing as the destriant continued gripping his shoulders, seeing the blisters shrink, the welt fading, new skin closing around the ruined eye. A shield anvil swung about in a clank of armor, faced west. The fire of the west barracks reached its crimson light only so far. Beyond, darkness ruled. He shifted his attention to the Jalakan concourse. No further breaches were evident, as far as he could determine. The mortal sword had matters well in hand, as it Covian knew would be the case. Less than a bell, Carnadus murmured, before dawn. Shield anvil, 
The city holds? Itkovian nodded. More boots on the ladder. They all turned as another messenger arrived. Shield Anvil, from the third sortie to Eastwatch Redoubt. The surviving Gidrath have been recovered, sir. Movement to the southeast was discerned. The Trimaster sent a scout. Shield Anvil, the Teneskari are on the move. Itkovian nodded. They will arrive with the dawn, he thought. Three hundred thousand, maybe more. Destriant, open the tunnels. Begin with the inner camp, sir. Every citizen below. Take charge of the barracks, mains and wings, and whoever else you come across to affect swift directions and control of the entranceways. Carnadas's lined face twisted into a wry smile. Shield Anvil, it is my duty to remind you that the Mars Council has yet to approve the construction of said tunnels. Itkovian nodded again. Fortunately for the people of Kapustan, we proceeded without awaiting that approval. Then he frowned. It seems the Mars Council has found its own means of self-defense. Not them, sir. Heaton and Kafal. And a new priest, indeed, the very merchant whom you rescued out on the plain. The shield anvil slowly blinked. Did he not have a caravan guard? A large man with a pair of cutlasses belted to his hips? Cutlasses, Itkovian thought, more like Fainer's own tusks. The destriant hissed. I believe you are right, sir. In fact, only yesterday... I spared a moment to heal him. He was wounded. Hung over, shield anvil. Very. I see. Carry on, sir. Itkovin looked to his two messengers. Word must be sent to the mortal sword, and to this foreigner. The Becklight's wicker shield exploded from the man's arm to Gruntle's backhand swing. The notched, gore-smeared cutlass in the caravan guard's other hand chopped straight down, through helm, then skull. Brain and blood sprayed down over his gauntlet. The backlight fell to one side, limbs jerking. Gruntle spun, whipping the ragged mess from his blade. A dozen paces behind him, looming above the feral ranks of his followers, was the child's standard, a torn, brightly dyed yellow tunic, now splashed with a red that was drying to deep magenta. The backlight company had been crushed. Gruntle's victim had been the last. The caravan captain and his militia were forty paces outside what was left of the West Gate, on the wide main avenue of what had been a shantytown. The structures were gone, their wooden walls and slate roofs dismantled and taken away. Patches of stained earthen floors and the scatter of broken pottery were all that remained. Two hundred paces further west ran the pickets of the besiegers, swarming in the dawn's growing light. Gruntle could see half a thousand Pataklites marshalling along its edge, flanked by companies of Erdemann and Betralid light cavalry. Beyond them, a vast veil of dust was rising, lit gold by the slanting sun. The lieutenant had dropped to one knee beside Gruntle, struggling to regain control of his breathing. <sighs> Time. Time's come to withdraw, sir. Scowling, the caravan captain swung to survey his militia. Fifty, sixty still standing. What did I start with last night? About the same. Is that right? Gods, can that be right? Where are our sergeants? They're there, most of them anyway. You want me to call them forward, sir? No, yes, I want to see their faces. I can't remember their faces. Have them assemble the squads. Sir, if that cavalry rushes us... They won't. They're masking. Masking what? Tennis gallery. Why throw more veteran soldiers at us, only to see them killed? Those bastards need a rest in any case. No, it's time for the starving horde. Beru Fend, the lieutenant whispered. Don't worry, Gruntle replied. They die easy. We need to rest. We're sliced to pieces, sir. I'm too old for a suicide stand. Then what in Hood's name are you doing in Kapustan? 
Never mind. Let's see the squads. I want armor stripped from these bodies. Leathers only, and helms and gauntlets. I want my sixty to look like soldiers. Sir, then we withdraw. Understood. Best be quick about it, too. Gruntle led his battered company back towards Capustan. There was activity amidst the ruin of Westgate. The plain grey cloaks of the grey swords dominated the crowd, though others, masons and ragtag crews of labourers, were present as well. The frenzied activity slowed as heads turned. Conversations fell away. Gruntle's scowl deepened. He hated undue attention. What are we? Ghosts? he thought. Eyes were pulled to the child's standard. A figure strode forward to meet them, an officer of the mercenaries. Welcome back, the woman said with a grave nod. Her face was caked with dust, runnels of sweat tracking down from under her helm. We've got some weaponsmiths set up outside Tular camp. I imagine your tusks need sharpening. Cutlasses. As you say, sir. The shield anvil. No. We all would know your name. But Gruntle had already stepped past her. Sharpeners. Good idea. Lieutenant, you think we all need to get our tusks sharpened? The grey swords officer spun round. Sir, the reference is not to be taken lightly. He continued on. Over his shoulder he said, Fine, let's call them tiger claws, why don't we? Looks to me you've got a gate to rebuild. Best get to it, lass. Them Tenascari want breakfast, and we're it. He heard her hiss in what might have been angry frustration. Moments later, the workers resumed their efforts. The weaponsmiths had set up their grindstone wheels in the street. Beyond them, in the direction of the Jalakan concourse, the sounds of battle continued. Gruntle waved his soldiers forward. Line up, all of you. I want those blades so sharp you can shave with them. The lieutenant snorted. Most of your troops women, sir. Whatever. A rider was driving his horse hard down the street. He reined in with a clatter of hooves, dismounted, and paused to adjust his armoured gauntlets before striding to Gruntle. Are you Karuli's caravan, Captain? he asked, face hidden behind a full-visored helm. Was. What do you want, mercenary? Compliments from the shield anvil, sir. The voice was hard, deep. The Teniscauri are massing. I know. It is the shield anvil's belief that their main assault will be from the east, for it is there that the first child of the Dead Seed had assembled his vanguard. Fine. What of it? The messenger was silent for a moment. Then he continued. Sir, Kapustan's citizens are being removed. Removed where? The Grey Swords have constructed tunnels beneath the city, sir. Below are amassed sufficient supplies to support 20,000 citizens. For how long? Two weeks, perhaps three. The tunnels are extensive. In many cases, old empty barrows were opened as well, as storage repositories. There were more of those than anyone had anticipated. The entranceways are well hidden and defensible. Two weeks? Pointless, Gruntle thought. Well... That takes care of the non-combatants. What about us fighters? The messenger's eyes grew veiled between the black iron bars of the visor. We fight, street by street, building by building. Room by room, sir. The shield anvil inquires of you. Which section of the city do you wish to assume? And is there anything you require? Arrows, food. We've no archers, but food and watered wine, aye. Which section? Gruntle surveyed his troop. More like which building? There's a tenement just off Old Daru Street, the one with the Blackstone Foundations. We'll start at Northgate, then fall back to there. Very good. Supplies will be delivered to that tenement house, sir. Oh, there's a woman in one of the rooms on the upper floor. If your evacuation of citizens involved a house-by-house -house search... The evacuation was voluntary, sir. She wouldn't have agreed to it. Then she remains where she is. Gruntle nodded. The lieutenant came to the captain's side. Your cutlasses. Time to hone your tiger claws, sir. 
Aye. Turning away, Gruntel did not notice the messenger's head jerk back at the Lestari lieutenant's words. Through the dark cage of his visor, Shield Anvil Itkovian studied the hulking caravan captain who now strode towards a swordsmith, the short-legged Lestari trailing a step behind. The bloodstained cutlasses were out, the wide, notched, tip-heavy blades the color of smoky flames. He had come to meet this man for himself, to take his fullest measure, and fashion a face to accompany the man's extraordinary talents. Itkovian already regretted the decision. He muttered a soft, lengthy curse at his own impetuosity. Fights like a boar. Gods now. This man is a big plains hunting cat. He has bulk, aye, but it passes unnoticed behind a deadly grace. Fainer save us all. The tiger of summer's ghost walks in this man's shadow. Returning to his horse, Itkovian drew himself up into the saddle. He gathered the reins. Swinging his mount round, he tilted his head back and stared at the morning sun. The truth of this has burst like fire in my heart. On this, our last day, I have met this unnamed man, this servant of Treach, the tiger of summer. Treach ascending. And Fena? The brutal boar whose savage cunning rides my soul? What of my lord? Fena descending. On this, our last day. A susurrating roar rose in the distance from all sides. The tennis cowry were on the move. Twin tusks guard us, Itkovian rasped, driving his heels into the horse's flanks. The animal surged forward, sparks raining as its hooves struck the cobbles. Grey-faced with exhaustion, Buke made his way towards the necromancer's estate. It was a large edifice commanding a long, low hill that looked too regular to be natural surrounded by a high wall with mock guard towers at the corners. A grand entrance faced onto Killsban Way, set back from the street itself with a ramped approach. The gate was a miniature version of the thralls, vertically raised and lowered by countersunk centre-hold millstones. A fireball had struck the gate, blasting it into ruin. The flames had raged for a time, blackening the stone frame and cracking it, but somehow the structure remained upright. As the old caravan guard limped his way up the ramp towards it, he was startled by the sudden exit of a tall, gaunt, black-robed man. Stumbling, half-hopping like a huge, ebon-winged vulture, the man spun round to glare at Buke. His face twisted. I am second only to Wrath Shadow Throne himself. Do you not know me? Do they not know me? I am Marble, also known as the Malefic. Feared among all the cowering citizens of Kapustan, a sorcerer of powers unimagined, yet they... He sputtered with fury. A boot to the backside, no less. I will have my revenge, this I swear. Ill-advised priest, Buke said, not unkindly. My employers are arrogant scam. That may be, but they're not ones to irritate, sir. Irritate? <laughs> When my master hears of this, 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 this insult delivered to his most valued servant, then, oh, shall the shadows flow. With a final snarl, the priest stamped down the walkway, black robe skirling dramatically in his wake. Buke paused for a long moment, watching until the man named Marble disappeared around a corner. The sound of fighting was on all sides, but getting no closer. Hours earlier, in the deep of the night, when Buke had been helping people from the camps and from Daru District's tenements make their way to the Grey Sword's places of mustering, from which they would be led to the hidden tunnel entrances. The Panions had reached all the way to the street Buke had just walked. Somehow, Kapustan's motley collection of defenders had managed to drive them back. Bodies from both sides littered Killsban Way. Buke pushed himself into motion once more, passing beneath the scorched lintel of the entrance, with a firm conviction that he would never again leave Beauchelaine and Corbel Brooch's estate. Even as his steps slowed to a sudden surge of self-preservation, he saw it was too late. Beauchelaine stood in the courtyard. Ah, my erstwhile employee. 
We'd wondered where you'd gone. Buke ducked his head. My apologies, sir. I delivered the tax exemption writ to the Daru Civic Authorities as requested. Excellent. And was our argument well received? The old guard winced. The event of siege, alas, sir, offers no relief from property taxes, master. The monies are due. Fortunately, with the evacuation, there is no one at Daru House to await their arrival. Yes, the evacuation. Tunnels. Very clever. We declined the offer, of course. Of course. Buke could no longer hold his gaze on the cobbles before him, and found his head turning, lifting slightly to take in the half-score Erdemann bodies lying bloodless, faces mottled black beneath their visors on all sides. A precipitous rush of these misguided soldiers, Beauchelaine murmured. Corbel was delighted, and makes preparations to recruit them. Recruit them, master? Oh, yes, sir. Recruit them. The necromancer cocked his head. Odd, dear Emancipor Rees uttered those very words, in an identical tone, not half a bell ago. Indeed, master. The two regarded each other for a brief span, then Beauchelaine stroked his beard and turned away. The tennis gallery are coming, did you know? Among them, children of the dead seed. Extraordinary, these children. A dying man's seed. Hmm. It's said that the eldest among them now commands the entire peasant horde. I look forward to meeting him. Master, um, how, I mean? Beauchelaine smiled. Corbel is most eager to conduct a thorough examination of this child named Anasta. What flavor is his biology? Even I wonder at this. The fallen Erdemen lurched, twitched as one, hands clawing towards dropped weapons, helmed heads lifting. Buke stared in horror. Ah, you now have guards to command, Buke. I suggest you have them position themselves at the entrance, and perhaps one to each of the four corner towers. Tireless defenders, the best kind, yes? Emancipor Reese, clutching his mangy cat tight against his chest, stumbled out from the main house. Beauchelaine and Buke watched as the old man rushed towards one of the now standing Erdemen. Reese came up to the hulking warrior, reached out and tugged frantically at the undead's chain collar and the jerkin beneath it. The old man's hand reached down beneath both layers. Down. Down. Emancipor started gibbering. He pulled his hand clear, staggered back. But, but... His lined pebble face swung to Beauchelaine. That, that man, Corbel, he has, he said, I saw. He has their hearts. He sewn them together, a bloody throbbing mass on the kitchen table. But... He spun and thumped the Erdemen on the chest. No wound! Beauchelaine raised one thin eyebrow. Ah, well, with you and friend Buke here interfering with Corbel Brooch's normal nightly activities, my colleague was forced to modify his habits, his modus operandi, if you will. Now you see, my friends, he has no need to leave his room in order to satisfy his needs of acquisition. Nonetheless, it should be said, please desist in your misguided efforts. The necromancer's flat grey eyes fixed on Buke. And as for the priest Kiruli's peculiar sorcery now residing within you, unveil it not, dear servant. We dislike company when in our soul-taken forms. Buke's legs came close to giving out beneath him. Emancipor, Beauchelaine murmured, do lend your shoulder to our guard. The old man stepped close. His eyes were so wide that Buke could see white all around them. Sweat beaded his wrinkled face. I told you it was madness, he hissed. What did Kiruli do to you? Damn you, Buke! Shut up, Mansi, Buke growled. You knew they were soul taken, yet you said nothing. But Kiruli knew as well. Beauchelaine strode towards the main house, humming under his breath. 
Puke twisted and gripped a Mansipore's tunic. I can follow them now. Karuli's gift. I can follow those two anywhere. They'll kill you. They'll swat you down, Puke. You hood-damned idiot. Buke managed a sickly grin. Hood damned? Oh, yes, Mansi. We're all that, aren't we just? Hood damned, I. A distant, terrible roar interrupted them. A sound that shivered through the city, swept in from all sides. Emancipor paled. The tennis gallery. But Buke's attention had been drawn to the main building's square tower, to the open shutters of the top third floor's room where two rooks now perched. Oh, yes, he muttered, baring his teeth. I see you. You're going after him, aren't you? That first child of the dead seed, Anasta. You're going after him. The rooks dropped from the ledge, wings spreading, swooped low over the compound, then, with heavy, audible flaps, lifted themselves clear of the compound wall, flying southeast. Buke pushed Reese away. I can follow them. Oh, yes. Karuli's sweet gift. My own soul taken form, Buke thought. The shape of wings. The air sliding over and beneath me. God's the freedom. What I will... finds form. He felt his body veering, sweet warmth filling his limbs the spice of his skin's breath as it assumed a cloak of feathers. His body dwindling, changing shape, heavy bones thinning, becoming lighter. Karuli's sweet gift, more than he ever imagined. Flight, away from what I was, from all that I had been, burdens vanishing. Oh, I can follow those two dread creatures, those winged nightmares. I can follow... And where they strain and lumber on the unseen currents in the sky, I twist, dart, race like lightning. Standing in the courtyard, Emancipor Reese watched through watering eyes Buke's transformation. A blurring of the man, a drawing inward, the air filling with pungent spice. He watched as the sparrow hawk that had been Buke shot upward in a cavorting, climbing spiral. Aye! he muttered. You can fly circles around them, but, dear Buke, when they decide to swat you down, it won't be a duel on the wing. It'll be sorcery. Those plodding rooks have no need for speed, no need for agility, and those gifts will avail you nothing when the time comes. Buke, you poor fool. High above Capustan, the sparrowhawk circled. The two rooks, Beauchelaine and Corbel Brooch, were far below, yet perfectly visible to the raptor's eyes. Flapping ponderously through wreaths of smoke, southeast, past the east gate. The city still burned in places, thrusting columns of black smoke skyward. The sparrow hawk studied the siege from a point of view that the world's generals would die for. Wheeling, circling, watching. The Teniscari ringed the city in a thick, seething band. A third of a million, maybe more. Such a mass of people as Buke had never seen before. And the band had begun to constrict. A strangely colourless, writhing noose, drawing ever closer to the city's feeble, crumbled walls and what seemed but a handful of defenders. There would be no stopping this assault. An army measured not by bravery, but by something far deadlier. Something unopposable. Hunger. An army that could not afford to break, that saw only wasting death in retreat. Capustan was about to be devoured. The Panion Seer is a monster in truth, Buke thought. A tyranny of need. And this will spread. Defeat him? You would have to kill every man, woman and child on this world who are bowed to hunger. Everyone who faces starvation's grisly grin. It has begun here, on Genabacus, but that is simply the heart. This tide will spread. It will infect every city, on every continent. It will devour empires and nations from within. I see you now, seer. From this height, 
I understand what you are and what you will become. We are lost. We are all truly lost. His thoughts were scattered by a virulent bloom of sorcery to the east. A knot of familiar magic swirled around a small section of the Teniscari army. Black waves shot through with sickly purple, streamed outward, cut down screaming peasants by the hundreds. Grey streaming sorcery answered. The Sparrowhawk's eyes saw the twin corbies now, there, in the midst of the magical storm. Demons burst from torn portals on the plain, tore mayhem through the shrieking, flinching ranks. Sorcery lashed back, swarmed over the creatures. The two rooks swept down, converged on a figure sitting on a bucking rowan horse. Waves of magic collided with a midnight flash, the concussion a thunder that reached up to where Buke circled. The sparrowhawk's beak opened, loosing a piercing cry. The rooks had peeled away. Sorcery hammered them, battered them as they flapped in hasty retreat. The figure on the stamping horse was untouched. Surrounded by heaps of bodies, into which fellow Tenescari now plunged. To feed. Buke screamed another triumphant cry, dipped his wings, plummeted earthward. He reached the estate's courtyard well ahead of Beauchelaine and Corbel Brooch, spiralling, slowing, wings buffeting the air. To hover the briefest of moments before assembling, returning to his human form. Emancipore was nowhere to be seen. The undead Erdemann still stood in the positions where they had first arisen. Feeling heavy and awkward in his body, Buke turned to study them. Six of you to the gate. You, he pointed. And the ones directly behind you. And you, to the northwest tower. He continued directing the silent warriors, placing them as Beauchelaine had suggested. As he barked the last order, twin shadows tracked weaving paths across the cobbles. The rooks landed in the courtyard. Their feathers were in tatters. Smoke rose from one of them. Buke watched the assembling, smiled at seeing first Kerbal Brooch, his armor in shreds, rank tendrils of smoke wreathed around him, then Beauchelaine, his pale face bruised along one side of his long jaw, blood crusting his mustache and staining his silver beard. Corbel Brooch reached up to the collar of his cloak, his pudgy, soft hands trembling, fumbling at the clasp. The black leather fell to the ground. He began stamping on it to kill the last of its smoldering patches. Brushing dust from his arms, Beauchelin glanced over at Buke. Patient of you, to await our return. Wiping the smile from his lips, Buke shrugged. You didn't get him. What happened? It seems, the necromancer muttered, we must needs refine our tactics. The instinct of self-preservation vanished then, as Buke softly laughed. Beauchelin froze. One eyebrow arched. Then he sighed. Yes, well, good day to you too, Buke. Buke watched him head inside. Corbel Brooch continued stomping on his cloak long after the smouldering patches had been extinguished. Chapter 15 In my dreams I come face to face with myriad reflections of myself, all unknown and passing strange. They speak unending in languages not my own and walk with companions I have never met, in places my steps have never gone. In my dreams I walk worlds where forests crowd my knees and half the sky is walled ice. Dun herds flow like mud, vast floods tusked and horned, surging over the plain. And lo, they are my memories, the migrations of my soul. In the time before night, de Arians of the Rivi. Whiskey Jack rose in the saddle as his horse leapt over the spiny ridge of outcroppings cresting the hill. Hooves thumped as the creature resumed its gallop, crossing the mesa's flat top, then slowing as the Malazan tautened the reins and settled back in the saddle. At a diminishing canter, he approached the summit's far side, then drew up at its edge. A rumpled, boulder-strewn slope led down into a broad, dry riverbed. 
At its base, two Second Army scouts sat on their horses, backs to Whiskey Jack. Before them, a dozen rivy were moving on foot through what seemed to be a field of bones. Huge bones. Clicking his mount into motion, Whiskey Jack slowly worked it down onto the ancient slide. His eyes held on the scatter of bones. Massive iron blades glinted there, as well as crumpled, oddly shaped armor and helmets. He saw long reptilian jaws, rows of jagged teeth. Clinging to some of the shattered skeletons, the remnants of gray skin. Clearing the scree, Whiskey Jack rode up to the nearest scout. The man saluted. Sir, the rivier jabbering away. Can't quite follow what they're talking about. Looks to have been about ten of the demons. Whatever tore into them was nasty. Might be the rivier have gleaned more, since they're crawling around among the corpses. Nodding, Whiskey Jack dismounted. Keep an eye out, he said, though he knew the scouts were doing just that, but feeling the need to say something. The killing field exuded an air of dread, old yet new, and, even more alarming, it held the peculiar tension that immediately followed a battle. Thick silence, Whiskey Jack thought, swirling as if not yet settled by the sounds of violence, as if somehow still trembling, still shivering. He approached the rivy and the sprawl of bones. The tribal scouts were indeed jabbering. Dead wolves? Twice tracks, the touch is heavy yet light, wider than my hand, big, big dead wolves. No blood agreed, barrow stench, black stone dust, sharp, glittering beneath forearms, the skin, black glass fragments, obsidian, far south, southwest or far north, beyond later and plateau. No, I see no red or brown. Later on obsidian has wood-coloured veins. This is morn. If of this world, the demons are here, are they not? Of this world, in this world, barrow stench, yet in the air, ice stench, tundra wind, the smell of frozen peat, the wake of the wolves, the killers. Whiskey Jack growled. Rivy scouts, attend to me, please. Heads lifted, faces turned. Silence. I will hear your report now. Which of you commands this troop? Looks were exchanged. Then one shrugged. I can speak this Daru you use better than the others. So for this that you ask, me. Very well, proceed. The young Rivy swept back the braided strands of his grease-laden hair, then waved expansively at the bones around them. Undead demons, armoured, with swords instead of hands, coming from the southeast, more east than south. He made an exaggerated frown. Damaged, pursued, hunted. Fleeing, driven like Bedrin, this way and that, loping, silent followers, four-legged and patient. Big, undead wolves, Whiskey Jack cut in. Twice as big as the native wolves of this plain, yes. Then his expression cleared as if with revelation. They are like the ghost runners of our legends. When the eldest shouldermen or women dream their father's dreams, the wolves are seen. Never close, always running, all ghostly except the one who leads, who seems as flesh and has eyes of life. To see them is great fortune, glad tiding, for there is joy in their running. Only they're no longer running just in dreams of your witches and warlocks, Whiskey Jack said. And this run was far deadlier. Hunting. I said these wolves are like those in the dreams. I did not say they were those in the dreams. His expression went blank, his eyes the eyes of a cold killer. Hunting, driving their quarry down to this, their trap. Then they destroyed them, a battle of undead. The demons are from barrows far to the south. The wolves are from the dust in the north winds of winter. Thank you, Whiskey Jack said. The rivy manner of narrative, the dramatic performance, had well conveyed the events this valley had witnessed. More riders were approaching from the main column, and he turned to watch them. Three. Corlat, Silver Fox, and the Daru, Crupper. The latter bobbing and weaving on his mule, as it raced with stiff, short-legged urgency in the wake of the two horse-riding women. His cries of alarm echoed in the narrow valley. Yes, 
The commander swung round, eyes narrowing on the Rivi scout leader, who, along with all his kin, was now studying the three riders. Excuse me? The Rivi shrugged, expressionless, and said nothing. The scree of boulders had forced the newcomers to slow, except for Krapa, who was thrown forward then back on his saddle as the mule pitched headlong down the slope. Somehow the beast kept its footing, plummeting past a startled call-out and a laughing silver fox, then reaching the flat, slowing its wild charge and trotting up to where Whiskey Jack stood, its head lifted proudly, ears up and forward-facing. Krupa, on the other hand, remained hugging the animal's neck, eyes squeezed shut, face crimson and streaming sweat. Terror, he moaned. Battle of wills. Krupa has met his match in this brainless, delusional beast. I, he is defeated. Oh, spare me. The mule halted. You can climb off now, Whiskey Jack said. Krupa opened his eyes, looked around, then slowly sat straight. He shakily withdrew a handkerchief. Naturally. Having given the creature its head, Krupa now reacquires the facility of his own. Pausing a moment to pat his brow and daub his face, he then wormed off the saddle and settled to the ground with a loud sigh. Ah, here come Krupa's lazy dust eaters. Delighted you could make it, dear ladies. A fine afternoon for a trot, yes? Silver Fox had stopped laughing, her veiled eyes now on the scattered bones. Who'd take me? That fur cloak becomes her indeed. Mentally shaking himself, Whiskey Jack glanced up to meet Corlat's steady, faintly ironic gaze. But so, oh, she pales beside this sister Andy. Damn it, old man. Think not of the night's past. Do not embrace this wonder so tightly you crush the life from it. The scouts, he said to both women, have come upon a scene of battle. Kachain Chamala, Corlat nodded, eyeing the bones. Kael hunters, fortunately undead rather than enlivened flesh. Likely not as fast as they would have been. Still, to have been torn apart in such fashion. Talan I, Silver Fox said. They are why I have come. Whiskey Jack studied her. What do you mean? She shrugged. To see for myself, Commander. We are all drawing close. You to your besieged city and I to the destiny to which I was born. Convergence, the plague of this world. Even so, she added as she swung down from the saddle and strode among the bones, there are gifts, dearest of such gifts, the Talan Eye. She paused, the wind caressing the fox fur on her shoulders, then whispered the name once more. Talan Eye. Grubba shivers when she so names them. Ah, God's bless this grim beauty in its barren land tableau, from which starry dreams so dimmed with time are as rainbow rivers in the sky. He paused, blinked at the others. Sweet sleep, in which hidden poetry resides, the flow of the disconnected, so smooth as to seem entwined, yes? I'm not the man. Whiskey Jack growled, to appreciate your abstractions, Crupper, alas. Of course, blunt soldier, as you say. But wait, does Crupper see in your eyes a certain charge? The air veritably crackles with imminence. Do you deny your sensitivity to that, Malazan? No, say nothing. The truth resides in your hard gaze and your gauntleted hand, where it edges closer to the grip of your sword. Whiskey Jack could not deny the hairs rising on the back of his neck. He looked around, saw a similar alertness among the rivi, and in the pair of Malazan scouts who were scanning the hill lines on all sides. What comes? Corlat whispered. The gift? Cropper murmured with a beatific smile as he rested his eyes upon Silver Fox. Whiskey Jack followed the Daru's gaze. To see the woman so much like Tattersail, standing with her back to them, arms raised high. Dust began swirling, 
rising in eddies on all sides. The Talan Eye took form in the basin, on the slopes and the crests of the surrounding hills. In their thousands. Grey dust into grey matted fur, black shoulders, throats the hue of rain clouds, thick tails silver and black tipped. While others were brown, the colour of rotted, powdered wood faded to tan at throat and belly. Wolves, tall, gaunt, their eyes shadowed pits. Huge long heads were turned, one and all, to silver fox. She glanced over her shoulder, her heavy-lidded eyes fixing on Whiskey Jack. She smiled. My escort. The commander, struck silent, stared at her. So like Tattersail, he thought, yet not. Escort, she says, but I see more, and her look tells me she is aware. So very aware now. Escort and bodyguard. Silver Fox may no longer require us, and now that her need for our protection has passed, she is free to do whatever she pleases. A cold wind seemed to rattle through Whiskey Jack's mind. God, what if Callor was right all along? What if we've all missed our chance? With a soft grunt, he shook off the unworthy thoughts. No, we have shown our faith in her, when it mattered most, when she was at her weakest. Tatasel would not forget that. So like, yet not. Night chill, dismembered by betrayal. Is it Tashrin her remnant soul hates? Or the Malazan Empire and every son and daughter of its blood? Or the one she had been called upon to battle, Anamanda Rake, and, by extension, Caladan Brood? The Rivi, the Bargast. Does she seek vengeance against them? Cropper cleared his throat. <clears throat> and a lovely escort they are, my dear lass. Alarming to your enemies, reassuring to your loyal friends. We are charmed, for we can see that you are as well, so very deeply charmed by these silent, motionless to lan I. Such well-behaved pups. Cropper is impressed beyond words, beyond gestures, beyond suitable response entire. If only, Corlat murmured, that were the case. She faced Whiskey Jack, her expression closed and professional. Commander, I will take my leave now to report to our leaders. Corlat, Silver Fox interrupted, forgive me for not asking earlier, but when did you last look upon my mother? This morning, the Tista Andy replied, she can no longer walk, and this has been her condition for almost a week now. She weakens by the day, Silver Fox. Perhaps if you were to come and see her. There is no need for that, the fur-cloaked woman said. Who attends her at this moment? Councillor Cole and the Daru man Murillo. Grappa's most loyal friends, Grappa assures you all. She is safe enough. Circumstances, Silver Fox said, her expression tight, are about to grow tense. And what has it been till now, woman? Whiskey Jack thought. Callow haunts your shadow like a vulture. I'm surprised he let you get away just now. Unless he's lurking about on the other side of the nearest hill. Do you ask something of me, Silver Fox? Corlat inquired. She visibly gathered herself. Aye, some of your kin. To guard my mother. The Tisti Andi frowned. It would seem, with your new guardians in such number, that you have some to spare. She would not let them approach her, I'm afraid. She has nightmares. I am sorry, but I must ensure my Talan eye are kept out of her sight and senses. She may look frail and seem powerless, but there is that within her that is capable of driving the Talan eye away. Will you do as I ask? Of course, Silver Fox. The woman nodded, attention shifting once more back to Whiskey Jack, as Corlat wheeled her mount 
and rode back up the slope. She studied him in silence for a moment, then looked to Cropper. Well, Daru, are you satisfied thus far? I am, dearest one. Not Cropper's usual tone, but spoken low, measured. Satisfied? With what? Whiskey Jack thought. Will she hold on, do you think? Cropper shrugged. We shall see, yes. Cropper has faith. Enough for both of us. The Daru smiled. Naturally. Silver Fox sighed. Very well. I lean heavily on you in this, you know. Cropper's legs are as pillars of stone. Your touch is so light as to pass unnoticed by worthy self. My dear, the sound of additional riders urges upon you a decision. What will you permit to be seen by those who now approach? Nothing untoward, the woman replied. She raised her arms again. The Talan eye returned to the dust from which they had arisen. With a soft grunt, Whiskey Jack strode back to his horse. There were too many mysteries roiling through the company of the two armies, secrets that seemed to hold promises of explosive revelation. Probably violent ones at that. He felt uneasy. I wish Quick Ben was here. Who knows? I wish I knew what was happening with him and Parron and the bridge burners. Did they succeed? Or are they all now dead, their skulls surmounting poles around the Bargast camps? A substantial part of the column's vanguard reached the hill's crest, where they halted in a ragged line. Whiskey Jack swung himself into the saddle and made his way towards the group. Callor, riding a gaunt grey horse, had deliberately drawn rein apart from the others. His faded grey cloak was tight about his broad, armoured shoulders. Shadows deepened the lines of his ancient, weathered face. Long strands of his grey hair drifted to one side in the wind. Whiskey Jack's gaze held on the man a moment longer, gauging, then shifted to the others lining the ridge. Brood and Dujek were side by side. On the warlord's right was the outrider, Herlikel. On the Malazan's left, the standard-bearer, Artanthos. The Tregala Trade Guild's merchant mage, Haradas, was also present, and, of course, Corlat. None were speaking as Whiskey Jack's horse reached the crest. Then Dujek nodded and growled. Corlat's described what the scouts found. Anything else to add? Whiskey Jack glanced at the Tista Andy, but her expression was closed. He shook his head. No, High Fist. Corlat and her kin seem to know more about these Kachain Chamala than the rest of us. What lies below are a jumble of shattered bones, some weapons and armor. I could not have identified them myself. The Rivi scouts believe they were undead. Fortunate for us all, muttered Callor. I am not so ignorant of these creatures as the rest of you, barring Corlat. Further, I am feeling unusually loquacious. Thus, remnants of the Kachain Chimala civilization can be found on virtually every continent on this world. Indeed, in the place of my old emperor, Jakuruku, their strange mechanisms filled pits and holes in the earth. Whenever my people had to cut below the surface, they discovered such constructs. More, barrows were found. Scholars conducted careful examination of their contents. Do you wish to hear an account of their conclusions, or am I boring you? Go on, Caladan drawled. Very well. Perhaps there is more wisdom present here than I had previously credited. The beasts appear to be reptilian, capable of breeding their own kind to specific talents. Those that Tista Andy called Kael Hunters, for example, were born as warriors. Undead versions are in the valley below, yes? They had no hands but swords in their stead, somehow melded to the very bones of their forearms. The Kachain Chamala were matriarchal, matrilineal. As a population of bees have their queen, so too these beasts. She is the breeder, the mother of every child, 
and within this matron resided the sorceress capacity of her entire family. Power to beggar the gods of today. Power to keep the elder gods from coming to this world. And were it not for the self-destruction of the Kachain Jamala, they would rule unchallenged to this day. Self-destruction, Kolat said, a sharpness in her eyes as she studied Kalor. An interesting detail. Can you explain? Of course. Among the records found, once the language was deciphered, and that effort alone is worthy of lengthy monologue, but seeing how you all shift about in your saddles like impatient children, I'll spare the telling. Among the records found, then, it was learned that the matrons, each commanding the equivalent of a modern city, had gathered to meld their disparate ambitions. What they sought, beyond the vast power they already possessed, is not entirely clear. Then again, what need there be for reasons when ambition rules? Suffice to say, an ancient breed was resurrected, returned from extinction by the matrons, a more primitive version of the Kachain Jamala themselves. For lack of a better name, my scholars at the time called them Short Tales. Whiskey Jack, his eyes on Corlat, was the only one to see her stiffen at that. Behind him, he could hear Silver Fox and Cropper making their way back up the slope. For the singular reason, Kalor went on in his dry monotone, that they physically deviated from the other Kachain Jamala in having short, stubby tails, rather than the normal, long, tapered ones. This made them not as swift, more upright, suited to whatever world and civilization they had originally belonged to. Alas, these new children were not as tractable as the matrons were conditioned to expect among their brood. More explicitly, the short tails would not surrender or merge their magical talons with their mothers. The result was a civil war, and the sorceries unleashed were apocalyptic. To gauge something of the desperation among the matrons, one need only travel south on this continent to a place called Morn. The rent, Kulat murmured, nodding. Kalor's smile was wintry. She sought to harness the power of a gate itself, but not simply a common Warren's gate. Oh, no. She elected to open the portal that led to the realm of chaos. Such hubris to think she could control, could assert order upon such a thing. He paused as if reconsidering his own words, then laughed. <clears throat> oh, a bitter lesson or two in that tale, don't you think? Caladan Brood grunted. Let's bring this back to the present, shall we? In the valley below, undead Kael hunters, the question to address is, what are they doing here? They are being used. Everyone's eyes fixed on Silverfox, who stood before her horse, reins in hand. I like not the sound of that, Dujek growled. Used, Silver Fox repeated, by the Panion Seer. Impossible, Kalor snapped. Only a Kachin Jamala matron could command a Kerl hunter, even when undead. Then it would appear, Corlat said, that we have more than one enemy. The Panion Seer has an ally. Dujek leaned on his saddle and spat. There's not been even so much as a hint. Nonetheless, Silver Fox cut in, proof lies before us, in the valley below. A matron cannot breed more of her kind without the seed of living males, Kalor said. Therefore, with each Kael hunter destroyed, there is one less for us to deal with. Brood turned at that, eyes thinning to slits. Easily swallowed, this revelation. Kalor shrugged. There is also before us, the warlord continued, another truth. 
regarding the destruction of the Cal Hunters. Someone is doing it for us, it seems. Silence. Then slowly, attention focused on Silver Fox. She smiled. I did say some time ago that you would all need help. Kalor snarled. Talan I mass. So tell us, bitch. Why would they concern themselves with Kachain Chamala? Are not the Jaghut their avowed enemies? Why task your undead followers with a new one? Why have you and the Talan I mass joined this war, woman? We have joined nothing, she replied, her eyes heavy lidded, standing as Tattersell would stand hands clasped and resting on the folds of her belly, her body solid yet curvaceous beneath her deer-hide tunic. Ah, I know that look, Whiskey Jack thought. Slight of hand. Careful now. Do you deny, then? Brood began slowly, his expression clouded, uncertain. That your Talan I mass were responsible for destroying these Kael hunters? Have none of you ever wondered? Silver Fox said, looking at each of them. Why the Talan Mass warred with the Jackhut? Perhaps an explanation, Dujek said, will assist us in understanding. Silver Fox gave a sharp nod. When the first I Mass emerged, they were forced to live in the shadow of the Jackhut. Tolerated, ignored, but only in small, manageable numbers. Pushed to the poorest of lands. Then tyrants arose among the Jaghut, who found pleasure in enslaving them, in forcing upon them a nightmarish existence, that successive generations were born into, and so knew of no other life, knew nothing of freedom itself. The lesson was hard, not easily swallowed, for the truth was this. They were intelligent beings in the world who exploited the virtues of others, their compassion, their love, their faith in kin, exploited and mocked. How many Imas tribes discovered that their gods were, in fact, Jaghut tyrants? Hidden behind friendly masks, tyrants who manipulated them with the weapon of faith. The rebellion was inevitable, and it was devastating for the Imas. Weaker, uncertain even of what it was they sought, or what freedom would show them should they find it. But we would not relent. We could not. Kalor sneered. There were never more than but a handful of tyrants among the Jaghut, woman. A handful was too many. And I, we found allies among the Jaghut, those for whom the activities of the tyrants was reprehensible. But we now carried scars. Scars born of mistrust, of betrayal. We could trust only in our own kind. In the name of our generations to come, all Jaghut would have to die. None could be left to produce more children, to permit among those children the rise of new tyrants. And how, Kulat asked, does this relate to the Kachain Jamala? Before the Jaghut ruled this world, the Kachain Chamala ruled. The first Jaghut were to the Kachain Chamala as the first Imas were to the Jaghut. She paused, her heavy gaze moving among them all. In each species is born the seeds of domination. Our wars with the Jaghut destroyed us as a living people, as a vibrant, evolving culture. That was the price we paid to ensure the freedom you now possess, our eternal sacrifice. She fell silent once more, then continued in a harder tone. So, now I ask you, all of you, who have taken upon yourselves the task of waging war against a tyrannical, all-devouring empire, of possibly sacrificing your own lives to the benefit of peoples who know nothing of you, of lands you have never and will never set foot upon. I ask you, what is there about us, about the Talan I mass, that still escapes your understanding? Destroy the Panyan Domin. It must be done. For me, for my Talan I mass, 
awaits the task of destroying the threat hiding behind the Panyan Seer, the threat that is the Kachain Jamala. She slowly studied their faces. A matron lives, flesh and blood. Should she find a male of her kind, a flesh and blood male, the tyranny of the Jaghat will be as nothing to that of the Kachain Jamala. This, then, will be our sacrifice. Only the wind filled the silence following her words. Then Caladan Brood turned to Callor. And you find in this woman an abomination? She lies, he rasped in reply. This entire war is meaningless, nothing more than a feint. A feint? Dujek repeated in disbelief. By whom? Kalor snapped his mouth shut, made no reply. The Tregala Trade Guild merchant mage, Haridus, cleared her throat. There, <clears throat> there may be some truth in that. Not that the woman Silver Fox is lying. I believe she speaks true, as far as she is willing to tell us. No, I meant the faint. Consider the infection of the Warrens. Granted, its focus seems to emanate from the Panion Domin, and granted, as well, that the poison's taint is that of the Warren of Chaos. Granted all of that, one must then ask, why would a Kuchin Chamala matron, who is the repository of a vast wellspring of sorcery, seek to destroy the very conduits of her power? If she was present when Morn was destroyed, when the rent was created, why would she then try to harness Chaos again? Ambitious, perhaps, but a fool? That is hard to countenance. Even as the import of her words sank in to Whiskey Jack, there came to him another realization. There is another enemy indeed, he thought, and from the looks on most of the faces around me, barring Dujek and no doubt my own, the revelation is not as surprising as it should be. True, we'd caught a hint, but we'd failed to make the connection. Brood, Kolat, Kalor, gods, even Kroppa and Artanthos. Remind me to avoid every damn one of them the next time I join a game of bones. He jerked his gaze back to Silverfox, was met with that sleepy, knowing regard. No, that won't work again. Silverfox, he growled, you spin a tale to sting sympathy from our hearts. Yet it seems that your effort was misdirected, and so you end up undermining all you sought to achieve. If there is a deeper threat, a third hand, deftly manipulating both us and the Panion Seer, will you and your Talani Mass then focus your attention on that hand? No. Why? He was surprised as her steady gaze wavered, then fell away. Her voice came out in a raw whisper. Because, Whiskey Jack, you ask too much of us. No one spoke. Dread swept through Whiskey Jack. He swung about, locked gazes with Dujek, saw in the old man's face a mirror to his own growing horror. Gods below, we are heading to our deaths. An unseen enemy, but one we've known about for a long time. One we knew was coming, sooner or later, one that, by the abyss, makes the Talan I mass recoil. Such palpable distraughtness, Cropper cried. Distraughtness? Is there such a word? If not, then among Cropper's countless talents, we must add linguistic invention. My friends, attend, hark, listen. Take heart, one and all, in the knowledge that Grappa has placed himself, feet square and ample girth firm, in the path of said, yet unmentioned, formidable enemy of all existence. Sleep calm at night in this knowledge. Slumber as babes in your mother's arms, as each of you once did. Even Kalor, though the image shocks and dismays. Damn it! Caladan Brood roared. 
What in Hood's name are you talking about, little man? You claim to stand in the path of the crippled god? By the abyss, you are mad. If you do not, he continued in a low tone, as he swung down from his horse, give instant proof of your efficacy. He strode towards Crupper, one hand reaching for the wrapped handle of his hammer. I will not predict the extremity of my temper. I wouldn't do that, Brood, Silver Fox murmured. The warlord twisted to face her, teeth bared. You now extend your protection to this arrogant fat toad? Her eyes widened, and she looked to the Daru. Krupa, do you make such a request? Absurd! No offence, dear, in that expostulation. Krupa sweetly assures you. Whiskey Jack stared, disbelieving, as the round little man in his food and drink-stained clothes drew himself up as straight as he was able and fix small, glittering eyes on Caladan Brood. Threaten Krupa of Darujistan, will you? Demand an explanation, do you? Fundling that hammer, are you? Bearing those fa- Silence! The warlord bellowed, struggling to control his anger. Gods below, what is Krupa up to? Whiskey Jack thought. Krupa defies all threats! Crupper sneers at whatever demonstration Bristling Warlord would attempt. The hammer was suddenly in Brood's hands, a smudge blur as it swung through the air, a downward arc, to strike the earth almost at Crupper's feet. The detonation threw horses down, sent Whiskey Jack and the others flying. A thunderous concussion cracked the air. The ground seemed to leap up to meet the Malazan commander, the impact like a fist when he struck, rolled, then tumbled his way down the boulder-strewn slope. Above him, horses were screaming. A wind, hot, shrieking, shot dust and earth skyward. The scree of boulders was moving beneath Whiskey Jack, flowing, sliding down into the valley at an ever-quickening pace with a rumbling, growing roar. Rocks clanged against his armor, wrapped into the helm on his head, leaving him stunned. He caught a flashing glimpse through a jagged tear in the dust cloud of the line of hills on the other side of the valley. Impossibly, they were rising, fast, the bedrock splitting the grassy hide, loosing gouts of dust, rock shards and smoke. Then the swarming dust swallowed the world around him. Boulders bounced over him, tumbling. Others struck him solid, painful blows that left him gasping, coughing, choking as he rolled. Even now, the ground continued to heave beneath the sliding scree. Distant detonations shook the earth, trembled through Whiskey Jack's battered bones. He came to a rest half-buried in gravel and rocks. Blinking, eyes burning, he saw before him the rivy scouts, dodging, leaping from the path of bounding boulders, as if in some bizarre, deadly game. Beyond, black, streaming bedrock towered, the spine of a new mountain range, still growing, still rising, lifting and tilting the floor of the valley where the Malazan now lay. The sky behind it churned iron-gray with steam and smoke. Hood, take me, Whiskey Jack thought. Poor Cropper. Groaning, Whiskey Jack twisted round as far as he could. He was covered in scrapes, could feel the tender birth of huge bruises beneath his dented, torn armor. But his bones were, amazingly, intact. He strained his watering eyes to the hilltop behind him. The scree was gone, leaving a gaping, raw cliff face. Most of the mesa's summit was simply no longer there, obliterated, leaving a small, flat-topped island, where Whiskey Jack now saw figures moving, rising. Horses scrambling upright. Faintly came the brazen complaint of a mule. To the north, cutting a path down along the side of a distant valley, then through distant hills, a narrow, steaming crack was visible, a fissure in the earth that seemed depthless. Whiskey Jack painfully pulled himself clear of the rubble, slowly straightened. He saw Caladan brood, hammer hanging down from his hands, motionless and standing before the warlord on an island of his own was Crupper, brushing dust from his clothes. 
The crack that had been born where the hammer had struck the earth parted neatly around the short, fat Daru, joining again just behind him. Whiskey Jack struggled to hold back a laugh, knowing how desperate, how jarring it would sound. So, we have seen Brood's fury, he thought. And Krupper, that preposterous little man, has stood it down. Well, if proof was ever needed that the Daru was not as he appeared to be. He then frowned. A demonstration indeed. Directed towards whom, I wonder? A cry of dismay cut through his thoughts. Corlat. She faced north, her posture somehow contracted, drawn in on itself. The fisher, Whiskey Jack now saw, all amusement gone, was filling with blood. Fouled blood. Rotten blood, he thought. Beru Fend, the sleeping goddess. Burn sleeps the sleep of the dying, the poisoned. And this, he realized, was the day's final, most terrible revelation. Diseased. The hidden hand of the crippled god. The Mibi's eyes snapped open. The wagon rocked and pitched. Thunder shook the ground. The shouts of Rivi were on all sides, a wailing chorus of alarm and consternation. Her bones and muscles protested as she was thrown about in the cataclysm, but she would not cry out. She wanted only to hide. The rumbling faded, replaced by the distant lowing of the Bedouin, and closer by, the soft footpads of her kin as they rushed past the wagon. The herd was close to panic, and a stampede was imminent. Bringing ruin to us all, yet that would be a mercy, an end to the pain, to my nightmares. In her dreams she was young once more, but those dreams held no joy. Strangers walked the tundra landscape where she invariably found herself. They approached. She fled, darting like a snow hare. Running. Always running. Strangers. She did not know what they wanted, but they were seeking her. That much was clear. Tracking her, like hunters their quarry. To sleep was to awaken exhausted, limbs trembling, chest heaving with agonized breaths. She had been saved from the abyss, from those countless tattered souls lost in eternal desperate hunger. Saved by a dragon. To what end? Leaving me in a place where I am hunted, pursued without surcease. Time passed, punctuated by the herder's calming words to the frightened Bedouin. There would be no stampede after all. Rumble still trembled through the earth in diminishing ripples that grew ever farther apart. The Maibi moaned softly to herself as the wagon rocked once more, this time to the arrival of the two Daru, Kol and Morilia. You've awakened, the counselor noted. It's no surprise. Leave me be, she said, drawing the hides around her shivering body and curling away from the two men. It's so cold, she thought. Any idea what's happened up ahead? Marilio asked Cole. Seems Brood lost his temper. Gods, with whom? Callor, that bastard deserves... Not Callor, friend, Cole growled. Make another guess. Shouldn't take you long. Marilio groaned. Crapa. Hood knows he stretched the patience of all of us at one time or another. Only none of us was capable of splitting apart half the world and throwing new mountains skyward. Did the little runt get himself killed? I can't believe... Word is, he's come out unscathed, typically, complaining of the dust. No one else was injured either, though the warlord himself almost got his head kicked in by an angry mule. Crupper's mule? The one that sleeps when it walks? Aye, the very one. Sleeps. Dreams of being a horse, no doubt. Magnificent, tall, fierce, the Maibi thought. 
That beast is a strange one, indeed. Never seen a mule so... so watchful. Of everything. Queen of Dreams, that's the oddest-looking range of mountains I've ever seen. Aye, Murillo. It does look bigger than it really is. Twist the eye. A broken spine. Like something you'd see at the very horizon. Yet there it is. Not a half-league from us. Doesn't bear thinking about, if you ask me. Nothing bears thinking about, the Mybe thought. Not mountains, not mules, not brood's temper. Souls crowd my daughter there within her. Two women and a thelomen named Skullcrasher. Two women and a man whom I've never met. Yet I carried that child within me. I, a rivy, young, in the bloom of my life, drawn into a dream, then the dream made real. Yet where, within my daughter, am I? Where is the blood, the heart of the rivy? She has nothing of me, nothing at all. Naught but a vessel in truth, that is all I was, a vessel to hold, then birth into the world, a stranger. She has no reason to see me, to visit, to take my hand and offer me comfort. My purpose is done, over, and here I lie, a discarded thing, forgotten, a might be. A hand settled gently on her shoulder. Marilio spoke. I think she sleeps once more. For the best, Cole murmured. I remembered my own youth. The Daru went on in a quiet, introspective tone. I remember your own youth too, Marilio. Wild and wasteful. A different widow every night, as I recall. I was a lodestone indeed, and you know, it was all so effortless. We'd noticed. The man sighed. But no longer. I've aged. Paid the price for my younger days. Nights, you mean. Whatever. New rivals have arrived. Young bloods. Marek of Paxto, tall and lithe and turning heads wherever he saunters. The smug bastard. Then there's peril of Manekri. Oh, really, Marilio, spare me all this. The point is, it was all a stretch of years. Full years, pleasurable ones. And for all that, I'm on the wane. At least I can look back and recall my days. All right, my nights of glory. But here, with this poor woman. I, I hear you. Ever notice those copper ornaments she's wearing? There, you can see the pair on her wrist. Cropper's gifts from Darujistan. What about them? Well, as I was saying, ever notice them? It's a strange thing. They get brighter, shinier when she's sleeping. Do they? I'd swear it on a stack of Cropper's handkerchiefs. How odd. They're kind of dull right now, though. There was silence from the two men crouched above her. After a long moment, the hand resting on her shoulder squeezed slightly. Ah, my dear, Marilia whispered, would that I could take back my words? Why? The Mybe thought. They were truth. Words from your heart, and it is a generous one for all your irresponsible youth. You've given voice to my curse. That changes nothing. Am I to be pitied? Only when I'm asleep, it seems. To my face you say nothing, and consider your silence a kindness. But it mocks me, for it arrives as indifference. And this silence of mine, to those two kind men looking down on me right now, which of my countless flaws does this reveal? Your pity, it seems, is no match for my own. Her thoughts trailed away then. The treeless ochre wasteland of her dream world appeared, and she within it. She began running. Dujek flung his gauntlets against the tent wall as he entered, his face dark with fury. 
Whiskey Jack unstoppered the jug of ale and filled the two goblets waiting on the small camp table before him. Both men were smeared in sweaty dust. What madness is this? The high fist rasped, pausing only long enough to snatch up one of the goblets before beginning to pace. Whiskey Jack stretched his battered legs out, the chair creaking beneath him. He swallowed a long draught of ale, sighed, and said, Which madness are you referring to, Dujek? Aye, the list is getting damned long. The crippled god? The ugliest legends belong to that broken bastard. Fisher Kelteth's poem on the chaining. I'm not one for reading poetry, but who knows? I've heard bits of it spoken by tavern bards and the like. Vain as balls, this isn't the war I signed on to fight. Whiskey Jack's eyes narrowed on the high fist. Then don't. Dujek stopped pacing, faced his second. Go on, he said after a moment. Brood already knew, he replied with a shrug that made him wince. As did Corlat. With him, you could reasonably include Anamanda Rake and Kalor, though I liked not the avid glint in that man's eye. So, two ascendants and one would-be ascendant. The crippled god is too powerful for people like you and me to deal with, High Fist. Leave it to them and to the gods. Both Rake and Brood were there at the chaining, after all. Meaning it's their mess? Bluntly, yes, it is. For which we're all paying, and might well pay the ultimate price before too long. I'll not see my army used as fodder in that particular game, Whiskey Jack. We were marching to crush the Panyan Domin, a mortal empire, as far as we could determine. Manipulation seems to be going on on both sides, Dujak. And am I to be comforted by that? The high fist glare was fierce. He held it on his second for another moment, then quaffed his ale. He thrust the empty goblet out. Whiskey Jack refilled it. We're hardly ones to complain of manipulation, he rumbled. Are we, friend? Dujek paused, then grunted. Indeed. Calm yourself, High Fist, Whiskey Jack thought. Think clear thoughts. Besides, Whiskey Jack continued, I have faith. In what? his commander snapped. In whom? Pray tell me. In a certain short, corpulent, odious little man. Crapper, have you lost your mind? Whiskey Jack smiled. Old friend. Look upon your own seething anger, your rage at this sense of being manipulated, used, possibly deceived. Now consider how an ascendant like Caladan Brood would feel, upon the realization that he is being manipulated. Enough to shatter the control of his temper? Enough to see him unlimber his hammer and seek to obliterate that smug, pompous puppet master? Dujek stood unmoving for a long time. Then a grin curved his lips. In other words, he took Crupper seriously. Darujistan, Whiskey Jack said. Our grand failure. Through it all, I had the sense that someone, somewhere, was orchestrating the whole damned thing. Not Anamanda Rake, not the Cabal, not Volcan and her assassins. Someone else. Someone so cleverly hidden, so appallingly capable that we were helpless, utterly helpless. And then, at the parley, we all discover who was responsible for Tattersell's rebirth. A silver fox, a child of a rivy woman, the seed planted and the birth managed within an unknown warren. The drawing together of threads. Nightchill, Belladan, Tattersell herself, and, it now appears, an elder god returned to the mortal realm. And, finally and most remarkably, the Talan I Mass. So, Tattersell, Nightchill, and Belladan, all of the Malazan Empire, reborn to a rivy woman of Brood's army, with a parley looming, the potential of a grand alliance. How hood damned convenient that a child should so bridge the camps? Barring Kalor, Dujek pointed out. Whiskey Jack slowly nodded. And Kalor has just been reminded of Brood's power, hopefully sufficiently to keep him in line. 
Is that what all this was about? Maybe. He demanded a demonstration, did he not? What Cropper manipulates is circumstance, somehow. I don't feel we are fated to dance as he wills. There is an elder god behind the Daru, but even there, I think it's more an alliance of mutual benefit, almost between equals. A partnership, if you will. Now, I'll grant you, all this is speculation on my part, but I'll tell you this. I have been manipulated before, as have you. But this time, it feels different, less inimical. Duchek, I sense compassion this time. An alliance of equals, the high fist muttered. Then he shook his head. What, then, does that make this crapper? Is he some god in disguise? A wizard of magnitude? An archmage? Whiskey Jack shrugged. My best guess. Crapper is a mortal man, but gifted with an intelligence that is singular in its prowess. And I mean that most literally. Singular, Dujek. If an elder god was suddenly flung back into this realm, would he not seek out, as his first ally, the greatest of minds? Dujek's face revealed disbelieving wonder. But Whiskey Jack, Crupper? Crupper, who gave us the Tregala Trade Guild, the only traders capable of supplying us on the route we chose to march. Crupper, who brought to the Maibi the surviving possessions of the first Rivi, for her to wear, and so diminish the pain she feels. And those ornaments are, I suspect, yet to fully flower. Crupper, the only one Silver Fox will speak with now that Paran is gone. And finally, Cropper, who has set himself in the crippled god's path. If just a mortal, then how did he survive Brood's wrath? Well, I expect his ally, the Elder God, would not wish to see the Daru killed. I guess there was intervention then. What else could it have been? Dujek emptied his goblet. Damn he sighed. All right. We ignore, as best we can, the crippled god. We remain focused on the Panyan Domin. Still, my friend, I mislike it. I can't help but be nervous in that we are not actively engaged in considering this new enemy. I don't think we are, I fist. Dujek's glance was sharp, searching, then his face twisted. Quick, Ben. Whiskey Jack slowly nodded. I think so. I'm not certain. Hood, I don't even know if he's still alive, but knowing Quick, he is. Very much alive. And given his agitation the last time I saw him, he's without illusions and anything but ignorant. And he's all we've got? To outwit the crippled god? High fist, if Crupper is this world's foremost genius... Then Quick Ben's but a step behind him. A very short step. They heard shouts outside the tent, then booted feet. A moment later, the standard bearer, Artanthos, pulled aside the flap and entered. Sirs, a lone moranth has been spotted, flying in from the northeast. It's Twist. Whiskey Jack rose, grunting at the cascade of aches and twinges the motion triggered. Queen of Dreams! We're about to receive some news. Let's hope it's cheering news, Dujek growled. I could do with some. Her face was pressed against the lichen-skinned stones, the roughness fading as her sweat soaked the ragged plant. Heart pounding, breaths coming in gasps, she lay whimpering, too tired to keep running, too tired to even so much as raise her head. The tundra of her dreams had revealed new enemies, not the band of strangers pursuing her this time. This time, she had been found by wolves. Huge, gaunt creatures, bigger than any she had ever seen in her waking life. They had loped into view on a ridge marking the skyline to the north. Eight long-legged, shoulder-hunched beasts, their fur sharing the muted shades of the landscape. The one in the lead had turned, as if catching her scent on the dry, cold wind. And the chase had begun. 
At first, the Maibi had reveled in the fleetness of her young, lithe legs. Swift as an antelope, faster than anything a mortal human could achieve, she had fled across the barren land. The wolves kept pace, tireless, the pack ranging out to the sides, one occasionally sprinting, darting in from one side or the other, forcing her to turn. Again and again, when she sought to remain between hills, on level land, the creatures somehow managed to drive her upslope. And she began to tire. The pressure never relented. Into her thoughts, amidst the burgeoning pain in her legs, the fire in her chest, and the dry, sharp agony of her throat, came the horrifying realization that escape was impossible. That she was going to die. Pulled down like any other animal doomed to become a victim of the wolves' hunger. For them, she knew, the sea of her mind, whipped now to a frenzied storm of panic and despair, meant nothing. They were hunters, and what resided within the soul of their quarry had no relevance. As with the antelope, the Bedouin calf, the ranag, grace and wonder, promise and potential, reduced one and all to meat. Life's final lesson, the only truthful one buried beneath a layered skein of delusions. Sooner or later, she now understood, we are all naught but food. Wolves or worms, the end abrupt or lingering, it mattered not in the least. Whimpering, half-blind, she staggered up yet another hillside. They were closer. She could hear their paws crunching through the wind-dried lichen and moss. To her right, to her left, closing, edging slightly ahead. Crying out, the Maibi stumbled, fell face first onto the rocky summit. She closed her eyes, waited for the first explosion of pain as teeth ripped into her flesh. The wolves circled. She listened to them. Circled, then began spiraling in. Closer. Closer. A hot breath gusted against the back of her neck. The Maibi screamed. And awoke. Above her, a fading blue sky, a passing hawk. Haze of dust from the herd drifting. In the air, distant voices, and much closer, the ragged, rattling sound of her own breathing. The wagon had stopped moving. The army was settling in for the night. She lay huddled, motionless beneath the furs and hides. A pair of voices were murmuring nearby. She smelled the smoke of a dung cook fire, smelled a herbal meaty broth, sage, a hint of goat. A third voice arrived, was greeted by the first two, all strangely indistinct, beyond her ability to identify. And not worth the effort, she thought. My watchers, my jailers. The wagon creaked. Someone crouched beside her. Sleep should not leave you so exhausted. No, Corlat, it should not. Please now, let me end this myself. No, here, Col has made a stew. I've no teeth left with which to chew. Just slivers of meat, easily swallowed, mostly broth. I'm not hungry. Nevertheless, Shall I help you sit up? Would take you, Corlat. <laughs> you and the rest, every one of you. Here, I will help you. Your good intentions are killing me. No, not killing. That's just it, isn't it? She grunted, feebly trying to twist away from Corlat's hands as the Tista Andy lifted her effortlessly into a sitting position. Torturing me. Your mercy, which is anything but. No, look not at my face, Corlat. She drew her hood tighter, lest I grow avid for the pity in your eyes. Where is this bowl? I will eat. Leave me. I will sit with you, my bee, Corlat replied. There are two bowls, after all. 
The rivy woman stared down at her own wrinkled, pocked, skeletal hands, then at the bowl clutched between them, the watery broth with its slivers of wine-stained meat. See this? The butcher of the goat, the slayer. Did he or she pause at the desperate cries of the animal, look into its pleading eyes, hesitate with the knife? In my dreams, I am as that goat. This is what you curse me to. The slaughter of the goat was Rivy, Corlat said after a moment. You and I know that ritual well, might be. Propitiation, calling upon the merciful spirit whose embrace is necessity. You and I both know how that spirit comes upon the goat, or indeed any such creature whose body shall feed your people, whose skin shall clothe you. And so the beast does not cry out, does not plead. I have witnessed and wondered, for it is indeed a remarkable thing. Unique to the rivy, not in its intent, but in its obvious efficacy. It is as if the ritual's arriving spirit shows the beast a better future, something beyond the life it's known to that point. Lies, the maybe murmured. The spirit deceives the poor creature, to make the slaying easier. Corlat fell silent. The Mybe raised the bowl to her lips. Perhaps, even then, the Tista and E resumed, the deception is a gift of mercy. There is no such thing, the Mybe snapped. Words to comfort the killer and his kin and naught else. Dead is dead as the bridge-burners are wont to say. Those soldiers know the truth of it. Children of the Malazan Empire hold no illusions. They are not easily charmed. You seem to know much of them. Two marines come to visit occasionally. They've taken it upon themselves to guard my daughter, and to tell me of her, since no one else has a mind to, and I cherish them for that. I did not know this. It alarms you? Have terrible secrets been revealed to me? Will you now put a stop to it? A hand closed on her shoulder. I wish you would at least look upon my face, Maybe. No, I will do no such thing. Nor am I aware of any dire secrets being kept from you. Indeed, I now wish to seek out these two marines, to thank them. Leave them be, Corlat. They do not ask for thanks. They are simple soldiers, two women of the Empire. Through them, I know that Krupa visits Silver Fox regularly. He's taken on the role of kindly uncle, perhaps. Such a strange man, endearing despite the terrible curse he has laid upon me. Curse? Oh. Might be. Of all that I have seen of Krupper, I can tell you, he is not one to curse anyone. I do not believe he ever imagined what the rebirthing of Tattersail would mean to you. So very true, that. I understand it well, you see. He was called upon by the Elder God, who either chose to become involved or was so already. An abomination had been created, as Kalor has called it and it was an abomination in fact. The withered corpse of Nightchill, Tattersail's soul trapped within it, the apparition webbed by Talan Imas sorcery, a nightmare creation. The Elder God sought to save it somehow, in some form, and for that it seemed like he needed Krupper. Thus, the Daru did all he could, believing it to be a mercy, but make no mistake now, Corlat. Cropper and his elder god have decided to make use of the child they fashioned. Opportunistic or deliberate from the start? Does it matter? And lo, Cropper now walks with Silver Fox. Do they conspire? Am I blind? Conspire? To what end, might be? You don't know. I find that hard to believe. Clearly, 
you have concluded we are all conspiring against you. Aren't you? With all the strength she could muster, the Maibi flung the bowl away, heard it splash, bounce off something, heard a shout of surprise from Marilio, who, it seemed, had the misfortune to be in its path of flight. Guard me, she hissed. Feed me. Watch me so I don't take my own life. And this is not a conspiracy. And my daughter, my own daughter, does she visit? No. When have I last seen her face? When? I can barely remember the time. The hand tightened on her shoulder. Corlat's voice, when she spoke, was low yet taut. I hear you, my friend. I shall get to the bottom of this. I shall discover the truth, and then I shall tell you. This I promise, Maybe. Then tell me, what has happened? Earlier today, I felt something, an event. Cole and Marilio spoke of a scene between Kruppa and Brood. Tell me, where was Silver Fox in all this? She was there, Callout replied. She joined me as I rode forward in answer to Whiskey Jack's summons. I will be honest, Maybe. Something did occur before the clash between Brood and Kruppa. Your daughter has found protectors, but she will not extend that protection to you. For some reason she believes you are in danger. Now, I do not know the source. Yet I do, the Maibi thought. Oh, Corlat, your friendship for me has blinded you. I am in danger indeed, from myself. Protectors? Who? Or what? Corlat drew a deep breath, let it out slowly. Silver Fox asked that I say nothing to you of them. I could not understand why, yet I acquiesced. I realized now that to do so was wrong. Wrong to you, might be. A conspiracy, and I shall not be party to it. Your daughter's protectors were wolves. Ancient, giant beasts. Terror ripped through the Maibi. Snarling, she flung a hand at Corlat's face, felt her nails tear through skin. My hunters, she screamed as the Tista and Eve flinched away. They want to kill me, my daughter. My daughter, she thought, plaguing my dreams. Spirits below, she wants to kill me. Cole and Marilio had leapt onto the wagon, were shouting in alarm even as Corlat hissed at them to calm down. But the Maibi ceased hearing them, ceased seeing anything of the world surrounding her at that moment. She continued thrashing, nails clawing the air, betrayal searing through her chest, turning her heart into ashes. My daughter! My daughter! And my voice, it whimpers. And my eyes, they plead. And that knife is in her hands, and in her gaze there is naught but cold, cold intent. Whiskey Jack's half-smile vanished when he turned upon Corlat's arrival. To see that her eyes were as white-hot iron, to see as she stalked through the tent's entrance four parallel slashes on her right cheek, wet with blood that had run down to the line of her jaw, and now dripped onto the rushes covering the floor. The Malazan almost stepped back as the Tista Andy strode towards him. Corlat, what has happened? Hear my words, lover, the woman grated in an icy voice. Whatever secrets you have withheld from me, about Tattersail Reborn, about those damned Talan I, about what you've instructed those two marines guarding the child to say to the Maybe, you will tell me. Now! He felt himself grow cold, felt his face twitch at the full thrust of her fury. Instructions? he asked quietly. I have given them no instructions, not even to guard Silver Fox. What they've done has been their own decision. What they might have said, that it should lead to this? Well, I shall accept responsibility for that, for I am their commander. And I assure you, if punishment is required, stop. 
A moment, please. Something had settled within her, and now she trembled. Whiskey Jack thought to take her in his arms, but held back. She needed comfort, he sensed, but his instincts told him she was not yet ready to receive it. He glanced around, found a relatively clean handcloth, soaked it in a basin, then held it out to her. She had watched in silence, the shade of her eyes deepening to slate grey, but she made no effort to accept the cloth. He slowly lowered his hand. Why? Callad asked. Did Silver Fox insist that her mother not learn of the Talan Eye? I have no idea, Callad, beyond the explanation she voiced. At the time, I thought you knew. You thought I knew? He nodded. You thought that I had been keeping from you a secret, something to do with Silver Fox and her mother? Whiskey Jack shrugged. Were you planning to confront me? No. Her eyes widened on him. Silence stretched, then... For hood's sake, clean my wounds. Relieved, he stepped closer and began, with the gentlest of touches, to daub her cuts. Who struck you? he asked quietly. The Maibi. I think I've just made a dreadful mistake, for all my good intentions. That's often the case, he murmured, with good intentions. Corlat's gaze narrowed searchingly. Pragmatic Malazans, clear-eyed indeed. Why do we keep thinking of you as just soldiers? Brood, Rake, Kalor, myself, we all look upon you and Dujek and your army as something ancillary. A sword we hope to grasp in our hands when the need arrives. It seems now that we're all fools. In fact, not one of us has come to realize the truth of how things now stand. He frowned. And how do they now stand? You have become our backbone. Somehow you are what gives us our strength, holds us together. Oh, I know you possess secrets, Whiskey Jack. He smiled wryly. Not as many as you seem to think. I will tell you the biggest one. It's this. We feel outmatched. By you, by Rake, by Caladan Brood, by Kalor, by the Tista and E army, and that of the Rivi and the Bargast. Good, even that mob of mercenaries accompanying you makes us nervous. We don't have your power. We're just an army. Our best wizard isn't even ranked. He's a squad mage. And right now he's very far away, and, I suspect, feeling like a fly in a web. So, come the battles, we know we'll be the spear's head, and it's going to cost us dear. As for the seer himself, and whatever hides behind him, well, we're now hoping you'll deal with that. Same goes for the crippled god. You're right, Corlat. We're just soldiers. Tired ones at that. If we're this combined army's backbone, then, who'd help us, it's a bowed, brittle one. She reached up and laid her hand over his, pressed it against her cheek. Their eyes locked. Bowed and brittle? I think not. Whiskey Jack shook his head. I'm not being modest, Corlat. I speak the truth, though I fear you're not prepared to hear it. Silver Fox is manipulating her mother the Tista Andy said after a moment. Somehow, possibly even being responsible for the old woman's terrible nightmares. I find that hard to countenance. Not something Tattersale would do, right? But what of this night, Jill? Or the Thelomen? You knew them, Whiskey Jack. Better than any of us, at least. Is it possible that one of them, or both, are responsible for this? He said nothing while he completed wiping clean the wounds on her cheek. This will require a healer's touch, Corlat, lest infection. Whiskey Jack? He sighed, stepped back. Night chill, I fear, might well harbor feelings of betrayal. Her targets for vengeance could be chosen indiscriminately. Same for Belladan Skullcrusher. Both were betrayed, after all. If you are right, 
about what's happening to the Maibi, that they're doing something to her, then I still think that Tatasel would be resisting them. What if she's already lost the struggle? I've seen no sign of it. Corlett's eyes flashed, and she jabbed a finger against his chest. Meaning your two marines have reported no sign of it? He grimaced. They are volunteers nonetheless, Corlett. Given the alarming extent of our ignorance in these matters, it pays to be watchful. Those two marines chose to guard Silver Fox because they see in her Tattersail. Not just physically, but in the woman's personality as well. If anything had gone awry, they would have noticed it, and they would have come to me. Fast. Corlatt lowered her head. She sighed. And here I've come storming in to tear your head from your shoulders. Damn you, Whiskey Jack. How did I come to deserve you? And, the abyss take me, why are you still here, after all my accusations? A few hours ago, Dujek made a similar entrance. He grinned. It's just been that kind of day, I suppose. Now, we should call for a healer. In a moment, she studied him. Whiskey Jack, you've truly no idea of how rare a man you are, do you? Rare? His grin broadened. Of course I know. There's only one of me, thank Hood. That's not what I meant. He moved closer and drew an arm about her waist. Time to find a healer woman. I've got simple needs, and we're wasting time. A soldier's reply, she said. I'm not fooled, you know. Unseen by her, he closed his eyes. Oh, but you are, Corlatt, Whiskey Jack thought. If you'd known the full extent of my fear, that I might lose you. Arms waving expansively, Cropper, Eel of Darugistan, Occasional Fence and Thief, Defier of Caladan Brood, the Warlord, ambled his way down the main avenue of tents towards the supply wagons. He had just come from the cook tent of the Moth Irregulars, and in each hand was a nathy black cake, dripping with syrup. A few paces in his wake, his mule kept pace, nose stretched out to those two cakes, ears pricked forward. The second bell since midnight had just tolled through the camps, stirring the distant herds of Bedarin to a mournful lowing, which faded as the beasts slipped back into slumber. As he reached the edge of the wagons, arranged rectangularly to form a wheeled fort, he noted two Malazan marines, cloaks wrapped about their bodies, sitting before a small dung fire. Crupper altered his course and approached. Gentle friends, he softly called. Tis late, and no doubt your pretty selves are due for some sweetness. The two women glanced up. Ha, huh, one of them grunted. It's that fat Daru. And his mule, hovering there in the shadows. Unique indeed is Crupper. Behold, he thrust forward the dripping cakes. For you, darlings. So which should we eat, the cakes or your hands? The other drew her knife at her companion's words. A couple of quick cuts, and we can choose for ourselves, right? Cropper stepped back. Queen of dreams, hard-bitten and distinctly unfeminine. Guardians of fair silver fox, yes? Reassuring truth. Heart of Tattersail. Shining so bright from the child now woman. Aye, we seen you before plenty enough. Chatting with the lass. She's the sorceress, all right. Plain to see for them of us who knew her. Extraordinary disconnectiveness, this exchange. Grubba is delighted. We getting them syrup cakes or what? Naturally, though the flash of that blade still blinds generous Grubba. You ain't got no sense of humour, have you? Join us, if you dare. The Daru smiled and strode forward. Nathy black cakes, my dears. We recognise them. The more irregulars used to throw them at us when they ran out of arrows. Jaybar got one full in the face, as I recall. That he did. Then he stumbled, and when he came up, he was like the forest floor with eyes. Dreadful sap. Deadly weapon. 
Krupper agreed, once more offering the cakes to the two marines. They took them. Courageous task, protection of the Rivy lass. She ain't no Rivy lass. She's Tattersail. That fur and the hides are just for show. Ah, then you have spoken with her. Not much, and we don't need to. These cakes go down better without all the twigs and leaves, don't they just? Cropper blinked, then slowly nodded. No doubt. Vast responsibility, being the eyes of your commander, regarding said lass. Both women paused in their chewing. They exchanged a glance. Then one of them swallowed and said, Who? Do, Jack. If we're his eyes, then, he's blind as a mole. Ah, Cropper meant Whiskey Jack, of course. Whiskey Jack ain't blind, and he don't need us to see for him either. Nonetheless, the Daru smiled, he no doubt is greatly comforted by your self-appointed task and reports and such. Were Cropper Whiskey Jack? He knows he would. Would what? Why, be comforted, of course. Both women grunted. Then one snorted and said, That's a good one. If you were Whiskey Jack, ha! A figure of speech. Ain't no such thing, Fatty. You trying to walk in Whiskey Jack's footsteps? Trying to see through his eyes? Ha! I'll say, the other woman agreed. Ha! And so you did, Crupper noted. Did what? Agree. Damn right. Whiskey Jack should have been Emperor when the old one got knocked off, not Lassine. But she knew who her rival was, didn't she just? That's why she stripped him of rank, turned him into a hood damn sergeant and sent him away, far away. An ambitious man, this Whiskey Jack, then. Not in the least, Daru, and that's the whole point. Would have made a good emperor, I said. Not wanting the job is the best and only qualification worth considering. A curious assertion, dear. I ain't. Pardon? You ain't? What? Curious. Listen, the Malazan Empire would be a far different thing if Whiskey Jack had taken the throne all those years ago. If he'd done what we all wanted him to do and grabbed Lassine by the scruff of the neck and sent her through a tower window. And was he capable of such a remarkable feat? The two marines looked confused. One turned to her companion. Seen him out of his boots? The other shook her head. No, still, they might be remarkable. Why not? Then it'd be a boot to the backside, but I said by the scruff of the neck. Well, feet that could do that would be remarkable, wouldn't they? You got a point, friend. Ahem, <clears throat> Crupper interrupted. A remarkable feat, dears, as in achievement. Oh. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Got it. So you're asking, could he have done it, if he'd a mind to? Sure. Not good to cross Whiskey Jack. And if that's not enough, he's got wits. So why, then, Grupper asks in wonder, did he not do so at the time? Because he's a soldier, you idiot. Lassine's taking the throne was messy enough. The whole empire was shaky. People start stabbing and jumping into a blood-wet throne. And sometimes it don't stop. Sometimes it's like dominoes, right? One after another after another, and the whole thing falls apart. He was the one we all looked to, right? Waiting to see how he'd take it, Lassine and all that. And when he just saluted and said, Yes, Empress, well, things just settled back down. He was giving her a chance, you see. Of course. And do you lasses now believe he made a mistake? The women shrugged in unison. Don't matter now, one said. We're here, and here's here, and that's that. So be it, and so be it, Gruppa said, rising with a sigh. Wondrous conversation. Gruppa thanks you, and will now take his leave. Right. Thanks for the cakes. Gruppa's pleasure. Good night, dears. He ambled off, back towards the supply wagons. As he disappeared into the gloom, the two marines said nothing for a time, busy as they were licking the sap from their fingers. Then one sighed.
The other followed suit. Well, hi, that was damned easy. Think so? Sure. He came expecting to find two brains and found barely one. Still, it might have babbled too much. That's the nature of half-brains, love. To do otherwise would have made him suspicious. What do you figure he and Tattersail talk about, anyway? The old woman, is my guess. I'd figure the same. They've got something in the works. My suspicions exactly. And Tattersail's in charge. So she is. Which is good enough for me. Same here. You know, that black cake wasn't quite the same without the twigs and leaves. That's odd. I was just thinking the same thing. Within the wheeled ford, Cropper approached another campfire. The two men huddled around it, looked up as he arrived. What's with your hands? Marilio asked. All that Grappa touches sticks to him, my friend. Well, Cole rumbled, we've known that for years. And what's with that damned mule? Marilio inquired. The beast haunts me in truth, but never mind that. Grappa has had an interesting discourse with two marines, and he is pleased to inform that the last silver fox is in capable hands indeed. Sticky as yours? They are, dear Morillo. They are now. What you say is fine enough, Cole said. But is it any help to us? There's an old woman sleeping in yon wagon whose broken heart is the least of her pains. And it's bad enough to break the strongest man, let alone a frail ancient. Grappa is pleased to assure you that matters of vast mercy are in progress. Momentary appearances are to be discounted. Then why not tell her that? Cole growled, nodding towards the Mybe's wagon. Ah, but she is not ready to receive such truths, alas. This is a journey of the spirit. She must begin it within herself. Grappa and Silver Fox can only do so much, despite our apparent omnipotence. Omnipotence, is it? Cole shook his head. Yesterday, and I'd laugh at that claim. So you faced down Caladan Brood, did you? I'm interested in precisely how you managed that, you damned toad. Cropper's brows rose. Dear boon companion, call. Your lack of faith crushes frail Cropper to his very toes, which are themselves wriggling in anguish. For heart's sake, don't show us, Marilio said. You've been wearing those slippers for as long as I've known you, Cropper. Poliel herself would balk at what might lurk likely between them. And well she would. To answer Cole with succinct precision, Cropper proclaims that anger, nay, rage, has no efficacy against one such as himself, for whom the world is as a pearl nestled within the slimy confines of his honed and muscled brain. Ah, uh, perhaps the illusion falters with second thought, and worse with third. A crupper tries again. For whom, it was said, the world is naught but a plumage to dream of colours and wonders unimagined, where even time itself has lost meaning. Uh, speaking of which, it's very late, yes? Sleep beckons. The stream of calm transubstantiation that metamorphoses oblivion into reparation and rejuvenation. And that alone is wonder enough for one and all to close this fitful night. He fluttered his hands in a final wave and walked off. After a moment, the mule trotted in his wake. The two men stared after him. Would that brute's hammer connected with that oily pate? Cole rumbled after a moment. It'd likely slip, Marilio said. Aye, true enough. Muscles and brains and cheesy toes by the abyss. I think I'm going to be sick. High above the camp, Crone crooked her weary leaden wings and spiraled down towards the warlord's tent. Despite her exhaustion, shivers of excitement and curiosity ran through her. 
The fissure to the north of the encampment still bled Burns fouled blood. The Great Raven had felt that detonation when still over the Vision Mountains far to the southeast, and had instantly known it for what it was. Caladan broods anger. Kiss of the hammer, and with it an explosive reshaping of the natural world. She could see despite the darkness, and the shapely defined spine of a basaltic mountain range loomed where no mountains belonged, here at the heart of the Catlin Plain, and the sorcery emanating from the blood of the sleeping goddess. It too, Crone recognized. The touch of the crippled god. Within Burn's veins, a transformation was taking place. The Fallen One was making her blood his own. And that is a taste I know well, for it was as mother's milk to me so very long ago, Crone thought. To me and to my kin. Changes had come to the world below, and Crone reveled in changes. Her soul and that of her kin had been stirred once more to acute wakefulness. She had never felt more alive. Slipping beneath the warm thermals, she descended, bobbing on pockets of cool air, echoes of the traumatic disturbance that had churned through the atmosphere at the eruption of Brood's fury, then sliding down to land with a soft thump on the earth before the warlord's tent. No light showed within. Faintly cackling, Crone hopped beneath the half-hitched entrance flap. Not a word, Brood rumbled from the darkness, about my temper's snapped leash. The great raven cocked her head towards the cot. The warlord was seated on its edge, head in his hands. As you wish, Crone murmured. Make your report. I shall. First, from Anamanda Rake. He has succeeded. Moonspawn has passed unseen and now hides. My children are ranging far over the lands of the Panion Seer. Warlord, not just their eyes have witnessed the truth of all that lies below. I myself have seen, save those details for later. Moonspawn is in place. Good. Did you fly to Kapustan as I requested? I did, Grave One, and was witness to the first day and first night of battle. Your assessment, Crone. The city will not hold, Warlord, though no fault of the defenders. What opposes them is too vast. Brood grunted. Perhaps we should have reconsidered Dujek's disposition of the Black Maranth. Ah, they too are emplaced, precisely where one arm wanted them to be. Crone hesitated, turning first one eye, then the other towards Caladan Brood. One unusual detail must be uttered now, Warlord. Will you hear it? Very well. The seer wages a war to the south. Brood's head snapped up. I, Crone nodded. My children have seen Domin armies routed and retreating north, to Outlook itself. The seer has unleashed formidable sorceries against the unknown enemy. Rivers of ice, walls of ice, blistering cold, winds and storms. It has been a long time since we have witnessed said particular Warren unveiled. Umptos Velak. The Warren of the Jaggart. Even so. Warlord, you seem less surprised by that than I had anticipated. Of a war to the south, I am indeed surprised, Crone. He rose, drawing a fur blanket about his shoulders, and began pacing. Of Omtos Felak? No, I am not surprised. Thus, the seer is not as he seems. Evidently not. Rake and I had suspicions. Well, Crone snapped, had I known them, I would have more closely examined the situation at Outlook. Your recalcitrance wounds us all. With no proof, Crone. Besides, we value your feathered hide too highly to risk your close approach to an unknown enemy's fastness. It is done. Tell me, does the seer remain in Outlook? My kin were unable to determine that. There are condors in the area, and they did not appreciate our presence. Why should mundane birds cause you trouble? Not entirely mundane. Aye, mortal birds are little more than feathered lizards. But these particular condors 
were more lizard than most. The seer's own eyes? Possibly. That could prove troublesome. Crone shrugged with her wings half-crooked. Have you some slivers of meat? I hunger. There's leftover goat from supper in the refuse pit behind the tent. What? You would have me eat from a refuse pit? You're a damned raven, Crone. Why not? Outrage! But if that's all there is, it is. Clucking to contain her fury, Crone hopped towards the tent's back wall. Take me as an example in the future, she murmured as she began edging her way under the fabric. What do you mean? Brood asked behind her. She ducked her head back inside, opened her beak in a silent laugh, then replied, Did I lose my temper? Growling, he stepped towards her. The great raven squawked and fled. Chapter 16 the first child of the Dead Sea dreams of a father's dying breath, and hears an eternal refrain, the scream trapped in his lungs. Dare you step behind his eyes, even for a moment? The first child of the Dead Sea leads an army of sorrow down hunger's bone-picked road, where a mother dances and sings. Dare you walk in his steps and dearly hold her hand? The first child of the dead seed is sheathed in the clutter of failed armor, defending him from the moment of birth through years of dire schooling. Do not dare judge him hard, lest you wear his skin. Silver of the Shattered Heart, Ker Alas The Teniskari rose like an inexorable flood against every wall of the city. Rose, then swept over a mass of humanity driven mad by hunger. Gate barricades buckled to the pressure, then gave way. And Kapustan drowned. Four hundred paces from the barracks, Itkovian wheeled his blood-spattered mount. Figures reached up from below, clawed along the horse's armoured limbs. The beast, in cold fury, stamped down repeatedly, crushing bones, caving in chests and heads. Three manes of grey swords surrounded the shield anvil, where they had been cut off from the barracks atop the gentle hill that was the cemetery of pillars. Most of those upright coffins had been toppled, shattering to spill their mouldy, cloth-wrapped contents, now jumbled among their cousins in death. Itkovian could see the barracks gate, against which bodies were piled high, high enough to climb, which is what scores of tennis cowry were doing, clambering up towards the flanking revetments only to be met by the serrated blades of long-handled pikes. Pikes that killed, that wounded peasants who made no effort to defend themselves, that whipped back and forth trailing banners of blood and gore. Itkovian had never witnessed such a horrifying sight. For all his battles, for all the terrors of combat, and all that a soldier could not help but see, the vision before him swept all else from his mind. As peasants fell back, tumbled their way down the slope of corpses, women leapt at the men among them, tore at their clothing, pinned them in place with straddled legs, and amidst blood, amidst shrieks and clawing fingers, they raped them. Along the edges of the dead and dying, others fed on their kin. Twin nightmares. The shield anvil was unable to decide which of the two shook him the most, his blood flowed glacial cold in his veins, and he knew, with dread verging on panic, that the assault had but just begun. Another wave surged to close with the hapless band of greyswords in the cemetery. To all sides, the wide avenues and streets were packed solid with frenzied tennis cowry. All eyes were fixed on Itkovian and his soldiers. Hands reached out towards them, no matter what the distance and hungrily clawed the air. Locking shields, the grey swords reformed their tattered square surrounding the shield anvil. It would be swallowed, Itkovian well knew, as it had been only moments earlier. Yet, if his silent soldiers could do as they had done once before, the square would rise again from the sea of bodies, cutting its way clear, flinging the enemy back, 
clambering atop a newly made hill of flesh and bone. And if Itkovian could remain on his horse, he would sweep his sword down on all sides, killing all who came within his reach, and those whom he wounded would then die beneath his mount's iron-clad hooves. He had never before delivered such slaughter, and it sickened him, filled his heart with an overwhelming hatred for the seer. To have done such a thing to his own people, and for Septarch Kulpath, for his bloodless cruelty in sending these hapless peasants into the maw of a desperate army. Even more galling, the tactic looked likely to succeed. Yet at a cost beyond comprehension, Itkovian thought. With a roar, the Teniskari attacked. The first to reach the bristling square were cut to pieces. Reeling, shrieking, they were pulled back by their comrades, into a devouring midst that was even more vicious than the enemy they'd faced when in the front line. Others pushed ahead to suffer an identical fate. Yet still more came, climbing the backs of the ones before them, now whilst others clambered over their own shoulders. For the briefest of moments, Itkovian stared at a three-tiered wall of savage humanity. Then it collapsed inward, burying the grey swords. The square buckled beneath the weight. Weapons were snagged. Shields were pulled down, helms ripped from heads, and everywhere the shield anvil looked, there was blood. Figures scrambled over the heaving surface. Cleavers and hatchets and knives swung down in passing, but Idkovian was their final target, as he knew he would be. The shield anvil readied his broadsword and shield. A slight shift in the pressure of his legs began turning his mount into a ceaseless spin. The beast's head tossed, then ducked low to defend its throat. The armor covering its brow, neck, and chest was already smeared and dented. Hooves stamped, eager to find living flesh. The first peasant came within range. Itkovian swung his sword, watched a head spin away from its body, watched as the body shivered and twitched before crumpling. The horse lashed out its hind hooves, connecting with crunching thumps, then the animal righted itself and reared, iron-shod front hooves kicking and clawing, dragging a screaming woman down. Another tennis cowry leapt to grab one of the horse's front legs. Itkovian leaned forward and drove his sword against the man's lower back, cutting deep enough to sever his spine. The horse spun, the leg flinging the corpse away. Head snapped forward, teeth cracking down on a peasant's hair-matted pate punching through bone to pull back with a mouthful of hair and skull. Hands clawed against Itkovian's thigh on his shield side. He twisted, swung down against his mount's withers. The blade had chopped through muscle and clavicle. Blood and meat reeled away. His horse kicked again, bit and stamped and whirled, but hands and pressure and weight were on all sides now. Itkovian's sword flashed, whipped blindly, yet never failed to find a target. Someone climbed up onto the horse's rump behind him. He arched his back, gauntleted hands swinging up over his own head, point driving downward behind him. He arched his back, gauntleted hands swinging up over his own head, point driving downward behind him. He felt the edge slice its way through skin and flesh, skitter along ribs, then punch down into lower belly. A flood of bile and blood slicked the back of his saddle. The figure slid away. He snapped a command, and the horse ducked its head. Itkovin swung his weapon in a sweeping horizontal slash. Cutting, glancing contact stuttered its entire path. His mount pivoted, and the shield anvil reversed the slash. Spun again, and Itkovin whipped the sword again. Man and beast turned in a full circle in this fashion, a circle delivering dreadful wounds. Through the blistering heat beneath his visored helm, Itkovian gained a fragmented collection of the scene on all sides. There would be no rising from his grey swords. Not this time. Indeed, he could not see a single familiar surcoat. The tennis cowry closed on the shield anvil from all sides, a man's height's worth of bodies under their feet. And somewhere beneath that heaving surface were Itkovian's soldiers, buried alive. Buried dying, buried dead. He and his horse were all that remained, the focus of hundreds upon hundreds of avid, desperate eyes. 
captured pikes were being passed forward to those peasants nearest him. In moments, those long-handled weapons would begin jabbing in on all sides. Against this, neither Itkovian's nor his horse's armor would be sufficient. Twin tusks, I am yours, he thought. To this, the last moment. Break! His warhorse was waiting for that command. The beast surged forward, hooves, chest, and shoulders battered through the press. Itkovian carved his blade down on both sides. Figures reeled, parted, disappeared beneath the churning hooves. Pikes slashed out at him, skittered along armor and shield. The ones to his right he battered aside with his sword. Something punched into the small of his back, snapping the links of his chain, twisting and gouging through leather and felt padding. Agony lanced through Itkovian as the jagged point drove through skin and grated against his lowest rib, close to the spine. At the same moment, the horse screamed as it stumbled onto the point of another pike, the iron head plunging deep into the right side of its chest. The animal lurched to the left, staggering, head dipping, jaws snapping at the shaft. Someone leapt onto Itkovian's shield, swung over it a woodsman's hatchet. The wedged blade buried itself deep between his left shoulder and neck, where it jammed. The shield anvil jabbed the point of his sword into the peasant's face. The blade carved into one cheek, exited out through the other. Itkovian twisted the blade, his own visored face inches from his victim's, as his sword destroyed her youthful visage. Gurgling, she toppled back. He could feel the weight of the pike, its head still buried in his back, heard it clatter along the horse's rump armor as the beast slewed and pitched. A fishmonger's knife found the unprotected underside of his left knee, searing up into the joint. Itkovian chopped weakly down with the lower edge of his shield, barely sufficient to push the attacker away. The thin blade snapped, the six inches remaining in his knee grinding and slicing through tendon and cartilage. Blood filled the space between his calf and the felt padding sheathing it. The shield anvil felt no pain. Brutal clarity commanded his thoughts. His god was with him, now, at this final moment. With him, and with the brave, indomitable warhorse beneath him. The beast's sideways lurch ceased as the animal, pike plucked free, righted itself, despite the blood that now gushed down its chest. The animal leapt forward, crushing bodies under it, kicked and clawed and clambered its way towards what seemed, impossibly to Itkovian's eyes, a cleared avenue, a place where only motionless bodies waited. The shield anvil, comprehending at last what he was seeing, renewed his efforts. The enemy was melting away, on all sides. Screams and the clash of iron echoed wildly in Itkovian's helmet. A moment later, and the horse stumbled clear, hooves lashing out as it reared, not in rage this time, but in triumph. Pain arrived as Itkovian sagged onto the animal's armored neck, pain like nothing he had known before. The pike remained embedded in his back, the broken knife blade in the heart of his left knee, the hatchet buried in the shattered remains of his collarbone. Jaws clenched, he managed to quell his mounts pitching about, succeeded in pivoting the animal round, to face, once more, the cemetery. Disbelieving. He saw his grey swords carving their way free of the bodies that had buried them, rising as if from a barrow of corpses, silent as ghosts, their movements jerky, as if they were clawing their way awake after a horrifying nightmare. Only a dozen were visible, yet that was twelve more than the shield anvil had thought possible. Boots thumped up to Itkovian. Blinking gritty sweat from his eyes, he tried to focus on the figures closing in around him. Grey swords. Battered and stained surcoats, the young, pale faces of Capan recruits. Then, on a horse to match Itkovian's own, the mortal sword. Brukalian, black armored, his black hair a wild, blood matted mane, Fainus' holy sword in one huge, gauntleted hand. He'd raised his visor. Dark eyes were fixed on the shield anvil. Apologies, sir. Brucalian rumbled as he drew rein beside him, for our tardiness. 
Behind the mortal sword, Hidkovian now saw Carnadus hurrying forward. His face, drawn and pale as a corpse's, was nevertheless beautiful to the shield anvil's eyes. The strength, he gasped, weaving on his saddle. My horse, sir. My soldiers. Fena is with me, sir, Carnadus replied in a trembling voice. And so shall I answer you. The world darkened then. Itkovin felt the sudden tug of hands beneath him, as if he had fallen into their embrace. Pondering that, his thoughts drifted. My horse, my soldiers, then closed into oblivion. They battered down the flimsy shutters, pushed in through the rooms above the ground floor. They slithered through the tunnel of packed bodies that had once been stairwells. Gruntle's iron fangs were blunt, nicked, and gouged. They'd become ragged clubs in his hands. He commanded the main hallway and was slowly, methodically, creating barricades of cooling flesh and broken bone. No weariness weighed down his arms or dulled his acuity. His breathing remained steady, only slightly deeper than usual. His forearms showed a strange pattern of bloodstains, barbed and striped, the blood blackening and seeming to seep into his skin. He was indifferent to it. There were seerdumin, scattered here and there within the human tide of Teneskari, probably pulled along without volition. Gruntle cut down peasants in order to close with them. It was his only desire, to close with them, to kill them. The rest was chaff, irritating, getting in the way, impediments to what he wanted. Had he seen his own face, he would barely recognize it. Blackened stripes spread away from his eyes and bearded cheeks. Tawny amber streaked the beard itself. His eyes were the color of sun-withered prairie grass. His militia was a hundred strong now, silent figures who were as extensions of his will, unquestioning, looking upon him with awe. Their faces shone when he settled his gaze on them. He did not wonder at that either, did not realize that the illumination he saw was reflected, that they but mirrored the pale, yet strangely tropical emanation of his eyes. Gruntle was satisfied. He was answering all that had been visited upon Stoney. She now fought alongside his second-in-command, that small, wiry, Lestari soldier, holding the tenement block's rear stairwell. They'd met but once since withdrawing to this building hours earlier. And it had shaken him, jarred him in a deep place within himself, and it was as if he had been shocked awake, as if all this time his soul had been hunkered down within him, hidden, silent, whilst an unknown implacable force now ruled his limbs, rode the blood that pumped through him. She was broken still, the bravado torn away to reveal a human visage, painfully vulnerable, profoundly wounded in its heart. The recognition had triggered a resurgence of cold desire within Gruntle. She was the debt he had only begun to pay. And whatever had rattled her upon their meeting once more, well, no doubt she had somehow comprehended his desire's bared fangs and unsheathed claws. A reasonable reaction, only troubling in so far as it deserved to be. The decrepit ancient Daru tenement now housed a storm of death whipping winds of rage, terror, and agony, twisting and churning through every hallway, in every room, no matter how small. It flowed vicious and without surcease. It matched in every detail the world of Gruntle's mind, the world within the confines of his skull. There existed no contradictions between the reality of the outer world and that of his inner landscape. This truth beggared comprehension. It could only be grasped instinctively a visceral understanding glimpsed by less than a handful of Gruntle's followers, the Lestari lieutenant among them. He knew he had entered a place devoid of sanity, knew, somehow, that he and the rest of the militia now existed more within the mind of Gruntle than they did in the real world. They fought with skills they had never before possessed. They did not tire. They did not shout, scream, or even so much as bark commands or rallying cries. 
There was no need for rallying cries. No one broke. No one was routed. Those that died fell where they had stood, silent as automatons. Hallways were chest deep in bodies on the ground floor. Some rooms could not even be entered. Blood ran through these presses like a crimson river running beneath the surface of the land, seeping amidst hidden gravel lenses, pockets of sand, buried boulders. Seeped, here in this dread building, around bone and meat and armor and boots and sandals and weapons and helms. Reeking like a sewer, thick as the flow in a surgeon's trench. The attackers finally staggered back, withdrew down almost block stairwells, clawed out of the windows. Thousands more waited outside, but the retreat clogged the approaches. A moment of peace settled within the building. Light-headed and weaving as he clambered his way up the main hallway, the Lestari lieutenant found Gruntle. His master's striped arms glistened, the blades of his cutlasses were yellowed white, fangs in truth now, and he swung a savagely feline visage to the Lestari. We surrender this floor now, Gruntle said, shaking the blood from his blades. The hacked remains of Seerdomin surrounded the caravan captain. Armored warriors literally chopped to pieces. The lieutenant nodded. We're out of room to maneuver. Gruntle shrugged his massive shoulders. We've two more floors above us. Then the roof. Their eyes locked for a long moment, and the lieutenant was both chilled and warmed by what he saw within the vertical slits of Gruntle's pupils. A man to fear. A man to follow. A man to love, the Lestari thought. You are Trake's mortal sword, he said. The huge Daru frowned. Stony Manakis. She bears but minor injuries, Captain, and has moved up to the next landing. Good. Weighed down with sacks of food and drink, the militia was converging, the command to do so unspoken as it had been unspoken every time the gathering occurred. More than twenty had fallen in this last engagement, the Lestari saw. We lose this many with each floor. By the time we reach the roof, there'll be but a score of us. Well, that should be more than enough to hold a single trapdoor. Hold it until the abyss of final night. The silent followers were collecting serviceable weapons, scraps of armor mostly from the Seerdomin. The Lestari watched with dull eyes a Capan woman pick up a gauntleted hand, severed raggedly at the wrist by one of Gruntle's cutlasses, and calmly pull the hand from the scaled glove, which she then donned. Gruntle stepped over bodies on his way to the stairwell. It was time to retreat to the next level, time to take command of the outer lying rooms with their feebly shuttered windows, and the back stairs and the central stairs. Time to jam yet more souls down Hood's clogged, choking throat, the Lestari thought. At the stairs, Gruntle clashed his cutlasses. Outside, a resurging tide of noise. Brokalian sat astride his huge, lathered warhorse, watching as the Destriant's cutters dragged a barely breathing at Covian into a nearby building that would serve for the next bell or two as a triage. Canadus himself, drawing once more on his fevered Warren of Denul, had quelled the flow of blood from the chest of the shield anvil's horse. The surviving grey swords at the cemetery were being helped clear by the mortal sword's own companies. There were wounds to be tended to there as well, but those that were fatal had already proved so. Corpses were being pulled away in a frantic search for more survivors. The cutters carrying at Covian now faced the task of removing buried iron from the shield anvil, weapons that had, by virtue of remaining embedded, in all likelihood saved the man's life. And Carnadus would be on hand for that surgery, to quench the blood that would gush from each wound as the iron was drawn free. Brokalian's flat, hard eyes followed the destriant as the old man stumbled after his cutters. Carnadus had gone too far pulled too much from his warren, too much and too often. His body had begun its irreversible surrender. 
Bruises marked the joints of his arms, the elbows, the wrists, the fingers. Within him, his veins and arteries were becoming as cheesecloth, and the seepage of blood into muscle and cavity would only grow more profound. De Newell's flow was disintegrating all that it flowed through, the body of the priest himself. He would be, Brucalian knew, dead before dawn. Yet before then, Itkovian would be healed, brutally mended without regard to the mental trauma that accompanied all wounds. The shield anvil would assume command once again, but not as the man he had been. The mortal sword was a hard man. The fate of his friends was a knowledge bereft of emotion. It was as it had to be. He straightened on his saddle, scanned the area to gauge the situation. The attack upon the barracks had been repelled. The Tenescari had broken on all sides, and none still standing remained within sight. This was not the case elsewhere, Brucalian well knew. The Grey Swords had been virtually obliterated as an organized army. No doubt pockets of resistance remained, but they would be few and far between. To all intents and purposes, Capustan had fallen. A mounted messenger approached from the northwest, horse leaping the mounds of bodies littering the avenue, slowing as it neared the mortal sword's companies. Brucalian gestured with his blade, and the young Capan woman reined in before him. Sir, she gasped, I bring word from Rathvena, a message passed on to me by an acolyte. Let us hear it then, sir. The thrall is assailed. Rathvena invokes the Rev's eighth command. You are to ride with all in your company to his aid. Rathvena kneels before the hooves. You are to be the twin tusks of his and Fena's shadow. Brucalian's eyes narrowed. Sir, this acolyte managed to leave the thrall in order to convey his priest's holy invocation. Given the protective sorcery around the building, how was this managed? The young woman shook her head. I do not know, sir. And your path across the city, to arrive here, was it contested? None living stood before me, sir. Can you explain that? No, sir, I cannot. Fainus fortune, perhaps. Brucalian studied her a moment longer. Recruit, will you join us in our deliverance? She blinked, then slowly nodded. I would be honored, mortal sword. His reply was a gruff, sorrowful whisper that only deepened her evident bewilderment. As would I, sir. Brucalin lowered the visor, swung to his followers. Eleventh main to remain with the Destriant and his cutters, he commanded. Remaining companies, we march to the thrall. Rathfana has invoked the Rev. And to this we must answer. He then dismounted and handed the reins of his warhorse to the messenger. My mind has changed, he rumbled. You are to remain here, sir, to guard my destrier. Also, to inform the shield anvil of my disposition once he awakens. Your disposition, sir? You will know it soon, recruit. The mortal sword faced his troops once more. They stood in ranks, waiting, silent. Four hundred grey swords, perhaps the last left alive. Sirs, Brucalian asked them, are you in full readiness? A veteran officer grated, ready to try, mortal sword. Your meaning? The commander asked. We are to cross half the city, sir. We shall not make it. You assume our path to the thrall, will be contested, Nilbanus. Yes? The old soldier frowned, said nothing. Brucalian reached for his shield, which had waited at his side in the hands of an aide. I shall lead us, he said. Do you follow? Every soldier nodded, and the mortal sword saw in those half-visored faces the emergence of an awareness, a knowledge to which he had already arrived. There would be no return from the journey to come. Some currents, he knew, could not be fought. Readying the large, bronze-plated shield on his left arm, adjusting his grip on his holy sword, Brucalian strode forward. 
his grey swords fell in behind him. He chose the most direct route, not slowing even as he set across open, corpse-strewn squares. The murmuring rumble of humanity was on all sides. Isolated sounds of battle, the collapse of burning buildings and the roar of unchecked fires, streets knee-deep in bodies. Scenes of Hood's infernal pit rolled past them as they marched, as of two unfurling tapestries woven by a mad, soul-tortured artisan. Yet their journey was uncontested. As they neared the aura sheathed thrall, the veteran increased his pace to come alongside Bukalian. I heard the messenger's word, sir. Of that I am aware, Nilbanus. It cannot be really from Rathvena. But it is, sir. Then the priest betrays us. Yes, old friend, he betrays us. He has desecrated Fena's most secret rev. By the tusk, sir. The words of the rev are greater than he is, Nilbanus. They are Fena's own. Yet he has twisted them malign, sir. We should not abide. Wrath Fena's crime shall be answered, but not by us. At the cost of our lives? Without our death, sir, there would be no crime. Thus, no punishment to match. Mortal sword, we are done, my friend. Now, in this manner, we choose the meaning of our deaths. But, but what does he gain, betraying his own god? No doubt, Brucalian said with a private, grim smile, his own life. For a time. Should the thrall's protective sorcery be sundered, should the Council of Masks be taken, he will be spared the horrors that await his fellow priests. He judges this a worthwhile exchange. The veteran was shaking his head. And so Fainer allows his own words to assume the weight of betrayal. How noble his bestial mean when he finally corners Rath Fainer. Our God shall not be the one to deliver the punishment, Nilbanus. You are right, he could not do so in fullest conscience, for this is a betrayal that wounds him deeply, leaves him weakened and vulnerable to fatal consequence, sir. Then, the man almost sobbed, then who shall be our vengeful hand, Brucalian? If anything, the mortal sword's smile grew grimmer. Even now, the shield anvil no doubt regains consciousness, and is moments from hearing the messenger's report, moments from true comprehension. Nelbanus, our vengeful hand shall be Itkovian's. What is your countenance now, old friend? The soldier was silent for another half-dozen paces. Before them was the open concourse before the gate to the thrall. I am calmed, sir, he said, his voice deep and satisfied. I am calmed. Brucalian cracked his sword against his shield. Black fire lit the blade, sizzled and crackled. They surround the concourse before us. Shall we enter? Aye, sir, with great joy. The mortal sword and his four hundred followers strode into the clearing not hesitating as the streets and alley mouths on all sides swiftly filled with Septarch Kulpath's crack troops, his Erdemen, Seodumin, and Bataclites, including the avenue they had just quitted. Archers appeared on the rooftops, and the hundreds of Seodumin lying before the thrall's gate, feigning death, now rose, readying weapons. At Prukalian's side, Nilbana snorted. Pathetic. The mortal sword grunted a laugh that was heard by all. The Septarch deems himself clever, sir. And us, stupid with honour. Aye, we are that indeed, are we not, old friend? Nilbanus raised his sword and roared triumphantly. Blade whirling over his head, he spun in place his dance of delighted defiance. The grey sword's locked shields, ends curling to enclose the mortal sword as they readied their last stand in the centre of the concourse. The veteran remained outside it, still spinning, still roaring, sword high in the air. 
Five thousand Panyans and the Septarch himself looked on, in wonder, disbelieving, profoundly alarmed by the man's wild bestial stamping on the cobbles. Then, with a silent snarl, Kulpath shook himself and raised one gauntleted hand. He jerked it down. The air of the concourse blackened as fifteen hundred bows whispered as one. Eyes snapping open, Itkovian heard that whisper. He saw with a vision filling his awareness to the exclusion of all else as the barbed heads plunged into the shielded turtle that was the grey swords. Shafts slipped through here and there. Soldiers reeled, fell, folded in on themselves. Nilbanus, pierced through by a hundred arrows or more, whipped round one last time in a haze of blood droplets, then collapsed. In roaring masses, the Panian foot soldiers surged onto the concourse, crashed against the locked shields of the surviving greyswords, even as they struggled to close the gaps in their ranks. The square was shattered, ripped apart. Battle turned to slaughter. Still standing, the mortal sword's whirling blade raged with black fire. Studded with arrow shafts, he stood like a giant amidst feral children. And fought on. Pikes drove into him from all sides, lifted him from his feet. Sword arms swinging down, he chopped through the shafts, landed amidst writhing bodies. Itkovian saw as a double-bladed axe separated Brucalian's left arm from his body, at the shoulder, where blood poured unchecked as the severed, shield-laden arm fell away, frenziedly contracting at the elbow, as would an insect's dismembered limb. The huge man folded to his right. More pikes jabbed, ripping into his torso. The grip on the sword did not falter. The burning blade continued to spread its devouring flame outward, incinerating as it went. Screams filled the air. Erdemen closed in with their short, heavy blades, began chopping. The mortal sword's intestines snagged on a sword tip, unraveled like a snake from his gut. Another axe crashed down on Brucalian's head, splitting the heavy black iron helm, then the skull, then the man's face. The burning sword exploded in a dark flash, the shards cutting down yet more panions. The corpse that was Faina's mortal sword tottered upright a moment longer, riven through, almost headless, then slowly settled to its knees, back hunching, a scarecrow impaled by a dozen pikes, countless arrows. Kneeling, now motionless, in the deepening shadow of the thrall, as the Panyans slowly withdrew on all sides, their battle rage gone and something silent and dreadful in its stead, staring at the hacked thing that had been Brucalian, and at the tall, barely substantial apparition that took form directly before the mortal sword. A figure shrouded in black, hooded, hands hidden within the tattered folds of broad sleeves. Hood? Itkovian thought. King of High House Death. Come to greet this man's soul, in person. Why? A moment later and the Lord of Death was gone, yet no one moved. It began to rain. Hard. Kneeling, watery blood staining the black armor, making the chain's iron links gleam crimson. Another set of eyes was sharing at Covian's inner vision, eyes that he knew well. And in the shield anvil's mind there came a cold satisfaction, and in his mind he addressed the other witness and knew, without doubt, that his words were heard. I have you, Rathvena. You are mine, betrayer. Mine. The sparrowhawk twisted through the wind-whipped rain clouds, felt the drops like nails as they battered its wings, its splayed tail. Lurid flames glimmered in the city below amidst the grey, blackening buildings. The day was drawing to a close, but the horror did not relent. Buke's mind was numb with all that he had witnessed, and the distance afforded him by his soul-taken form was no release. These eyes were too sharp too sharp by far. He banked hard directly over the estate that was home to Beauchelaine and Corbel Brooch. The gate was a mass of bodies. 
The mostly ornamental corner towers and the walkways along the compound's walls were occupied by silent sentinels, dark and motionless in the rain. Corbel Broach's army of animated corpses had grown. Hundreds of tennis cowry had breached the gate and poured into the compound earlier. Bershelaine had greeted them with waves of deadly sorcery, magic that blackened their flesh, cracked it, then made it curl away in strips from their bones. Long after they were dead, the spell continued its relentless work until the cobbles were ankle-deep in charred dust. Two more attempts had been made, each more desperate than the last. Assailed by sorcery and the implacable savagery of the undead warriors, the tennis cowrie had finally reeled back, fleeing in terror. A company of Becklites fared no better later in the afternoon. Now, as dust swept in behind the rain, the streets surrounding the estate held only the dead. On wearying wings, Buke climbed higher once more, following the Daru district's main avenue westward. Gutted tenement buildings, smoke billowing from rubble, the fitful lick of flames. Seething mobs of Teniscari, huge bonfires where spitted human flesh roasted. Roving squads and companies of Scalandi, Becklites and Bataclites, Erdemann and Seerdemann. Bewildered, enraged, wondering where Kapustan's citizens have gone, Buke thought. Oh, you have the city now, yet you feel cheated nonetheless. His acute vision was failing with the fading light. To the southeast, hazy with rain and smoke, rose the prince's palace towers. Dark, seemingly inviolate. Perhaps its inhabitants held out still. Or perhaps it was, once more, a lifeless edifice, home only to ghosts. Return to the comfort of silence, such as it had known for centuries before the coming of the Kapan and Daru. Turning his head back, Buke caught a glimpse of a single tenement building just off to his left. Fire surrounded it, but it seemed the squat structure defied the flames. In the glow of the banked bonfires, he saw red-limbed, naked corpses, filling the surrounding streets and alleys. No, that must be a mistake, Buke thought. My eyes deceive. Those dead are lying on rubble. They must be. Gods, the tenement's ground level isn't even visible. Buried. Rubble. They cannot be naught but bodies, not piled that high. Oh, deathless abyss. The building was where Gruntle had taken a room. And, assailed by flames, it would not burn. And there, lit on all sides from below, the walls wept. Not water, but blood. Buke wheeled closer, and the closer he flew, the more horrified he became. He could see windows, shutterless on the first visible floor, packed with bodies. The same on the next floor, and on the one above that, directly beneath the roof. The entire building was, he realized, virtually solid. A mass of flesh and bone, seeping from the windows, tears of blood and bile. A giant mausoleum, a monument to this day. He saw figures on the roof, a dozen huddled here and there beneath makeshift awnings and lean-to shelters. And one, standing apart, head bowed as if studying the horrors in the street below. Tall, hulking, broad sloping shoulders, strangely barbed in shadows. A cutlass hung heavy in each gauntleted hand, stripped and gleaming like bone. A dozen paces behind him a standard had been raised, held upright by bundles that might be food packs, such as the grey swords issued. Sodden, yellow-stained, with dark bars of blood, a child's tunic. Buke drew still closer, then swung away. He was not ready. Not for Gruntle. Not for the man as he was now, as he had become. A terrible transformation. One more victim of this siege, as are we all. Blinking, Idkovian struggled to make sense of his surroundings. A low, damp-blighted ceiling, the smell of raw meat. 
yellow lantern light, the weight of a rough woolen blanket on his chest. He was lying on a narrow cot, and someone was holding his hand. He slowly turned his head, wincing at the lash of pain, the motion elicited from his neck. Healed, yet not yet healed. The mending, incomplete. Carnadas was at his side, collapsed onto his haunches, folded and motionless, the pale, wrinkled pate of his bowed head level with Itkovian's eyes. The hand gripping his was all bone and deathly dry skin, icy cold. The shield anvil squeezed it slightly. The Destrian's face, as he lifted it into view, was skeletal, the skin mottled with deep bruises originating from the joints of his jaw, his red-webbed eyes sunken within charcoal-black pits. Ah, the old man rasped. I have failed you, sir. You have not. Your wounds. The flesh is sealed. I can feel as much. My neck, my back, my knee. There is naught but a tenderness, sir. Easily managed. He slowly sat up, keeping his expression calm despite the agony that ripped through him. Flexing his knee left him bathed in sweat, suddenly chilled and light-headed. He did not alter his firm grip on the destrian's hand. Your gift ever humbles me, sir. Carnadus settled his head on Itkovian's thigh. I am done, my friend, he whispered. I know, the shield anvil replied. But I am not. The Destrian's head moved in a nod, but he did not look up. Itkovian glanced around. Four other cots, each bearing a soldier. Rough blankets had been drawn up over their faces. Two of the priest's cutters sat on the blood-gummed floor, their backs to a wall, their eyes closed in the sleep of the exhausted. Near the small room's door stood a grey-sword messenger, capping by her features beneath the rim of her helmet. He had seen a younger version of her among the recruits, perhaps a sister. How long have I been unconscious? Do I hear rain? Carnadus made no answer. Neither surgeon stirred awake. After a moment, the messenger cleared her throat. Sir, it is less than a bell before midnight. The rain came with the dusk. With the dusk, and with a man's death, Itkovian thought. The hand holding his slackened in increments. How many soldiers here, sir? How many do I still command? She flinched. There are one hundred and thirty-seven in all, sir. Of these, ninety-six recruits. Of the mains who stood with you at the cemetery, eleven soldiers survive. Our barracks? Fallen, sir. The structure burns. Jalakin's palace. She shook her head. No word, sir. Edkovian slowly disengaged his hand from Carnadus's limp grip and looked down upon the motionless figure. He stroked the wisps of the man's hair. Moments passed, then the shield anvil broke the silence. Find us an orderly, sir. The destriant is dead. Her eyes widened on him. He joins our mortal sword, Brucalian. It is done. Following these words, Itkovian settled his boots onto the floor, almost blacking out at the pain in his ruined knee. He drew a deep, shaky breath, slowly straightened. Do any armorers remain? An apprentice, sir, she replied after a moment, her tone brittle as burned leather. I shall need a brace for my knee, sir. Anything he or she can fashion. Yes, sir, she whispered. Shield anvil. He paused in his search for his surcoat, glanced over. The woman had gone deathly white. I, I voice the Rev's thirteenth law. I request rightful punishment. She was trembling. Punishment, sir? What was your crime? I delivered the message from Rathvena's acolyte. She reeled at her own words, armor clunking as her back came up against the door. 
Faina, forgive me. I sent the mortal sword to his death. Itkovian's eyes thinned as he studied her. You are the recruit who accompanied me and my wings on the last excursion onto the plain. My apologies, sir, for not recognizing you earlier. I should have anticipated the intervening experience writ so clearly upon your face. I deny your voicing the rare soldier. Now, find us that orderly and the apprentice. But, sir, Brucalian was not deceived. Do you understand? Moreover, your presence here evinces your innocence in the matter. Had you been party to the betrayal, you would have ridden with him at his command, and would have been dealt with accordingly. Now go. We cannot wait here much longer. Ignoring the tears now streaking her mud-spattered face, the shield anvil slowly made his way to a heap of discarded armor. A moment later she swung about, opened the door, and fled out into the hallway. Itkovian paused in his hobbling. He glanced over at the sleeping cutters. I am the bearer of Faina's grief, he intoned in a whisper. I am my vow incarnate, this and in all that follows. We are not yet done here. I am not yet done. Behold, I yield to nothing. He straightened, expressionless once more. His pain retreated. Soon it would be irrelevant. One hundred and thirty-seven armoured faces looked upon the shield anvil. Through the streaming rain, he in turn surveyed them as they stood in their ranks on the dark street. Two warhorses remained. His own, chest wound a red welt but fire undimmed in the eyes, and Brucalian's black destria. The messenger held both sets of reins. Strips from a banded cuirass had been lashed to either side of Itkovian's damaged knee, providing sufficient flex for him to ride and walk while offering vital support when he stood. The rents in his chain surcoat had been mended with copper wire. The weight of the sleeve was noticeable only on his left arm. There was little strength in it, and the skin between his neck and shoulder felt stretched and hot over the incompletely knitted tissue beneath. Straps had been rigged that would hold his arm at an angle when it bore his shield. Grey swords? The shield anvil addressed them. We have work before us. Our captain and her sergeants have formed you into squads. We march to the palace of the prince. The journey is not far. It appears that the enemy is chiefly massed around the thrall. Should we happen to encounter roving bands, however, they will probably be small, are most likely Tenescari, and thus ill-armed and untrained. March, therefore, in readiness. Itkovian faced his lone captain, who had only days earlier been the master sergeant responsible for the training of the Capan recruits. Sir, array the squads. The woman nodded. Itkovian strode to his horse. A makeshift mounting block had been prepared, easing the transition into the saddle. Accepting the reins from the messenger, the shield anvil looked down upon her. The captain will walk with her soldiers, sir, he said. The mortal sword's horse should be ridden. She is yours, recruit. She will know your capacity by your seat, and respond in accordance to ensure your safety. It will not avail you to defy her in this. Blinking, the young woman slowly nodded. Mount up then, sir, and ride at my side. The ramp leading to Jalakan's palace's narrow, arched gateway was unoccupied, swept clean. The gates themselves had been shattered. Faint torchlight glimmered from the antechamber immediately beyond. Not a single soldier stood on the walls or revetments. Apart from the drumming rain, there was naught but silence to greet Itkovian and his greyswords. Point squads had scouted to the gate's threshold, confirming that the enemy was nowhere to be seen nor, it seemed, were there any surviving defenders. Or bodies. Smoke and hissing mist filled the spaces between stone, sheets of rain, the night sky overhead. All sounds of fighting in other sections were gone. Procalian had asked for six weeks. Itkovian had given him less than three days. 
the truth of that gnawed within him, as if a broken blade or arrowhead still remained in his body, missed by the cutters, buried in his gut, wrapping its pain around his heart. But I am not yet done, he thought. He held to those words, back straight, teeth gritted. A gesture with one gauntleted hand sent the first scouts through the gateway. They were gone for some time, then a single runner returned, padding down the ramp to where Edkovian waited. Sir, the woman reported, there are ten Iskari within, in the main hall, we believe. Sounds of feasting and revelry. And are the approaches guarded? the shield anvil asked. The three that we have found are not, sir. There were four entrances to Jalakan's main hall. The double doors facing the gate on the other side of the antechamber, two flanking portals in the chamber itself that led to guest and guard rooms, and a narrow, curtain-shielded passage directly behind the prince's throne. Very well. Captain, position one squad to each of the two side entrances. Quietly. Six squads here at the gate. The remaining five are with me. The shield anvil carefully dismounted, landing mostly on his undamaged leg. He reeled nonetheless at the jolt that shot up his spine. The messenger had followed suit and now stepped to his side. Slowing his breathing, he glanced at her. Get me my shield, he grated. Another soldier assisted her in strapping the bronze shield to Edkovian's arm, drawing the supporting sling over his shoulder. The shield anvil lowered the visor on his helm, then slid his sword from its scabbard while the captain issued commands to the five squads arrayed around them. Those with crossbows to the second line, stay low and keep your weapons cocked but lower still. Front line overlapping shields, swords on guard, all visors down. Sir, the captain addressed at Kervian, we are ready. He nodded, said to the recruit, you are to be on my left. Now, forward at my pace. He strode slowly up the rain-slick ramp. Fifty-three silent soldiers followed. Into the antechamber, the squarish high-ceilinged room lit by a single wavering torch set in a bracket on the right-hand wall. The two squads assigned to the chamber split to either side as the shield anvil led his troop towards the broad hallway where waited the main hall's double doors. The patter of shed rain accompanied them. Ahead, muted through the thick oak doors, was the sound of voices. Laughter tinged with hysteria. The crackle of burning wood. Itkovian did not pause upon reaching the entrance, using shield and mailed fist to thrust open the twin doors. As he stepped through, the squads behind him spread out to take command of his end of the long, vaulted chamber. Faces snapped round. Gaunt figures in rags lurched up from the chairs on either side of the long table. Utensils clattered and bones thumped to the floor. A wild-haired woman shrieked, scrabbled madly towards the young man seated in Jalakan's throne. Gentle mother, the man rasped, reaching out a shiny, grease-stained hand to her, yet holding his yellow-tinged eyes on it Covian all the while. Be calmed. She grasped that hand in both of hers, fell to her knees, whimpering. These are naught but guests, mother. Come too late, alas, to partake of the royal feast. Someone screamed a laugh. On the centre of the table was a huge silver plate, on which had been made a fire from snapped chair legs and picture frames, mostly charcoal now. Spitted above it was the remains of a skinned human torso, no longer being turned, underside blackening. Severed at the knees, the two thighs bound as one by copper wire. Arms pulled off at the shoulders, though they too had once been tied. Head left on, split and charred. Knives had sliced off the flesh in places all over the body. Thighs, buttocks, chest, back, face. But this, it Covian knew, had not been a feast born of hunger. These tennis cowry in this room looked better fed than any other he had yet seen. No, here, this night, had been a celebration. To the left of the throne, half in shadow, 
was an X-shaped cross made from two pikes. On it was stretched Prince Jalakan's skin. The dear prince was dead before we began cooking, the young man on the throne said. We are not consciously cruel, after all. You are not Brucalian, for Brucalian is dead. You must be Itkovian, the so-called shield anvil of Fena. Seer Domin appeared from behind the throne, pale-armoured and helmed, fur-backed, their faces hidden by grilled face baskets, heavy battle axes in their gauntleted hands. Four, eight, a dozen, twenty, and still more filed out. The man on the throne smiled. Your soldiers look tired, unequal to this particular task. Do you know me, Itkovian? I am Anasta, first child of the Dead Seed. Tell me, where are the people of this city? What have you done with them? No, let me guess. They cower in tunnels beneath the streets, guarded by a handful of surviving Kidrath, a company or two of your grey swords, some of the prince's cap and guard. I imagine Prince Arad hides below as well. A shame, that. We have wanted him a long time. Well, the search for the hidden entrances continues. They shall be found. Capustan shall be cleansed, Shield Anvil. Though, alas, you will not live to see that glorious day. Itkovian studied the young man and saw what he had not expected to see. First child, he said. There is despair within you. I will take it from you, sir, and with it your burdens. Anasta jolted as if he had been physically struck. He drew his knees up, climbed onto the seat of the throne, face twitching. A hand closed on the strange obsidian dagger in his belt, then flinched away as if the stone was hot. His mother screamed, clawed up her son's outstretched arm. Snarling, he pulled himself free. She sank down to the floor, curled up. I am not your father, Itkovin continued, but I shall be as him. Unleash your flood, first child. The young man stared, lips peeling back to bare his teeth. You, what are you? He hissed. The captain stepped forward. We forgive your ignorance, sir, she said. He is the shield anvil. Faina knows grief, so much grief that it is beyond his capacity to withstand it. And so he chooses a human heart, armoured, a mortal soul to assume the sorrow of the world, the shield anvil. These days and nights have witnessed vast sorrow, profound shame, all of which, we see now, is writ as plain knowledge in your eyes. You cannot deceive yourself, sir, can you? You never could. Itkovian said, Give me your despair, first child. I am ready to receive it. Anasta's wail rang through the main hall. He clambered still further up the throne's high back, arms wrapping around himself. All eyes held on him. No one moved. Chest heaving, the first child stared at Itkovian. Then he shook his head. No, he whispered. You shall not have my, my despair. The captain hissed. This is a gift. First child? Not. Itkovin seemed to sag, sword point wavering, lowering. The recruit moved closer to support the shield anvil. You cannot have it. You cannot have it. The captain's eyes were wide as she turned to Itkovin. Sir. I am unable to countenance this. The shield anvil shook his head, slowly straightened once more. No, I understand. The first child, within him there is naught but despair. Without it, he is as nothing, Itkovian thought. I want them all killed! 
Anister shrieked brokenly. Seer Domin! Kill them all! Forty Seer Domin surged forward to either side of the table. The captain snapped a command. The front line behind her dropped in unison to one knee. The second line raised into view their crossbows. Twenty-four quarrels crossed the room. Not one missed. From the flanking Gestrom entrances, more quarrels flashed. The front line behind Ecovian rose and readied their weapons. Only six Seer Domin remained standing. Figures both writhing and motionless covered the floor. The tennis cowrie at the table were fleeing towards the portal behind the throne. Anasta himself was the first to reach it, his mother a step behind him. The Seer Domin charged at Covian. I am not yet done. His blade flashed. A helmed head leapt from its shoulders. A backhand slash snapped chain links and opened wide another Seer Domin's belly. Crossbows sounded once more, and the grey sword stood unopposed. The shield anvil lowered his weapon. Captain, he said after a moment, retrieve the prince's body. Have the skin taken down. We shall return Prince Jalakan to his throne, to his rightful place. And this room we shall now hold, for a time, in the name of the prince. The first child, Itkovian faced her. We will meet him again. I am his only salvation, sir, and I shall not fail him. You are the shield anvil, she intoned. I am the shield's anvil. I am Faina's grief, he thought. I am the world's grief. And I will hold. I will hold it all, for we are not yet done. Chapter 17 what the soul can house, flesh cannot fathom. The Rev of Fena, Imarak, First Destriant. Hot, fevered, the pebbled skin moved like a damp rockfield sack. The matron's body exuded an acrid oil. It had permeated Tok the Younger's ragged clothes. He slid between folds of flesh as the huge bloated Kachain Chamala shifted about on the gritty floor, massive arms wrapped around him in a fierce embrace. Darkness commanded the cave. The glimmers of light he saw were born within his mind. Illusions that might have been memories. Torn, fragmented scenes of yellow grass low hills beneath warm sunlight. Figures caught at the very edge of his vision. Some wore masks. One was naught but dead skin stretched over robust bone. Another was beauty, perfection. He believed in none of them. Their faces were the faces of his madness, looming ever closer, hovering at his shoulder. When sleep took him, he dreamed of wolves, hunting not to feed, but to deliver something else. He knew not what. The quarry wandered alone. The quarry fled when it saw him. Brothers and sisters at his side, he pursued. Relentless, leagues passing effortlessly beneath his paws. The small, frightened creature could not elude them. He and his kin drew nearer, exhausting it against the slopes of hills, until finally it faltered, then collapsed. They surrounded it. As they closed in to deliver... What was to be delivered? The quarry vanished. Shock, then despair. He and his kin would circle the spot where she had lain. Heads lifted skyward, mournful howls issuing from their throats, howling without surcease. Until Tok the Younger blinked awake, in the embrace of the matron, the turgid air of the cave seeming to dance with the fading echoes of his howls. The creature would tighten her hold then, whimpering, prodding the back of his neck with a fang snout, her breath like sugared milk. The cycles of his life. Sleep, then wakefulness punctuated by hallucinations. Smeared scenes of figures in golden sunlight, delusions of being a babe in his mother's arms, suckling at her breast. The matron possessed no breasts, so he knew these to be delusions, yet was sustained by them nonetheless, 
and times when he began voiding his bladder and bowels, and she held him out when he did this, so he fouled only himself. She would then lick him clean, a gesture that stripped him of his last shreds of dignity. Her embrace broke bones. The more he screamed with the pain, the tighter she held him. He had learned to suffer in silence. His bones knitted with preternatural swiftness, sometimes unevenly. He knew himself to be malformed, his chest, his hips, the blades of his shoulders. Then there came the visitations. A ghostly face sheathed in the wrinkled visage of an old man, the hint of gleaming tusks, took form within his mind. Yellowed eyes that shone with glee fixed on his own. Familiar, those overlapping faces, but Tok was unable to take his recognition any further. The visitor would speak to him. They are trapped, my friend, all but the Talan I mass, who fears solitude. Why else would he not leave his companions, swallowed in ice, helpless, frozen? The Segula, no need to fear them, never was. I but played. And the woman, my rhymed beauteous statue, wolf and dog have vanished, fled. I, the kin, brother of your eyes, fled. Tail between legs. <laughs> and again. Your Malasan army is too late, too late to save Kapustan. The city is mine. Your fellow soldiers are still a week away, my friend. We shall await them. We shall greet them as we greet all enemies. I will bring you the head of the Malazan general. I will bring you his cooked flesh. And we shall dine together, you and I, once more. How much blood can one world shed? Have you ever wondered, Tok the Younger? Shall we see? Let us see, then, you and I, and dear mother here. Oh, is that horror I see in her eyes? Some sanity still resides in her rotted brain, it seems. How unfortunate for her. And now, after a long absence, he returned once more. The foreskin of the old man was taut against the unhuman visage. The tusks were visible, as if through a transparent sheath. The eyes burned, but not this time, with glee. Deceit! They are not mortal beasts! How dare they assail my defences! Here, at the very gates! And now the Talan I mass has vanished. I can find him nowhere. Does he come as well? So be it. They shall not find you. We journey, the three of us, north, far beyond their reach. I have prepared another nest for you too. The inconvenience. But Tok no longer heard him. His mind had been snatched away. He saw brittle white sunlight, a painful glare shimmering from ice-clad mountains and valleys buried in rivers of snow. In the sky, wheeling condors. And then, far more immediate, there was smoke, wooden structures shattered, stone walls tumbled, figures running, screaming, crimson spattering the snow, filling the milky puddles of a gravel road. The point of view, eyes that saw through a red haze, shifted, swung to one side. A mottled black and grey hound kept pace, shoulders at eye level to the armoured figures it was tearing into with blurred savagery. The creature was driving towards a second set of gates, an arched portal at the base of a towering fortress. None could stand before it, none could slow its momentum. Grey dust swirled from the hound's shoulders, Swirled, spun, twisted into arms, legs gripping the creature's flanks, 
a bone-helmed head, torn fur a ragged wing behind it. Raised high, a rippled sword the colour of old blood. His bones are well, his flesh is not, Tolk thought. My flesh is well, my bones are not. Are we brothers? Hound and rider, nightmare vision, struck the huge iron-banded gates. Wood exploded. In the archway's gloom, terror plunged among a reeling knot of seer domin. Loping towards the breached portal, Tok rode his wolf's vision, saw into the shadows, where huge reptilian shapes stepped into view to either side of the hound and its undead rider. The Ka'el hunters raised their broad blades. Snarling, the wolf sprinted. His focus was the gate, every detail there sharp as broken glass, whilst all that lay to either side blurred. A shift of weight brought him to the Ka'el hunter, closing from the hound and rider's left. The creature pivoted, sword slashing to intercept his charge. The wolf ducked beneath it, then surged upward, jaws wide. Leathery throat filled his mouth. His canine sank deep into lifeless flesh. Jaw muscles bunched. Bone cracked, then crumbled as the wolf inexorably closed its vice grip, even as the momentum of his charge drove the K'el hunter back onto its tail, crashing against a wall that shuddered with the impact. Upper and lower canines met. Jagged molars ground together, slicing through wood-like tendon and dry muscle. The wolf was severing the head from the body. The Kachain Chamala shook beneath him, spasmed. A flailing blade sliced into the wolf's right haunch. Tok and Beast flinched at the pain, yet did not relent. The ornately helmed head fell back, away, thumped as it struck the slush-covered cobbles. Snarling, lifeless shreds snagged on his teeth, the wolf spun round. The hound crouched, spine hunched, in a corner of the archway. Blood poured from it, alone, to battle its wounds. The undead swordsman, my brother, was on his leather-wrapped feet now, his flint sword trading blows with the other Ka'el hunter's twin blades, at speeds unimaginable. Chunks of the Kachain Chamala flew. A sword-bound forearm spun end over end to land near the flinching hound. The Ka'el hunter lurched back in the face of the onslaught. Chinbones snapped with a brittle report. The huge creature fell over, spraying slush out to all sides. The undead warrior clambered onto it, systematically swinging his sword to dismember the Kachain Chamala. It was a task swiftly completed. The wolf approached the wounded hound. The animal snapped a warning to stay away. Tok was suddenly blind, ripped away from the wolf's vision. Bitter winds tore at him, but the matron held him tight. On the move. Swiftly. They travelled a warren, a path of river ice. They were, he realised, fleeing outlook, fleeing the fortress that had just been breached. By Baljag! And Gareth and Toole. Gareth, those wounds. Silence! A voice shrieked. The seer was with them, leading the way through Omto's Felak. The gift of clarity remained in Tok's mind. His laugh was a ragged gurgle. Shut up! The entire warren shook to distant thunder, the sound of vast ice, cracking, exploding in a conflagration of sorcery. Lady Envy, with us once more, the seer screamed. Reptilian arms clenched Tok. Bones cracked, splintered. Pain shoved him over a precipice. My kin, my brothers. He blacked out. The night sky to the south was lit red. Though over a league distant, from the slope of the sparsely wooded hill, Kapustan's death was plain to see drawing the witnesses to silence apart from the rustle of armour and weapons, and the squelch of boots and moccasins in mud. Leaves dripped a steady susurration. The soaked humus filled the warm air with its fecundity. Somewhere nearby a man coughed. Captain Parron drew a dagger and began scraping the mud from his boots. He had known what to expect at this moment, his first sight of the city. 
Umbral Tor scouts had brought word back earlier in the day. The siege was over. The Grey Swords might well have demanded an Emperor's ransom for their services, but fire charred, tooth gnawed bones could not collect it. Even so, knowing what to expect did little to diminish the pathos of a dying city. Had those Grey Swords been Crimson Guard, the scene before Paran might well be different. With the lone exception of Prince Kaz Devora's Company of the Avowed, mercenaries were less than worthless as far as the captain was concerned. Tough talk and little else. Let's hope these children of Humbrol Tor have fared better, Parent thought. It did not seem likely. Pockets of resistance perhaps remained. Small knots of cornered soldiers, knowing mercy was out of the question, would fight to the last. In alleys, in houses, in rooms. Kapustan's death throes would be protracted. Then again... If these damned Bargast can actually manage a double time, instead of this squabbling saunter, we might be able to adjust that particular fate's conclusion, he thought. Parent turned at the arrival of his new commander, Trotz. The huge Bargast's eyes glittered as he studied the burning city. The rains have done little to dim the flames, he rumbled, scowling. Perhaps it's not as bad as it looks, Parent said. I can make out maybe five major fires. It could be worse. I've heard tales of firestorms. Aye, we saw one from afar, in Seven Cities once. What's Humbrol Tor had to say, Warchief? Do we pick up our pace, or do we just stand here? Trotz bared his filed teeth. He will send the Baran and the Akrata clans southeast. They are tasked with taking the landings and the floating bridges and barges. His own Senan and the Gilk will strike towards Kapustan. The remaining clans will seize the Septarch's main supply camp, which lies between the landings and the city. That's all very well, but if we keep dawdling, Heaton and Kafal, Tor's children, are alive and not at risk. So the Shouldermen insist. The bones are being protected by strange sorceries. Strange, yet profoundly powerful. There is... Damn you, Trotz! People are dying down there! People are being devoured! The Bargas grin broadened. Thus, I have been given leave to lead my clan at a pace of my own choosing. Captain, are you eager to be first among the white faces into Kapustan? Paran growled under his breath. He felt a need to draw his sword felt a need to deliver vengeance, to finally, after all this time, strike a blow against the Panyan Domin. Quick Ben, in those moments when he was lucid and not raving with fever, had made it clear that the Domin held dire secrets, and a malevolence stained its heart. The fact of the tennis cowry was proof enough of that to the captain's mind. But there was more to his need. He lived with pain. His stomach raged with spot fires. He'd thrown up acidic bile and blood, revealing that truth to no one. The pain bound him within himself, and those bindings were getting tighter. And another truth, he thought. One I keep pushing away. She's haunting me, seeking my thoughts. But I'm not ready for her. Not yet. Not with my stomach aflame. It was no doubt madness, a delusion but Paran believed that the pain would relent, all would be well once more, as soon as he delivered to the world the violence trapped within him. Folly or not, he clung to that belief. Only then will these pressures relent, he thought. Only then. He was not ready to fail. Call up the bridge burners, then, Paran muttered. We can be at the north gate inside of a bell. Trotz grunted. All thirty odd of us. Well, damn if we can't shame these bargast into some haste. This is your hope? Parent glanced over at the man. Who'd take us all, Trots? You were the one who asked Tor to grant you leave. Do you expect the thirty-seven of us to retake Kapustan all on our own? With an unconscious mage in tow? The bargast, eyes thinned to slits as he studied the city ahead, rolled his shoulders and said, we leave Quickben behind, 
As for retaking the city, I mean to try. After a long moment, the captain grinned. Glad to hear it. The march of the white-faced Bargast had been slow, torturous. Early on, during the southward journey across the high plains, sudden duels brought the clans to a halt a half-dozen times a day. These were finally diminishing, and Humbrol Tor's decision to assign entire clans to specific tasks in the upcoming battle would effectively remove the opportunity in the days to come. For all that, every warchief had bowed to the single cause. The liberation of their gods, long-standing enmities persisted. Trotz's new role as warchief of the Bridgeburners had proved something of a relief for Parin. He had hated the responsibility of command. The pressure that was the well-being of every soldier under him had been a growing burden. As second in command, that pressure had diminished, if only slightly. But it was, for now, enough. Less pleasant was the fact that Parin had lost his role as representative of the bridge burners. Trotz had taken on the task of attending the war councils, leaving the captain out of the picture. In the strictest sense, Parin remained in command of the bridge burners. But the company had become a tribe, insofar as Humbrol Tor and the Bargast were concerned, and tribes elected war chiefs, and that role belonged to Trotz. The tree studded hills behind them, the company of bridge burners moved down to the muddy verges of a seasonal stream that wound its way towards the city. Smoke from Kapustan's fires obscured the stars overhead, and the rain of the past few days had softened the ground underfoot lending it a spongy silence. Armor and weapons had been strapped tight. The bridge burners padded forward through the darkness without a sound. Parron was three paces behind Trotz, who still held to his old role in Whiskey Jack's squad, that of taking point. Not the ideal position for the commander, but one that complemented the bargast role of war chief. The captain was not happy with it. Worse, it showed Trotz's stubborn side all too clearly, a lack of adaptability that was disturbing in a leader. An invisible presence seemed to settle on his shoulder, the touch of a distant, familiar mind. Parron grimaced. His link with Silverfox was growing stronger. This was the third time she had reached out to him this week. A faint brush of awareness, like the touching of fingers, tip to tip. He wondered if that made her able to see what he saw, wondered if she was reading his thoughts. Given all that he held within himself, Parron was beginning to instinctively recoil from her contact. His secrets were his own. She had no right to plunder them if that was what she was doing. Even tactical necessity could not justify that to his mind. His frown deepened as her presence lingered. If it is her, what if... Ahead, Trotz stopped, settling into a crouch, one hand raised. He gestured twice. Parron and the soldier immediately behind him moved to join the Bargast warrior. They had reached the Panion's north pickets. The encampment was a shambles, bereft of organization, sloppily prepared, and seriously undermanned. Lissa cluttered the trodden paths between trenches, pits, and the ragged sprawl of makeshift tents. The air was redolent with poorly placed latrines. The three men studied the scene for a moment longer, then withdrew to rejoin the others. The squad sergeant slipped forward. A huddle was formed. Spindle, who had been the soldier accompanying Parron, was the first to speak. Medium infantry on station, he whispered. Two small companies by the pair of standards. Two hundred, Trotz agreed. More in the tents, sick and wounded. Mostly sick, I'd say, Spindle replied. Dysentery, I'd guess, by the smell. Those Panion officers ain't worth dung. Them sick ones won't be in the fighting, no matter what we do. Guess everyone else is in the city. The gates beyond, Trotz growled. Parron nodded. Lots of bodies before it. A thousand corpses, maybe more. No barricades at the gates themselves, nor could I see any guard. The overconfidence of victors. We gotta punch through their medium infantry, 
Sergeant Ancy muttered. Spindle, how are you and the rest of the sappers for Moranth munitions? The small man grinned. Found your nerve again, eh, Ancy? The sergeant scowled. This is fighting, ain't it? Now answer my question, soldier. We got plenty. Wish we had a few of them lobbers Fiddler makes, though. Parron blinked, then recalled the oversized crossbows Fiddler and Hedge used to extend the range of cusses. Doesn't Hedge have one? he asked. He broke it, the idiot. No, we'll prime some cusses, but that'll be just for sewing. Sharpers tonight. Burners would make too much light. Let the enemy see how few of us they really are. Sharpers. I'll gather the lads and lasses. I thought you were a mage, Parron muttered, as the man turned towards the waiting squads. Spindle glanced back. I am, Captain, and I'm a sapper too. Deadly combination, eh? Deadly for us, Ancy retorted. That and your damned hair shirt. Hey, the burnt patches are growing back. See? Get to it, Trotz growled. Spindle started tagging off squad sappers. So we just punch right through, Parent said. With the sharpers, that should be no problem. But then the ones on the outside flanks will sweep in behind us. Spindle rejoined them in time to grunt and say, That's why we'll sow cusses, Captain. Two drops on the wax, ten heartbeats. The words, run. And when we shout it, that's what you'd better do. And fast. If you're less than thirty paces away when they go up, you're diced liver. You ready? Trots our spindle. Aye, nine of us. So expect just under thirty paces wide, the path we carve. Weapons out, the Bargar said. Then he reached out and gripped Spindle's hair shirt and dragged him close. Trotz grinned. No mistakes. No mistakes, the man agreed, eyes widening as Trotz clacked his sharpened teeth inches from his face. A moment later, Spindle and his eight fellow sappers were moving towards the enemy lines, hooded and shapeless in their rain capes. The presence brushed Parron's awareness once again. He did all he could in his mind to push it away. The acid in his stomach swirled, murmuring a promise of pain. He drew a deep breath to steady himself. If swords clash, he thought, it will be my first. After all this time, my first battle. The enemy medium infantry were huddled in groups, twenty or more to each of a row of hearths on the encampment's only high ground what used to be a cart track running parallel to the city wall. Parron judged that a path thirty paces wide would take out most of three groups, leaving well over a hundred panions capable of responding. If there were any capable officers among them, this could get ugly. Then again, he thought, if there were any capable officers there, the squads wouldn't be clumped up the way they are. The sappers had gone to ground. The captain could no longer see them. Shifting his grip on his sword, he checked back over a shoulder to scan the rest of the bridge burners. Picker was at the forefront, a painful expression on her face. He was about to ask her what was wrong when detonations cracked through the night. The captain spun round. Bodies writhed in the firelight of the now scattered hearths. Trots loosed a quavering war cry. The bridge burners sprinted forward. More sharpers exploded, out to the sides now, dropping the mobbed, confused soldiers around adjacent hearths. Parron saw the dark forms of the sappers converging directly ahead, squatting down amidst dead and dying panions. Crossbows thunked in the hands of the dozen or so bridge burners who carried them. Screams rang. Trots leading the way, the bridge burners reached the charnel path, passed around the crouching sappers who were one and all readying the larger cusses. Two drops of acid to the wax plug, sealing the hole in the clay grenado. A chorus of muted hisses. Run! Parron cursed. Ten heartbeats seemed suddenly no time at all. Cusses were the largest of the Maranth munitions. A single one could make the intersection of four streets virtually impossible. The captain ran. His heart almost seized in his chest as he fixed his eyes on the gate directly ahead. 
the thousand corpses were stirring. Oh, damn, he thought. Not dead at all. Sleeping. The bastards were sleeping. Down, down, down! The word was Malazan. The voice was Hedges. Parron hesitated only long enough to see Spindle, Hedge, and the other sappers arrive among them to throw cusses. Forward. Into the massing ranks of Teniscari between them and the gates. Then they dived flat. Oh, Hood! The captain threw himself down, slid across gritty mud, releasing his grip on his sword and clamping both hands to his ears. The ground punched the breath from his lungs, threw his legs into the air. He thumped back down in the mud, on his back. He had time to begin his roll before the cussers directly ahead exploded. The impact sent him tumbling. Bloody shreds rained down on him. A large object thumped beside Parron's head. He blinked his eyes open to see a man's hips, just the hips, the concavity where intestines belonged yawning black and wet. Thighs were gone, taken at the joints. The captain stared. His ears were ringing. He felt blood trickling from his nose. His chest ached. Distant screaming wailed through the night. A hand closed on his rain cape, tugged him upright. Mallet. The healer leaned close to press the captain's sword into his hands, then shouted words Parron barely heard. Come on, they're all getting the hood out of here. A shove sent the captain stumbling forward. His eyes saw, but his mind failed to register the devastation to either side of the path they now ran down towards the north gate. He felt himself shutting down inside, even as he slipped and staggered through the human ruin, shutting down as he had once before, years ago, on a road in Itko Khan. The hand of vengeance stayed cold only so long. Any soul possessing a shred of humanity could not help but see the reality behind cruel deliverance, no matter how justified it might have at first seemed. Faces blank in death, bodies twisted in postures no one unbroken could achieve. Destroyed lives. Vengeance yielded a mirror to every atrocity, where notions of right and wrong blurred and lost all relevance. He saw to the right and left, fleeing figures. A few sharpers cracked, hastening the rout. The bridge burners had announced themselves to the enemy. We are their match, the captain realized as he ran. Incalculated brutality. But this is a war of nerves where no one wins. The unchallenged darkness of the gate swallowed Parron and his fellow bridge burners. Boots skidded as the soldiers halted their mad sprint, dropping into crouches, reloading crossbows. Not a word spoken. Trotz reached a hand out and dragged Hedge close. The bargar shook the man hard for a moment, then made to throw him down. A squeal from Spindle stopped him. Hedge, after all, carried a leather sack half full of munitions. His face still a mass of bruises from Datoran's fond touch, Hedge cursed. Ain't no choice, you big ape! Parron could hear the words. An improvement. He wasn't sure who he sided with on this one, but the truth of it was, it no longer mattered. Trot! he snapped. What now? If we wait here... The bargar grunted. Into the city, low and quiet. Which direction? Ansi asked. We head to the thrall. Fine! And what's that? The glowing keep, you thick-skulled idiot. They edged forward, out from beneath the archway's gloom, onto the concourse immediately beyond. Their steps slowed as flickering firelight revealed the nightmare before them. There had been vast slaughter, and then there had been a feast. The cobbles were ankle-deep in bones, some charred, others red and raw with bits of tendon and flesh still clinging to them. And fully two-thirds of the dead, the captain judged from what he could see of uniforms and clothing, belonged to the invaders. Gods, Parron muttered, the Panyans paid dearly. I think I should revise my estimation of the grey swords, he thought. Spindle nodded. Even so, numbers will tell. A day or two earlier, Mallet said. No one bothered finishing the thought. There was no need. 
What's your problem, Picker? Nancy demanded. Nothing, the woman snapped. Is that the thrall, then? Hedge asked. That glowing dome? There, through the smoke? Let's go, Trot said. The bridge burners ranging out cautiously in the Bargast's wake. They set forth, across the grisly concourse, to a main avenue that seemed to lead directly towards the strangely illumined structure. The style of the houses and tenement blocks to either side, those that were still standing, was distinctly Daru to Parin's eyes. The rest of the city he saw from fragmented glimpses down side alleys and avenues where fire still burned was completely different, vaguely alien, and everywhere bodies. Further down the street, piles of still-fleshed corpses rose like the slope of a hill. The bridge burners said nothing as they neared that slope. The truth before them was difficult to comprehend. On this street alone, there were at least ten thousand bodies, maybe more. Sodden, already swollen, the flesh pale around gaping, blood-drained wounds. Concentrated mounds around building entrances, alley mouths, and estate's gate, the stepped approaches to gutted temples. Faces and sightless eyes reflected flames, making expressions seem to writhe in mocking illusion of animation, of life. To continue on the street, the bridge burners would have to climb that slope. Trotz did not hesitate. Word arrived from the small company's rearguard. Tenescari had entered through the gate, were keeping pace like silent ghosts behind them. A few hundred, no more than that. Poorly armed, no trouble. Trotz simply shrugged at the news. They scrambled their way up the soft, flesh-laden ramp. Do not look down, Parent thought. Do not think of what is underfoot. Think only of the defenders who must have fought on. Think of courage almost inhuman, defying mortal limits. Of these grey swords, those motionless, uniformed corpses in those doorways, crowding the alley mouths, fighting on and on, yielding nothing, cut to pieces where they stood. These soldiers humble us all. A lesson for the bridge burners around me, this brittle, heartbroken company. We've come to a war devoid of mercy. The ramp had been fashioned. There was an intention to its construction. It was an approach. To what? It ended in a tumbled heap, at a level less than a man's height below the roof of a tenement block. Opposite the building there had been another just like it but fire had reduced it to smouldering rubble. Trot stopped at the ramp's very edge. The rest followed suit, crouching down, looking around, trying to comprehend the meaning of all that they saw. The ragged end revealed the truth. There was no underlying structure to this ghastly construct. It was indeed solid bodies. A siege ramp, Spindle finally said in a quiet, almost diffident tone. They wanted to get to somebody. Us, a low voice rumbled from above them. Crossbows snapped up. Parron looked to the tenement building's roof. A dozen figures lined its edge. Distant firelight lit them. They brought ladders, the voice continued, now speaking Daru. We beat them anyway. These warriors were not grey swords. They were armoured, but it was a ragtag collection of accoutrements. One and all, their faces and exposed skin were daubed in streaks and barbs, like human tigers. I like the paint, Hedge called up, also in Daru. Scared the crap out of me, that's for sure. The spokesman, tall and hulking, bone-white, black-barbed cutlasses in his mailed hands, cocked his head. It's not paint, Malazan. Silence. Then the man gestured with a blade. Come up, if you like. Ladders appeared from the rooftop, slid down its edge. Trotz hesitated. Parron stepped close. I think we should. There's something about that man and his followers. The bargar snorted. Really? He waved the bridge burners to the ladders. Parron watched the ascent, deciding he would be the last to go. He saw Picker hanging back. Problem, Corporal? She flinched, 
massaging her right arm. You're in pain, the captain said, moving to her side, studying her pinched face. Did you take a wound? Let's go to Mallet. He can't help me, Captain. Never mind about it. I know precisely how you feel, Parron thought. Climb, then. As if approaching gallows, the corporal made her way to the nearest ladder. Parron glanced back down the ramp. Spectral figures moved in the gloom at its far base. Well out of any kind of missile range. I'm willing, perhaps, to ascend the slope. The captain wasn't surprised at that. Fighting twinges, he began climbing. The tenement's flat roof had the look of a small shanty town. Tarps and tents, hearths smoldering on overturned shields, food packs, caskets of water and wine. A row of blanket-wrapped figures, the fallen, seven in all. Parron could see others in some of the tents, most likely wounded. A standard had been raised near the roof's trapdoor, the yellow flag nothing more than a dark-streaked child's tunic. The warriors stood silent, watchful as Trot sent squads out to each corner of the roof, where they checked on whatever lay both below and opposite the building. Their spokesman turned suddenly, a fluid, frighteningly graceful motion, and faced Corporal Picker. You have something for me, he rumbled. Her eyes widened. What? He sheathed one of his cutlasses and stepped up to her. Parron and the others nearby watched as the man reached out to Picker's right arm. He gripped her chain-sleeved bicep. A muted clatter sounded. Picker gasped. After a moment, she dropped her sword to clunk on the tarred rooftop and began stripping off her chain surcoat with quick, jerky motions. In a flood of relief, she spoke, Beru's blessing! I don't know who in Hood's name you are, sir, but they've been killing me, getting tighter and tighter. God's the pain. He said they'd never come off. He said they'd be on me for good. Even Quick Ben said that. Can't make a deal with Treach. The Tiger of Summer's mad, insane. Dead, the Daru cut in. Half out of her surcoat, Picker froze. What? she whispered. Dead? Treach is dead? The Tiger of Summer has ascended, woman. Treach, Trake, now strides with the gods. I will have them now, and I thank you for delivering them to my hand. She pulled her right arm clear of the chain sleeve. Three ivory arm torques clattered down to her hand. Here! Yes, please! Glad to oblige. Hood, take your tongue, picker, Ansi snapped. You're embarrassing us. Just give him the damn things. The corporal stared about. Blind, where in the abyss you hiding, woman? Here, a voice murmured beside Parron. Startled, he stepped back. Damn her, he thought. Ha, Picker crowed. You hear me, Blend? Ha! The squads were converging once more. The Daru rolled up a tattered sleeve. The striped pattern covered the large, well-defined muscles of his arm. He slid the three torques up past the elbow. The ivory clicked. Something flashed amber in the darkness beneath the rim of his helmet. Parron studied the man. A beast resides within him, he thought. An ancient spirit, reawakened. Power swirled around the Daru, but the captain sensed that it was born as much from a natural air of command as from the beast hiding within him. For that beast preferred solitude. Its massive strength had, somehow, been almost subsumed by that quality of leadership. Together, a formidable union, he thought. There's no mistaking, this one's important. Something's about to happen here, and my presence is no accident. I am Captain Parron, of One Arm's host. Took your time, didn't you, Malazan? Parron blinked. We did the best we could, sir. In any case, your relief this night and tomorrow will come from the Whiteface clans. Heaton and Kafal's father, Umbral Tor. Good. Time's come to turn the tide. Turn the tide? Ansi sputtered. Looks like you didn't need no help to turn the tide, man. Trot, Hedge called out. I ain't happy about what's underfoot. There's cracks. This whole roof is nothing but cracks. Same for the walls, another sapper noted. All sides. 
This building is filled with bodies, said a small warrior in Lestari armor beside the Daru. They're swelling, I guess. His eyes still on the big Daru, Paran asked, Do you have a name? Gruntle. Are you some kind of sect or something? Temple warriors? Gruntle slowly faced him, his expression mostly hidden beneath the helm's visor. No, we are nothing. No one. This is for a woman. And now she's dying. Which tent? Mallet interrupted in his high, thin voice. The Warren of Danul is poisoned. You feel that, do you, Gruntle? Curious. The healer waited, then asked again, Which tent? Gruntle's Lestari companion pointed. There. She was stuck through bad. Blood in the lungs. She might already be. He fell silent. Paran followed Mallet to the tattered shelter. The woman lying within was pale, her young face drawn and taut. Frothy blood painted her lips. And here, there's more, Paran thought. The captain watched the healer settle to his knees beside her, reach out his hands. Hold it, Paran growled. The last time damn near killed you. Not my gift, Captain. Got Bargar spirits crowding me with this one, sir. Again, don't know why. Someone's taken a personal interest, maybe. It may be too late, anyway. We'll see. All right. After a moment, Paran nodded. Mallet laid his hands on the unconscious woman, closed his eyes. A dozen heartbeats passed. Aye, he finally whispered. Layers here. Wounded flesh. Wounded spirit. I shall need to mend both. So, will you help me? The captain realized the question was not being asked of him, and so made no reply. Mallet, eyes still closed, sighed. You will sacrifice so many for this woman. He paused, eyes still closed, then frowned. I can't see these threads you speak of. Not her, nor Gruntle, nor the man at my side. At your side, Paran thought. Me? Threads? Gods, why don't you just leave me alone? But I'll take your word for it. Shall we begin? Moments passed, the healer motionless above the woman. Then she stirred on her pallet, softly moaned. The tent was torn from around her, guide wire snapping. Paran's head jerked up in surprise, to see Gruntle, chest heaving, standing above them. What? the Daru gasped. What? He staggered back a step, was brought up by Trotz's firm hands on his shoulders. No such thing, the Bargas growled, as too late. Approaching, Ansi grinned. Hello, Kapustan. The bridge burners have arrived. The sounds of fighting from the north and the east accompanied the dawn. The white-faced clans had finally engaged the enemy. Picker and the others would later learn of the sudden and bloody pitch battle that occurred at the landings on the coast and on the shore of Catlin River. The Baran and Arkrata clans had collided with newly arrived regiments of Bataclites and Betrullid cavalry. The commander there had elected to counterattack rather than hold poorly prepared defensive positions, and before long the Bargast were the ones digging in, harried on all sides. The Baran were the first to break. Witnessing the ensuing slaughter of their kin had solidified the resolve of the Arkrata, and they held until midday, when Tor detached the Gilk from the drive into the city and sent the turtle-shell-armored warriors to their aid. A plains clan wetted on interminable wars against mounted enemies, the Gilk locked horns with the Betrullid and became the fulcrum for a renewed offensive by the Akrata, shattering the Bataclites and seizing the pontoon bridges and barges. The last of the Panion medium infantry were driven into the river's shallows, where the water turned red. Surviving elements of the Betralid disengaged from the Gilk and retreated north along the coast to the marshlands. A fatal error, as their horses foundered in the salty mud. The Gilk pursued to resume a mauling that would not end until nightfall. Septar Kulpas reinforcements had been annihilated.
Humbral Tor's push into the city triggered a panicked rout. Units of Seerdumin, Erdemen, Beklite, Scalandi, and Bataklite were caught up and driven apart by the tens of thousands of Teneskari fleeing before the Bargast hookswords and lances. The main avenues became heaving masses of humanity, a swirling flood pushing westward, pouring through the breaches on that side, out onto the plain. Tor did not relent in his clan's vigorous pursuit, driving the Panyans ever westward. Crouched on the rooftop, Picker looked down on the screaming, panic-stricken mob below. The tide had torn into the ramp, cutting swathes through it, each one a narrow gully winding between walls of cold flesh. Every path was choked with figures, whilst others scrambled over top, at times less than a long pike's reach from the Malazan's position. Despite the horror she was witnessing below, she felt as if a vast burden had been lifted from her. The damned talks no longer gripped her arm. The closer they had come to the city, the tighter and hotter they had grown. Burns still ringed her upper arm, and a deep ache still lingered in the bones. There were questions surrounding all that, but she was not yet prepared to mull on them. From a few streets to the east came the now familiar sound of slaughter, the discordant battle chants of the Bargast, a rumbling undercurrent. A Panion rearguard of sorts had formed, ragged elements of Beklite, Erdemann, and Seerdumin joining ranks in an effort to blunt the white face advance. The rearguard was fast disintegrating, overwhelmed by numbers. There would be no leaving the rooftop until the routed enemy had passed, despite Hedge's moans about foundation cracks and the like. Picker was well pleased with that. The bridge burners were in the city. It had been hairy outside the wall and Northgate, but apart from that, things had gone easy. Easier than she'd expected. Maranth munitions had a way of evening out the odds, if not swinging them all the way round. Not a single clash of blades yet. Good. We ain't as tough as we used to be. Never mind Ansi's bravado. Pegger thought. She wondered how far away Dujek and Brood were. Captain Parron had sent Twist to make contact with them, as soon as it was clear that Humbral Tor had unified his tribes and was ready to announce the command to march south to Kapustan. With Quickben out of the action, and Spindle too scared to test his warrens, there was no way of knowing whether the Black Maranth had made it. Who knows what's happening to them, Baker thought. Tales among the Bargast of undead demonic reptiles on the plains. And those fouled warrens. Who's to say that poison isn't some nasty's road? Spindle says the Warrens are sick. What if they've just been taken over? Could be they're being used right now. Someone could have come through and hit them hard. There might be 30,000 corpses rotting on the plain right now. We might be all that's left of one arm's host. The Bargas did not seem interested in committing to the war beyond the liberation of Kapustan. They wanted the bones of their gods. They were about to get them, and once that happened, they'd probably head back home. And if we're then on our own, what will Parron decide? That damned noble looks deathly. The man's sick. His thoughts ride nails of pain, and that ain't good. Ain't good at all. Boots crunched beside her as someone stepped to the roof's edge. She looked up to see the red-haired woman Mallet had brought back from almost dead. A rapier snapped a third of the way down the blade was in her right hand. Her leather armor was in tatters, old blood staining countless rents. There was a brittleness to her expression, as well as something of wonder. Picker straightened. The screams from below were deafening. She moved closer and said, Won't be much longer now. You can see the front ranks of the Bargas from here, she pointed. The woman nodded, then said, my name is Stoney Manakis. Corporal Picker. I've been talking with Blend. That's a surprise. She ain't the talkative type. She was telling me about the talks. Was she now? Huh. Stoney shrugged, hesitated, then asked, Are you... Are you sworn to Trake or something? Lots of soldiers are, I gather. The Tiger of Summer, Lord of Battle. No, Picker growled. I'm not. I just figured they were charms, those talks. 
So you didn't know that you had been chosen to deliver them? To... to Gruntle? The corporal glanced over at the woman. That's what's got you kind of confused, is it? Your friend Gruntle? You never would have figured him for what... for whatever he's now become. Stoney grimaced. Anyone but him, to be honest. The man's a cynical bastard, prone to drunkenness. Oh, he's smart, as far as men go. But now when I look at him, you ain't recognising what you see. It's not just those strange markings. It's his eyes. They're a cat's eyes, now. A damn tiger's. Just as cold, just as inhuman. He says he fought for you, lass. I was his excuse, you mean. Can't say as I'd argue there was a difference. But there is, Corporal. If you say so. Anyway, the truth's right there in front of you. In this damned cryptorium of a building. Who'd take us? It's there on Gruntle's followers. He ain't the only one all dappled, is he? The man stood between the panions and you, and that was a solid enough thing to pull in all the others. Did Treat shape all this? I guess maybe he did. And I guess I played a part in that too, with me showing up with those talks on my arm. But now I'm quit of the whole thing, and that suits me fine. And I ain't going to think on it no more, Picker thought. Stoney was shaking her head. I won't kneel to Drake. By the abyss, I've gone and found myself before the altar of another god. I've already made my choice, and Drake isn't it. Huh. Maybe then. Your god found the whole thing with Gruntle, and all that somehow useful. Humans ain't the only ones who spin and play with webs, right? We ain't the only ones who sometimes walk in step, or even work together to achieve something of mutual benefit, without explaining a damn thing to the rest of us. I ain't envying you, Stony Manakis. It's deadly attention, when it's a god's. But it happens. Picker fell silent. Walk in step, Picker thought. Her eyes narrowed. And keeping the rest of us in the dark. She swung about, searched the group around the tents until she spied Parron. The corporal raised her voice. Hey, Captain! He looked up. And how about you, Captain? She thought. Keeping secrets, maybe? Here's a hunch for you. Any word from Silver Fox? She asked. The bridge burners nearby all fixed their attention on the noble-born officer. Parron recoiled as if he'd been struck. One hand went to his stomach as a spasm of pain took him. Jaws bunching, he managed to lift his head and meet Picker's eyes. She's alive, he grated. Thought so, Picker thought. You'd been too easy with this by far, Captain. Meaning, you've been keeping things from us. A bad decision. The last time us bridge burners was kept in the dark, that dark swallowed damn near every one of us. How close? How far away, Captain? She could see the effect of her words, yet a part of her was angry, enough to harden herself. Officers always held out. It was the one thing the bridge burners had learned to despise the most when it came to their commanders. Ignorance was fatal. Parron slowly forced himself straight. He drew a deep breath, then another as he visibly clamped down on the pain. Umbral Tor is driving the Panions into their laps, Corporal. Dujek and Brood are maybe three leagues away. Sputtering, Ansi asked, And do they know what's coming down on them? Aye, Sergeant. How? Good question, Picker thought. Just how tight is this contact between you and Tattersail Reborn? And why ain't you told us? We're your soldiers, expected to fight for you. So it's a damn good question. Parron scowled at Ansi, but made no reply. The sergeant wasn't about to let go, now that he'd taken the matter from Picker's hands and was speaking for all the bridge burners. So here we damn near got our heads lopped off by the white faces, damn near got roasted by Tennis Gary, and all the while thinking we might be alone, completely alone. Not knowing if the alliance has held or if Dujek and Brood have ripped each other apart, and there's nothing but rotting bones to the West. And yet, you knew. So, if you was dead, right now, sir. We'd know nothing. Not a damn thing, Picker thought. If I was dead, we wouldn't be having this conversation, Parron replied. 
So why don't we just pretend, Sergeant? Maybe we don't pretend at all, Yancey growled, one hand reaching for his sword. From nearby, where he had been crouching near the roof's edge, Gruntle slowly turned, then straightened. Now wait a minute, Picker thought. Sergeant, Picker snapped. You think Tattersail will turn a smile on you the next time she sees you? If you go ahead and do what you're thinking of doing. Quiet, Corporal, Paran ordered, eyes on Ancy. Let's get it over with. Here, I'll make it even easier. The captain turned his back to the sergeant, waited. So sick, he wants it ended, Picker thought. Shit, and worse, all this in front of an audience. Don't even think it, Ancy, Mallet warned. None of this is as it seems. Picker turned on the healer. Well, now we're getting somewhere. You was joying enough with Whiskey Jack before we left, Mallet. You and Quick Ben, out with it. We got a captain hurting so bad he wants us to kill him. And ain't nobody's telling us a damned thing. What in Hood's name is going on? The healer grimaced. I. Silver Fox is reaching out to the captain, but he's been pushing her away, so there hasn't been some kind of endless exchange of information going on. He knows she's alive, as he says, and I guess he can make out something of just how far away she is, but it goes no further than that. Damn you, Picker. You think you and the rest of us bridge burners have been singled out for yet another betrayal, just because Parron's not talking to you? He's not talking to anyone. And if you had as many holes burned through your guts as he does, you'd be pretty damned tight-lipped yourself. Now, all of you, just cut it. Look to yourselves. And if that's shame you see, it's damned well been earned. Picker faced her gaze on the captain's back. The man had not moved. Would not face his company. Could not. Not now. Mallet had a way of turning things right over. Parron was a sick man. And sick people don't think right, Picker thought. Gods, I had talks biting my arm, and I was losing it fast. Oh, ain't I just stepped in a pile of dung? Swearing someone else is to blame all the while, too. I guess Pale's burns are a far way from healing. Damn, Hood's heal on my rotted soul, please down and twist hard. Parron barely heard the shouted exchanges behind him. He felt assailed by the pressure of Silver Fox's presence, leading to a dark desire to be crushed lifeless beneath it, if such a thing was possible, rather than yield, a sword between his shoulder blades. No god to intervene this time, he thought, or a final torrential gush of blood into his stomach as its walls finally gave way. A painful option, but nonetheless as final as any other. Or a leap down into the mob below to get torn apart, trampled underfoot. Futility whispering of freedom. She was close indeed, as if she strode a bridge of bones stretching from her to where he now stood. No, not her. Her power that was so much more than just Tattersail making its relentless desire to break through his defences much deadlier of purpose than a lover's simple affection. Much more, even, than would be born of strategic necessity. Unless Duchek and Brood and their armies are under assault, Parron thought. And they're not. Gods, I don't know how I know, but I do. With certainty. This, this isn't Tattersail at all. It's Nightchill, Belladan, one or both. What do they want? He was suddenly rocked by an image, triggering an almost audible snap within his mind. Away. Towards. Dry flagstones within a dark cavern, the deeply carved lines of a card of the deck, stone-edged, the image seeming to writhe as if alive. Obelisk. One of the unaligned a leaning monolith, now of green stone, jade, towering above wind-whipped waves, no, dunes of sand. 
figures in the monolith's shadow. Three. Three in all. Ragged. Broken. Dying. Then beyond the strange scene, the sky tore, and the furred hoof of a god stepped onto mortal ground. Terror. Savagely pulled into the world. Oh, you didn't choose that, did you? Someone pulled you down, and now? Faina was as good as dead. A god trapped in the mortal realm was like a babe on an altar. All that was required was a knife and a willful hand. As good as dead. Bleak knowledge flowered like deadly nightshade in his mind, but he wanted none of it. Choices were being demanded of him, by forces ancient beyond imagining. The deck of dragons, elder gods were playing it, and now sought to play him. And this is to be the role of the master of the deck, if that is what I've become? A possessor of fatal knowledge, and now a hood-damned mitigator? I see what you're telling me to do. One god falls, push another into its place. Mortals sworn to one, swear them now to another. Abyss below, are we to be shoved, flicked, around like pebbles on a board? Rage and indignation fanned white-hot in Parron's mind, obliterating his pain. He felt himself mentally wheel round to face that incessant alien presence that had so hounded him. Felt himself open like an explosion. All right. You wanted my attention. You've got it. Listen, and listen well. Nightchill, whoever, whatever you really are. Maybe there have been masters of the deck before, long ago, whom you could pluck and pull to do your bidding. Hood knows, maybe you're the one, you and your elder friends, who selected me this time round. But if so, oh, you've made a mistake, a bad one. I've been a god's puppet once before, but I cut those strings, and if you want details, then go ask a pawn. I walked into a cursed sword to do it, and I swear I'll do it again with far less mercy in my heart, if I get so much as a whiff of manipulation from you. He sensed cold amusement in reply, and the bestial blood within Parron responded. Raised hackles, teeth bared, a deep, deadly growl. Sudden alarm. I, the truth of it, I won't be collared, Nightchill. And I tell you this, now, and you'd do well to take heed of these words. I'm taking a step forward, between you and every mortal like me. I don't know what that man Gruntle had to lose to arrive where you wanted him, but I sense the wounds in him. Abyss, take you. Is pain your only means of making us achieve what you want? It seems so. Know this, then. Until you find another means, until you can show me another way, something other than pain and grief, I'll fight you. We have our lives, all of us and they're not for you to play with. Not Picker's life, not Gruntle's or Stonny's. You've opened this path, Nightchill, connecting us. Fine. Good. Give me cause, and I'll come down it, riding the blood of a hound of shadow. Do you know, I think, if I wanted to, I could call the others with it, all of them. Because I understand something now. Come to a realization, and one I know to be truth. In the sword of Dragnipur, two hounds of shadow returned to the warren of darkness. Returned, Night Chill. Do you grasp my meaning? They were going home. And I can call them back. Without doubt. Two souls of untamed dark. Grateful souls, beloved spawn of destruction. A reply came then. A woman's voice unknown to Parron. You have no idea what you threaten, mortal. My brother's sword hides far more secrets than you can contemplate. He smiled. Worse than that, Nigel. The hand now wielding Dragnipur belongs to darkness. And Amanda Rake, the son of the mother. The pathway has never been so straight, so direct or so short, has it? Should I tell him what has happened within his own weapon? Should Rake learn that you found a way into Dragnipur, 
and that you freed the two hounds he had slain. He would kill you, mortal. He might. He's already had a few chances to do so, and just reasons besides. Yet he stayed his hand. I don't think you understand the Lord of Moonspawn as well as you think you do. There is nothing predictable in Anamanda Rake. Perhaps that is what frightens you so. Pursue not this course. I will do whatever I have to, Nightchill, to cut your strings. In your eyes, we mortals are weak, and you use our weakness to justify manipulating us. The struggle we face is far vaster, far deadlier than you realize. Explain it, all of it. Show me this vast threat of yours. To save your sanity, we must not gano his pattern. Patronizing bitch! He sensed her anger flare at that. You say our only means of using you is through the deliverance of pain. To that we have but one answer. Appearances deceive. Keeping us ignorant is your notion of mercy. Bluntly worded, but in essence, you are correct, Gano is parent. A master of the deck cannot be left ignorant, Nightchill. If I am to accept this role and its responsibilities, whatever they might be, and Hood knows I don't yet know them, but if I am, then I need to know everything. In time, he sneered. In time, I said. Grant us this small mercy, mortal. The struggle before us is no different from a military campaign. Incremental engagements, localized contests. But the field of battle is no less than existence itself. Small victories are each in themselves vital contributions to the pandemic war we have chosen to undertake. Who is we? The surviving elder gods, and others somewhat less cognizant of their role. Kral? The one responsible for Tattersell's rebirth? Yes, my brother. Your brother? But not the brother who forged Dragnipur? Not him. At the moment, Draconus can do naught but act indirectly, for he is chained within the very sword he created, slain by his own blade at the hand of Anomandore. Baron felt the cold steel of suspicion slide into him. Indirectly, you said. A moment of opportunity, Gano is Paran, unexpected. The arrival of a soul within Dragnipur that was not chained. The exchange of a few words that signified far more than you ever realized. As did the breach into the warren of darkness, the barrier of souls broken. So very briefly. But enough. Wait! Paran needed silence to think, fast and hard. When he'd been within Dragnipur, walking alongside the chain souls dragging their unimaginable burden, he had indeed spoken with one such prisoner. Abyss below. That had been Draconus. Yet he could recall nothing of the words exchanged between them. The chains led into the warren of darkness, the knot beneath the groaning wagon. Thus, darkness held those souls, one and all, held them fast. I need to go back, into the sword. I need to ask. Genais and rule. I, Draconus, the one you spoke with within Dragnipur, my other brother, made use of you, Ganoas Paran. Does that truth seem brutal to you? Is it beyond understanding? Like the others within the sword, my brother faces eternity. He sought to outwit a curse, yet he never imagined that doing so would take so long. He has changed, mortal. His legendary cruelty has been blunted. Wisdom earned a thousand times over. More. We need him. You want me to free Draconis from Rake's sword? Yes. 
to then have him go after Rake himself in an effort to reclaim the weapon he forged. Nightchill, I would rather Rake than Draconis. There will be no such battle, Ganois Paran. Why not? To free Draconis, the sword must be shattered. The cold steel between his ribs now twisted. And that would free everyone else, everything else. Sorry, woman, I won't do it. If there is a way to prevent that woeful release of mad, malign spirits, whose numbers are indeed beyond legion and too horrifying to contemplate, then only one man will know it. Draconis himself. Yes. Think on this, Ganois Paran. Do not rush. There is still time. Glad to hear it. We are not as cruel as you think. Vengeance hasn't blackened your heart, Night Chill. Excuse my skepticism. Oh, I seek vengeance, mortal but not against the minor players who acted out my betrayal. For that betrayal was foretold, an ancient curse. The one who voiced that curse is the sole focus of my desire for vengeance. I'm surprised he or she's still around. There was a cold smile in her words. Such was our curse against him. I'm beginning to think you all deserve each other. There was a pause, then she said, Perhaps we do, Gano is paran. What have you done with Tattersail? Nothing. Her attentions are presently elsewhere. So I was flattering myself, thinking otherwise. Damn it, Paran, you're still a fool. We shall not harm her, mortal. Even were we able, which we are not. There is honour within her and integrity, rare qualities for one so powerful. Thus we have faith. A gloved hand on his shoulder startled Paran awake. He blinked, looked around. The roof. I'm back. Captain? He met Mallet's concerned gaze. What? Sorry, sir. It seemed we'd lost you there. For a moment. He grimaced, wanting to deny it to the man's face, but unable to do so. How long? A dozen heartbeats, sir. Is that all? Good. We have to get moving. To the thrall. Sir? I'm between them and us now, Mallet, Paran thought. But there's no more of us than you realize. Damn, I wish I could explain this without sounding like a pompous bastard. Not replying to the healer's question, he swung round and found Trotz. War chief, the thrall beckons. Aye, Captain. The bridge burners were one and all avoiding his gaze. Paran wondered why, wondered what he'd missed. Mentally shrugging, he strode over to Gruntle. You're coming with us, he said. I know. Yes, you would at that, he thought. Fine. Let's get this done. The palace tower rose like a spear, wreathed in banners of ghostly smoke. The dark, colorless stone dulled the bright sunlight bathing it. 339 winding steps led up the tower's interior to emerge onto an open platform with a peaked roof of copper tiles that showed no sign of verdigris. The wind howled between the columns holding the roof and the smooth stone platform yet the tower did not sway. Itkovian stood looking east, the wind whipping against his face. His body felt bloodless, strangely hot beneath the tattered armor. He knew that exhaustion was finally taking its toll. Flesh and bone had its limits. The defense of the dead prince in his great hall had been brutal and artless. Hallways and entrances had become abattoirs, the stench of slaughter remained like a new layer beneath his skin. Even the wind could not strip it away. The battles at the coast and the landings were drawing to a grim close. A lone surviving scout had reported. The Betralid had been broken, fleeing north along the coast, where the shield anvil well knew their horses would become mired in the salt marsh. 
the pursuing Bargast would make short work of them. The besiegers' camps had been shattered, as if a tornado had ripped through them. A few hundred Bargast, old women and men and children, wandered through the carnage, gathering the spoils amid squalling seagulls. The East Watch Redoubt, now a pile of rubble, barely rose above the carpet of bodies. Smoke drifted from it, as if from a dying pyre. Hitkovian had watched the Bargast clans push into the city, had seen the Panion retreat become a rout in the streets below. The fighting had swiftly swept past the palace. A Seer Dermin officer had managed to rally a rearguard in Jalakan's concourse, and that battle still raged on. But for the Panions, it was a withdrawing engagement. They were buying time for the exodus through what was left of the south and west gates. A few white-faced scouts had ventured into the palace grounds, close enough to discern that defenders remained, but no official contact had been established. The recruit, Velbara, stood at Ecovian's side, a recruit no longer. Her training in weapons had been one of desperation. She had not missed the foremost lesson, that of staying alive, that was the guiding force behind every skill she thereafter acquired in the heat of battle. As with all the other Capan newcomers to the company, who now made up most of the survivors under the Shield Anvil's command, she had earned her place as a soldier of the Greyswords. Itkovian broke a long silence. We yield the Great Hall now. Yes, sir. The honor of the prince has been reasserted. We must needs depart. There is unfinished business at the thrall. Can we even yet reach it, sir? We shall need to find a Bargast war chief. We shall not be mistaken for the enemy, sir. Enough of our brothers and sisters lie dead in the city to make our colors well known. Also, given the pursuit has, apart from the concourse, driven the Panions west onto the plain, we shall likely find our path unopposed. Yes, sir. Itkovian fixed his attention one last time on the destroyed redoubt in the killing field to the east. Two Gidrath soldiers in the great hall below were from that foolhardy but noble defense, and one of them bore recent wounds that would most likely prove fatal. The other, a bull of a man who had knelt before Rath Hood, seemed no longer able to sleep. In the four days and nights since retaking the great hall, he had but paced during his rest periods, oblivious of his surroundings. Pacing, muttering under his breath, his eyes darkly feverish in their intensity. He and his dying companion were, Itkovian suspected, the last Gidrath still alive outside the thrall itself. A Gidrath, sworn to Hood, Itkovian thought. Yet he follows my command without hesitation. Simple expedience, one might reasonably conclude. Notions of rivalry dispensed with in the face of the present extremity. Yet I find myself mistrusting my own explanations. Despite his exhaustion, the shield anvil had sensed a growing perturbation. Something had happened. Somewhere. And as if in response, it felt his blood seem to drain from him, emptying his veins, hollowing his heart, vanishing through a wound he'd yet to find, leaving him to feel incomplete. As if I had surrendered my faith. But I have not. The void of lost faith is filled with your swollen self. Words from a long-dead destriant. One does not yield, one replaces. Faith with doubt, skepticism, denial. I have yielded nothing. I have no horde of words crowding my inner defenses. Indeed, I am diminished into silence. Emptied, as if awaiting renewal. He shook himself. This wind screams too loud in my ears, he said, eyes still on the East Watch Redoubt. Come, sir, we go below. One hundred and twelve soldiers remained in fighting condition, though not one was free of wounds. Seventeen grey swords lay dead or slowly dying along one wall. The air reeked of sweat, urine, and rotting meat. The Great Hall's entranceways were framed in blackening blood, scraped clean on the tiles for firm footing. The long-gone architect who had given shape to the chamber would have been appalled at what it had become. Its noble beauty, 
now housed a nightmare scene. On the throne, his skin roughly sewn back onto his half-devoured form, sat Prince Jalakan, eyeless, teeth exposed in a grin that grew wider as the lips lost their moisture and shrank away on all sides. Death's broadening smile, a precise, poetic horror. Worthy to hold court in what the Great Hall had become. A young prince who had loved his people, now joined to their fate. It was time to leave. Itkovian stood near the main entrance, studying what was left of his grey swords. They in turn faced him, motionless, stone-eyed. To the left, two Kapan recruits held the reins of the two remaining warhorses. The lone Gidrath, his companion had died moments earlier, paced with head sunk low, shoulders hunched, back and forth along the wall behind the ranked mercenaries. A battered longsword was held in each hand, the one on the left bent by a wild swing that had struck a marble column two nights past. The shield anvil thought to address his soldiers, if only to honour decorum, but now, as he stood scanning their faces, he realised that he had no words left within him, none to dress what mutually bound them together, none capable of matching the strangely cold pride he felt at that moment. Finally, he drew his sword, tested the straps holding his shield arm in place, then turned to the main entranceway. The hallway beyond had been cleared of corpses, creating an avenue between the stacked bodies to the outer doors. Itkovian strode down the ghastly aisle, stepped between the leaning, battered doors, and out into sunlight. Following their many assaults, the Panions had pulled their fallen comrades away from the broad, shallow steps of the approach, had used the courtyard to haphazardly pile the bodies, including those still living, who then either expired from wounds or from suffocation. Itkovian paused at the top of the steps. The sounds of fighting persisted from the direction of Jalakan's concourse, but that was all he heard. Silence shrouded the scene before him, a silence so discordant in what had been a lively palace forecourt, in what had been a thriving city, that Itkovian was deeply shaken for the first time since the siege began. Dear Faina, find for me the victory in this he thought. He descended the steps, the stone soft and gummy under his boots. His company followed, not a word spoken. They strode through the shattered gate, began picking their way through the corpses on the ramp, then in the street beyond. Uncontested by the living, this would nevertheless prove a long journey. Nor would it be a journey without battle. Assailing them now were what their eyes saw, what their noses smelled, and what they could feel underfoot. A battle that made shields and armor useless, that made flailing swords futile. A soul hardened beyond humanity was the only defense, and for Itkovian, that price was too high. I am the shield anvil, he thought. I surrender to what lies before me. Thicker than smoke, the grief unleashed and now lost, churning this lifeless air. A city has been killed, even the survivors huddling in the tunnels below. Fenner, take me. Better they never emerge. To see this. Their route took them between the cemeteries. Itkovian studied the place where he and his soldiers had made a stand. It looked no different from anywhere else his eye scanned. The dead lay in heaps. As Brukelian had promised, not one pavestone had gone uncontested. This small city had done all it could. Panion victory might well have been inevitable, but thresholds nevertheless existed, transforming inexorable momentum into a curse. And now the white-faced clans of the Bargast had announced their own inevitability. What the Panions had delivered had been in turn delivered upon them. We are all pushed into a world of madness, yet it must now fall to each of us to pull back from this abyss, to drag ourselves free of the descending spiral. From horror, grief must be fashioned, and from grief, compassion. As the company entered a choked avenue at the edge of the Daru district, a score of bargast emerged from an alley mouth directly ahead. Bloodied hook swords in hands, 
white-painted faces spattered red. The foremost among them grinned at the shield anvil. Defenders! he barked in harshly accented Capan. How sits this gift of liberation? Itkovian ignored the question. You have kin at the thrall, sir. Even now I see the protective glow fading. We shall see the bones of our gods, aye, the warrior said, nodding. His small, dark eyes scanned the grey swords. You lead a tribe of women. Capan women, Itkovian said. The city's most resilient resource, though it fell to us to discover that. They are grey swords now, sir, and for that we are strengthened. We've seen your brothers and sisters everywhere, the Bargast warrior growled. Had they been our enemies, we would be glad they are dead. And as allies? The shield anvil asked. The Bargast fighters, one and all, made a gesture, back of sword hand to brow, the briefest brush of leather to skin. Then the spokesman said, The loss fills the shadows we cast. Know this, soldier. The enemy you left to us was brittle. Itkovian shrugged. The Panyan's faith knows not worship, only necessity. Their strength is a shallow thing, sir. Will you accompany us to the thrall? At your side, soldiers. In your shadow lies honor. Most of the structures in the Daru district had burned, collapsing in places to fill the streets with blackened rubble. As the grey swords and bargast wound their way through the least cluttered paths, Itkovian's eyes were drawn to one building still standing. A tenement, its walls were strangely bowed. Banked fires had been built against the side facing him, scorching the stones, but the assault of flame had failed for some reason. Every arched window Itkovian could see looked to have been barricaded. At his side, the Bargar spokesman growled, Your kind crowd your barrows. The shield anvil glanced at the man. Sir? The warrior nodded towards the smoke haze tenement and went on with his commentary. Easier, aye, than digging and lining a pit outside the city, than the lines passing buckets of earth. You like a clear view from the walls, it seems, but we do not live among our dead in the manner of your people. Itkovian turned back to study the tenement, now slightly to the rear on the right. His eyes narrowed. The barricades blocking the windows, Itkovian thought. Once more, flesh and bone. Twin tusks. Who would build such a necropolis? Surely it cannot be the consequence of defense. We wandered close, the warrior at his side said. The walls give off their own heat. Jellied liquid bleeds between the cracks. He made another gesture, this one shuddering, hilt of his hook sword clattering against the coin wrought armor covering his torso. By the bone soldier, we fled. Is that tenement the only one so filled? We've seen no other, though we did pass one estate that still held. Enlivened corpses stood guard at the gate and on the walls. The air stank of sorcery an emanation foul with necromancy. I tell you this, soldier, we shall be glad to quit this city. Itkovian was silent. He felt rent inside. The rare Vafena voiced the truth of war. It spoke true of the cruelty that humanity was capable of unleashing upon its own kind. War was played like a game by those who led others, played in an illusory arena of calm reason, but such lies could not survive reality, and reality seemed to have no limits. The Rev held a plea for restraint, and insisted the glory to be found was not to be a blind one, rather a glory born of solemn, clear-eyed regard. Within limitless reality resided the promise of redemption. That regard was failing at Covian now. He was recalling like a caged animal, cruelly prodded on all sides. Escape was denied to him, yet that denial was self-imposed, a thing born of his conscious will, given shape by the words of his vow. He must assume this burden, no matter the cost. The fires of vengeance had undergone a transformation within him. He would be, at the last, the redemption for the souls of the fallen in this city. Redemption, Itkovian thought. For everyone else, 
but not for himself. For that, he could only look to his God. But, dear Faina, what has happened? Where are you? I kneel in place, awaiting your touch, yet you are nowhere to be found. Your realm, it feels empty. Where, now, can I go? I, I am not yet done. I accept this. And when I am, who awaits me? Who shall embrace me? A shiver ran through him. Who shall embrace me? The shield anvil pushed the question away, struggled to renew his resolve. He had, after all, no choice. He would be Fainer's grief and his lord's hand of justice. Not welcome responsibilities, and he sensed the toll they were about to exact. They neared the plaza before the thrall. Other bargast were visible, joining in the convergence. The distant sounds of battle in Jalakan concourse, which had accompanied them through most of the afternoon, now fell silent. The enemy had been driven from the city. Etkovian did not think the bargast would pursue. They had achieved what they had come here to do. The Panion threat to the bones of their gods had been removed. Probably, if Septarch Kulpath still lived, he would reform his tattered forces, reassert discipline, and prepare for his next move. Either a counterattack or a westward withdrawal. There were risks to both. He might have insufficient force to retake the city, and his army, having lost possession of their camps and supply routes, would soon suffer from lack of supplies. It was not an enviable position. Kapustan, a small, inconsequential city on the east coast of central Genabacus, had become a many-sided curse, and the lives lost here signified but the beginning of the war to come. They emerged onto the plaza. The place where Brukalin had fallen lay directly ahead, but all the bodies had been removed, taken, no doubt, by the retreating panions. Flesh for yet another royal feast. It doesn't matter, Ikovian thought. Hood came for him, in person. Was that a sign of honor or petty gloating on the gods' part? The shield anvil's gaze held on that stained stretch of flagstones for a moment longer, then swung to the thrall's main gate. The glow was gone. In the shadows beneath the gate's arch, figures had appeared. Every approach to the plaza had filled with Bargast, but they ventured no further. Itkovian turned back to his company. His eyes found his captain, who had been the master sergeant in charge of training the recruits, then Valbara. He studied their tattered, stained armor, their lined, drawn faces. The three of us, sirs, to the center of the plaza. The two women nodded. The three strode onto the concourse, thousands of eyes fixed on them, followed by a rumbling murmur, then a rhythmic, muted clashing of blade on blade. Another party emerged from the right. Soldiers, wearing uniforms Itkovian did not recognize, and in their company, figures displaying barbed, feline tattooing. Leading the latter group, a man Itkovian had seen before. The shield anvil steps slowed. Gruntl. The name was a hammer blow to his chest. Brutal certainty forced his next thoughts. The mortal sword of Trake, tiger of summer. The first hero is ascended. We, we are replaced. Stealing himself, Itkovian resumed his pace, then halted in the center of the expanse. A single soldier in the foreign uniform had moved up alongside Gruntle. He closed a hand around the big Daru's striped arm and barked something back to the others, who all stopped, while the man and Gruntle continued on, directly towards Itkovian. A commotion from the thrall's gate caught their attention. Priests and priestesses of the Mass Council were emerging, holding a struggling comrade among them as they hastened forward. In the lead, Rath Drake, a step behind the Daru merchant, Karuli. The soldier and Gruntle reached Itkovian first. Beneath the Daru's helm, Gruntle's tiger eyes studied the shield anvil. Itkovian of the Grey Swords, he rumbled. It is done. 
Itkovian had no need to ask for elaboration. The truth was a knife in his heart. No, it isn't, the foreign soldier snapped. I greet you, Shield Anvil. I am Captain Parron of the Bridge Burners, one arm's host. He is more than that, Gruntle muttered. What he claims now is nothing I do willingly, Parron finished. Shield Anvil. Fena has been torn from his realm. He strides a distant land. You, your company, you have lost your god. And so it is known to all, Itkovian thought. We are aware of this, sir. Gruntle says that your place, your role, is done. The Grey Swords must step aside, for a new god of war has gained preeminence. But that doesn't have to be. A path for you has been prepared. Parron's gaze went past Itkovian. He raised his voice. Welcome, Umbral Tor. Your children no doubt await within the thrall. The shield anvil glanced back over his shoulder to see, standing ten paces behind him, a huge bargast warchief in coin-threaded armor. They can wait a while longer, Umbral Tor growled. I would witness this. Parron grimaced. Nosy bastard. I. The Malazan returned his attention to Itkovian and made to speak, but the shield anvil interrupted him. A moment, sir. He stepped past the two men. Rathvena jerked and twisted in the grip of his fellow priests. His mask was awry. Wisps of grey hair pulled free of the leather strapping. Shield anvil, he cried upon seeing Itkovian's approach. In the name of Fena. In his name, I, sir, Itkovian cut in. To my side, Captain Norrell. The Rev's law is invoked. Sir, the grizzle woman replied, stepping forward. You can't, Rathvena screamed. For this, only the mortal sword can invoke the Rev. Itkovian stood motionless. The priest managed to pull one arm forward to jab a finger at the shield anvil. My rank is as destriant, unless you've won to make claim to that title. Destriant Carnidus is dead. That man was no destriant, Shield Anvil. An aspirant, perhaps. But my rank was and remains preeminent. Thus, only a mortal sword can invoke the Rev against me. And this you know. Gruntle snorted. A Covian. Parron here told me there was a betrayal. Your priest sold Brucalian's life to the Panyans. Not only disgusting, but ill-advised. So, he paused. Would any mortal sword do? If so, I invoke the Rev. He bared his teeth at Rathfaina. Punish the bastard. We are replaced, Itkovian thought. The Lord of Battle is transformed indeed. He cannot, Rathvena shrieked. A bold claim, Itkovian said to the masked priest. In order to deny this man's right to the title, sir, you must call upon our god. In your defense. Do so, sir, and you shall walk from here a free man. The eyes within the mask went wide. You know that is impossible, Itkovian. Then your defense is over, sir. The Rev is invoked. I am become Fainer's hand of justice. Rath Drake, who had been standing nearby in watchful silence, now spoke. There is no need for any of this, Shield Anvil. Your god's absence changes everything. Surely you understand the implications of the traditional form of punishment. A simple execution, not the Rev's law, is denied this man, Itkovian said. Captain Norrell? She strode to Rathvena, reached out, and plucked him from the hold of the priests and priestesses. He seemed like a rag doll in her large, scarred hands as she swung him round and threw him belly down on the flagstones. She then straddled him, stretching his arms out forward yet side by side. The man shrieked with sudden comprehension. Itkovian drew his sword. Smoke drifted from the blade. The Rev, he said standing over Rathvena's outstretched arms. Betrayal, to trade Brucalian's life for your own. Betrayal, 
the foulest crime to the Rev's law, to Fena himself. Punishment is invoked in accordance with the Boar of Summer's judgment. He was silent for a moment. Then he said, Pray, sir, that Fena finds what we send to him. But he won't, Rathdrake cried. Don't you understand? His realm, your god no longer waits within it. He knows, Parent said. This is what happens when it gets personal. And believe me, I'd rather have had no part in this. Rathdrake swung to the captain. And who are you, soldier? Today, right now. I am the master of the deck, priest, and it seems I'm here to negotiate. On you and your god's behalf. Alas, he added wryly, the shield anvil is proving admirably recalcitrant. Itkovian barely heard the exchange. Eyes holding on the priest pinned to the ground before him, he said, Our lord is gone. Indeed. So best pray, Rathvena, that a creature of mercy now looks kindly upon you. Rathdrake whirled back to the shield anvil at those words. By the abyss, Itkovian, there is no crime so foul to match what you're about to do. His soul will be torn apart. Where they will go, there are no creatures of mercy. Itkovian! Silence, sir. This judgment is mine and the Rev's. The victim shrieked. And Itkovian swung down the sword. Blade's edge cracked onto the flagstone. Twin gouts of blood shot out from the stumps of Rathvena's wrists. The hands were nowhere to be seen. Itkovian jammed the flat of his blade against the stumps. Flesh sizzled. Rathvena's scream ceased abruptly as unconsciousness took him. Captain Norrell moved away from the man, left him lying on the flagstones. Parron began speaking. Shield anvil, hear me. Please. Fena is gone. He strides the mortal realm. Thus, he cannot bless you. With what you take upon yourself, there is nowhere for it to go, no way to ease the burden. I am equally aware of what you say, sir. Itkovian still stared down at Rathena, who was stirring to consciousness once more. Such knowledge is worthless. There's another way, Shield Anvil. He turned at that, eyes narrowing. Parron went on. A choice has been fashioned. In this I am but a messenger. Rathdrake stepped up to Itkovian. We shall welcome you, sir, you and your followers. The Tiger of Summer has need for you, a shield anvil, and so offers his embrace. No. The eyes within the mask narrowed. Itkovian, Parron said. This was foreseen. The path prepared for by elder powers, once more awake and active in this world. I am here to tell you what they would have you do. No, I am sworn to Fainer. If need be, I shall share his fate. This is an offer of salvation, not a betrayal, Rathdrake cried. Isn't it? No more words, sirs. On the ground below, Rathfainer had regained awareness. Itkovian studied the man. I am not yet done, he whispered. Rathvena's body jerked, a throat-tearing scream erupting from him, his arms snapping as if yanked by invisible, unhuman hands. Dark tattoos appeared on the man's skin, but not those belonging to Fena, for the god had not been the one to claim Rathvena's severed hands. Writhing, alien script swarmed his flesh as the unknown claimant made its mark claimed possession of the man's mortal soul. Words that darkened like burns. Blisters rose, then broke, spurting thick, yellow liquid. Screams of unbearable, unimaginable pain filled the plaza, the body on the flagstones spasming as muscle and fat dissolved beneath the skin, then boiled, breaking through. Yet the man did not die. Itkovian sheathed his sword. The Malazan was the first to comprehend. His hand snapped forward, closed on the shield anvil's arm. By the abyss, do not... Captain Norrell? Face white beneath the rim of her helm, 
the woman settled her hand on the grip of her sword. Captain Parron, she said in a taut, brittle voice. Withdraw your touch. He swung on her. Aye, even you recall at what he plans. Nevertheless, sir, release him or I will kill you. The Malazan's eyes glittered strangely at that threat, but Itkovian could spare no thought for the young captain. He had a responsibility. Rathfainer had been punished enough. His pain must end. And who shall save me? Itkovian thought. Parron relinquished his grip. Itkovian bent down to the writhing, barely recognizable shape on the flagstones. Rathfainer, hear me. Yes, I come. Will you accept my embrace? For all the envy and malice within the tortured priest, all that led to the betrayal, not just of Brucalian, the mortal sword, but of Fainer himself, some small measure of mercy remained in the man's soul. Mercy and comprehension. His body jerked away, limbs skidding as he sought to crawl from Itkovian's shadow. The shield anvil nodded, then gathered the suppurating figure into his arms and rose. I see you recoil, and know it for your final gesture, one that is atonement. To this I cannot but answer in kind, Rathfena. Thus. I assume your pain, sir. No, do not fight this gift. I free your soul to hood, to death's solace. Parron and the others saw naught but the shield anvil standing motionless, Rathena in his arms. The rendered blood-streaked priest continued to struggle for a moment longer. Then he seemed to collapse inward, his screams falling into silence. The man's life unfolded in Nitkovian's mind. Before him, the priest's path to betrayal. He saw a young acolyte, pure of heart, cruelly schooled, not in party and faith, but in the cynical lessons of secular power struggles. Rule and administration was a viper's nest, a ceaseless contest among small and petty minds with illusory rewards. A life within the cold halls of the thrall that had hollowed out the priest's soul. The self filled the new cavern of lost faith, beset by fears and jealousies, to which malevolent acts were the only answer. The need for preservation made every virtue a commodity to be traded away. Itkovian understood him, could see each step taken that led inevitably to the betrayal, the trading of lives as agreed between the priest and the agents of the Panion Domin. And within that, Rathvena's knowledge that he had, in so doing, wrapped a viper about himself, whose kiss was deadly. He was dead either way, but he had gone too far from his faith, too far to ever imagine he might one day return to it. I comprehend you now, Rathvena, but comprehension is not synonymous with absolution. The justice that is your punishment does not waver. Thus you were made to know pain. I, Fena should have been awaiting you. Our God should have accepted your severed hands, so that he might look upon you following your death that he might voice the words prepared for you and you alone, the words on your skin. The final atonement to your crimes. This is as it should have been, sir. But Fena is gone, and what holds you now has other desires. I now deny it the possession of you. Rathvena's soul shrieked, seeking to pull away once more. Carving words through the tumult. It go in. You must not. Leave me with this, I beg you. Not for your soul. I never meant. Please, it go in. The shield anvil tightened his spiritual embrace, breaking the last barriers. No one is to be denied their grief, sir. Not even you. But barriers, once lowered, could not choose what passed through. The storm that hit Itkovian overwhelmed him. Pain so intense as to become an abstract force, a living entity that was itself a thing filled with panic and terror. He opened himself to it, let its screams fill him. 
on a field of battle, after the last heart has stilled, pain remains. Locked in soil, in stone, bridging the air from each place to every other, a web of memory, trembling to a silent song. But for Itkovian, his vow denied the gift of silence. He could hear that song. It filled him entire. And he was its counterpoint, its answer. I have you now, Rathena. You are found, and so I answer. Suddenly, beyond the pain, a mutual awareness, an alien presence, immense power, not malign, yet profoundly different. From that presence, storm-tossed confusion, anguish, seeking to make of the unexpected gift of a mortal's two hands something of beauty. Yet that man's flesh could not contain that gift. Horror within the storm. Horror and grief. Ah, even gods weep. Commend yourself then to my spirit. I will have your pain as well, sir. The alien presence recoiled, but it was too late. Itkovian's embrace offered its immeasurable gift. And was engulfed. He felt his soul dissolving, tearing apart. Too vast. There was, beneath the cold faces of gods, warmth. Yet it was sorrow and darkness, for it was not the gods themselves who were unfathomable. It was mortals. As for the gods, they simply paid. We, we are the rack upon which they are stretched. Then the sensation was gone, fleeing him as the alien god succeeded in extracting itself, leaving it coven with but fading echoes of a distant world's grief, a world with its own atrocities, layer upon layer through a long, tortured history. Fading, then gone. Leaving him with heart-rending knowledge. A small mercy. He was buckling beneath Rathvena's pain, and the growing onslaught of Kapustan's appalling death as his embrace was forced ever wider. The clamouring souls on all sides, not one life's history unworthy of notice, of acknowledgement, not one he would turn away. Souls in the tens of thousands, lifetimes of pain, loss, love and sorrow, each leading to, each riding memories of its own agonised death. Iron and fire and smoke and falling stone. Dust and airlessness. Memories of piteous, pointless ends to thousands and thousands of lives. I must atone. I must give answer. To every death. Every death. He was lost within the storm, his embrace incapable of closing around the sheer immensity of anguish assailing him. Yet he struggled on. The gift of peace. The stripping away of pain's trauma to free the souls to find their way. To the feet of countless gods, or Hood's own realm, or indeed, to the abyss itself. Necessary journeys to free souls trapped in their own tortured deaths. I am the shield anvil. This is for me to hold. Hold on. Reach, gods. Redeem them, sir. It is your task. The heart of your vows. You are the walker among the dead in the field of battle. You are the bringer of peace, the redeemer of the fallen. You are the mender of broken lives. Without you, death is senseless, and the denial of meaning is the world's greatest crime to its own children. Hold it, Covian. Hold fast. But he had no god against which to set his back, no solid, intractable presence awaiting him to answer his own need. And he was but one mortal soul. Yet I must not surrender. Gods, hear me! I may not be yours, but your fallen children, they are mine. Witness, then. What lies behind my cold face? Witness! In the plaza, amidst a dreadful silence, 
Parron and the others watched as Itkovian slowly settled to his knees. A rotting, lifeless corpse was slumped in his arms. The lone, kneeling figure seemed, to the captain's eyes, to encompass the exhaustion of the world, an image that burned into his mind, and one that he knew would never leave him. Of the struggles, the wars, still being waged within the shield anvil, little showed. After a long moment, Itkovin reached up with one hand and unstrapped his helm, lifting it clear to reveal the sweat-stained leather underhelm. The long, dripping hair plastered against his brow and neck shrouded his face as he knelt with head bowed, the corpse in his arms crumbling to pale ash. The shield anvil was motionless. The uneven rise and fall of his frame slowed, stuttered, then ceased. Captain Parron, his heart hammering loud in his chest, darted close, grasped Itkovian's shoulders and shook the man. No, damn you! This isn't what I've come here to see! Wake up, you bastard! Peace. I have you now. My gift. Ah, this burden. The shield anvil's head jerked back, drew a sobbing breath. <sighs> Settling. Such weight. Why? Gods, you all watched. You witnessed with your immortal eyes. Yet you did not step forward. You denied my cry for help. Why? Crouching, the Malazan moved round to face it, Kovian. Mallet! He shouted over a shoulder. As the healer ran forward, Itkovian, his eyes finding Parron, slowly raised a hand. Swallowing his dismay, he managed to find words. I know not how, he rasped, but you have returned me. Parron's grin was forced. You are the shield anvil. I, Itkovian whispered. And Faina, forgive me. What you have done is no mercy, he thought. I am the shield anvil. I can feel it in the air, Parron said, eyes searching at Kovians. It's... it's been cleansed. I... and I am not yet done. Gruntle stood watching as the Malazan and his healer spoke with the Greysword commander. The fog of his thoughts, which had been closed around him for what he now realized was days, had begun to thin. Details now assailed him, and the evidence of the changes within himself left him alarmed. His eyes saw differently. Unhuman acuity. Motion, no matter how slight or peripheral, caught his attention, filled his awareness. Judged inconsequential or defined as threat, prey or unknown. Instinctive decisions yet no longer buried deep, now lurking just beneath the surface of his mind. He could feel his every muscle, every tendon and bone, could concentrate on each one to the exclusion of all the others, achieving a spatial sensitivity that made control absolute. He could walk a forest floor in absolute silence, if he so wished. He could freeze, shielding even the breath he drew, and become perfectly motionless. But the changes he felt were far more profound than these physical manifestations. The violence residing with him was that of a killer, cold and implacable, devoid of compassion or ambiguity. And this realization terrified him. The Tiger of Summer's mortal sword, he thought. Yes, Drake, I feel you. I know what you have made of me. Damn it, you could have at least asked... He looked upon his followers, knowing them to be precisely that. Followers, his very own sworn. An appalling truth. Among them, Stony Manakis. No, she isn't Trakes. She's chosen Karuli's elder god. Good. If she was ever to kneel before me, we wouldn't be thinking religious thoughts. And how likely is that? Ah, alas. Sensing his gaze, she looked at him. Gruntle winked. Her brows rose, and he understood her alarm, making him even more amused. His only answer to his terror 
at the brutal murderer hiding within him. She hesitated, then approached. Gruntle? Aye. I feel like I've just woken up. Yeah, well, the hangover shows. Believe me. What's been going on? You don't know? I think I do, but I'm not entirely sure. Of myself, of my own memories. We defended our tenement, and it was uglier than what's between Hood's toes. You were wounded, dying. That Malazan soldier there healed you. And there's Zitkovian, the priest in his arms that has just turned to dust. Gods, he must have needed a bath. Beru Fendersall, it really is you, Gruntel. I thought you were lost to, to us for good. I think a part of me is, lass. Lost to us all. Since when were you the worshipping type? That's the joke on Trake. I'm not. He's made a terrible choice. Show me an altar, and I'm more likely to piss on it than kiss it. You might have to kiss it, so I'd suggest you reverse the gestures. Ha ha. He shook himself, rolling his shoulders and sighed. Stoney recoiled slightly at the motion. Ah, uh, that was too cat-like for you. Your muscles rippled under that barbed skin. And it felt damned good. Rippled. You should be considering new possibilities, lass. Keep dreaming, oaf. The banter was brittle, and they both sensed it. Stoney was silent for a moment, then the breath hissed between her teeth. Puke. I guess he's gone. No, he's alive. Circling overhead right now, in fact. That sparrowhawk. Karuli's gift to help the man keep an eye on Corbel Brooch. He's soul-taken now. Stoney was glaring skyward, hands on her hips. Well, that's just great. She swung a venomous look upon Karuli, who was standing well off to one side, hands within sleeves, unnoticed, watching all in silence. Everybody gets blessed but me. Where's the justice in that? Well... You're already blessed with incomparable beauty, Stoney. Another word and I'll cut your tail off, I swear it. I haven't got a tail. Precisely. She faced him. Now listen, we've got something to work out. Something tells me that for both of us, heading back to Darugistan isn't likely. At least not for the next while, anyway. So, now what? Are we about to part ways, you miserable old man? No rush on all that, lass. Let's see how things settle. Excuse me. Both turned at the voice, to find that Rathtrake had joined them. Gruntle scowled at the masked priest. What? I believe we have matters to discuss, you and I, mortal sword. You believe what you like, the Daru replied. I've already made it plain to the whiskered one that I'm a bad choice. Wrath Drake seemed to choke. The whiskered one? He sputtered in indignation. Stoney laughed and clouted the priest on the shoulder. He's a reverend, bastard, ain't he just? I don't kneel to anyone, Gruntle growled, and that includes gods. And if scrubbing would do it, I'd get these stripes off my hide right now. The priest rubbed his bruised shoulder, the eyes within the feline mask glaring at Stoney. At Gruntle's words, he faced the Daru again. These are not matters open to debate, mortal sword. You are what you are. I'm a caravan guard, Captain, and damned good at it. When I'm sober, that is. You are the master of war in the name of the Lord of Summer. We'll call that a hobby. A... a what? They heard laughter. Captain Parron, still crouching beside Itkovian, was looking their way, and had clearly heard the conversation. The Malazan grinned at Rath Drake. It never goes how you think it should, does it, priest? That's the glory of us humans, and your new god had best make peace with that, and soon. Gruntle, keep playing by your own rules. I hadn't planned otherwise, Captain, Gruntle replied. How fares the shield anvil? Itkovian glanced over. 
I am well, sir. Now that's a lie, Stoney said. Nonetheless, the shield anvil said, accepting Mallet's shoulder as he slowly straightened. Gruntle looked down at the two white cutlasses in his hands. Would take me, he muttered. But these have turned damned ugly. He forced the blades into their scarred, tattered sheaths. They are not to leave your hands until this war is done, Rathdrake snapped. Another word from you, priest, Gruntle said, and you'll be done. No one else had ventured onto the plaza. Corporal Picker stood with the other bridge burners at the alley mouth, trying to determine what was going on. Conversation surrounded her, as the soldiers conjectured in time-honoured fashion, guessing at the meaning of the gestures and muted exchanges they witnessed among the dignitaries. Picker glared about. Blind, where are you? Here, she replied at the corporal's shoulder. Why don't you sidle out there and find out what's happening? She shrugged. I'd get noticed. Really? Besides, I don't need to. It's plain to me what's happened. Really? Blend made a wry face. You lose your brain when you give up those talks, Corporal. Never seen you so consistently wide-eyed before. Really? Picker repeated, this time in a dangerous drawl. Keep it up and you'll regret it, soldier. An explanation? All right. Here's what I think I've been seeing. The Greyswords had some personal business to clear up, which they've done, only it damn near ripped that commander to pieces. But Mallet, drawing on who knows whose powers, has lent some strength, though I think it was the captain's hand that brought the man back from the dead. And no, I never knew Parron had it in him, and if we've been thinking lately that he was more than just a willow-spined noble-born officer, we've just seen proof of our suspicions. But I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing for us. He won't stick a sword in our backs, Corporal. He might step in front of one heading our way, in fact. As for Gruntle, well, I think he's just shaken himself awake. And that masked priest of Trakes ain't happy about it. But no one else gives a damn, because sometimes a smile is precisely what we all need. Picker's reply was a grunt. And finally, after watching all that, Blen continued, it's time for Humbrol Tor and his Bargast. Humbrol Tor had raised his axe high and had begun walking towards the thrall's gate. War chiefs and shouldermen and women emerged from the gathered tribes, crossing the plaza in the giant warrior's wake. Trotz pushed his way through the knot of bridge burners and joined them. Staring at his back, Picker snorted. He goes to meet his gods, Blend murmured. Give him that, Corporal. Let's hope he stays with them, she replied. Who knows? He don't know how to command. But Captain Parron does, Blen said. She glanced at her companion, then shrugged. I suppose he does at that. Might be worth cornering Antsy, Blend continued in a low tone, and anyone else who's been talking through their cracks of late. Cornering? Aye, then beating them senseless. Sound plan, Blend. Find us to Turin. Seems we got personal business, too, to clear up. Well, guess your brain's working after all. Picker's only reply was another grunt. Blend slipped back into the crowd. Personal business. I like the sound of that. We'll straighten them up for you, Captain. Who knows? It's the least I can do. Circling high overhead, the Sparrowhawk's sharp eyes missed nothing. The day was drawing to a close, shadows lengthening. Banks of dust on the plain to the west revealed the retreating panions, still being driven ever westward by elements of Humbrol Tor's Baran clan. In the city itself, still more thousands of Bargast moved through the streets, clearing away dead whilst tribes worked to excavate vast pits beyond the north wall which had begun filling as commandeered wagons began filing out from Kapustan. The long, soul-numbing task of cleansing the city had begun. Directly below, the plaza's expanse was now threaded with figures, 
Bargast moving in procession from streets and alley mouths, following Humbrel Tor as the war chief approached the thrall's gate. The sparrowhawk that had once been Buke heard no sound but the wind, lending the scene below a solemn, ethereal quality. Nonetheless, the raptor drew no closer. Distance was all that kept it sane, was all that had been keeping it sane since the dawn. From here, far above Kapustan, vast dramas of death and desperation were diminished, almost into abstraction. Tides of motion, the blurring of colors, the sheer muddiness of humanity, all diminished, the futility reduced to something strangely manageable. Burned-out buildings, the tragic end of innocence. Wives, mothers, children. Desperation, horror, and grief, the storms of destroyed lives. No closer. Wives, mothers, children. Burned-out buildings. No closer, ever again. The sparrowhawk caught an updraft, swept skyward, eyes now on the livening stars as night swallowed the world below. There was pain in the gifts of the Elder Gods, but sometimes there was mercy. <laughs>